Section 1 of the Aeneid of Virgil. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil. Translated by John Dryden. Book 1, Part 1. Arms and the man I sing, who, forced by fate, and haughty Juno's unrelenting hate, Expelled and exiled, left the Trojan shore, Long labours both by sea and land he bore, And in the doubtful war before he won The Latian realm and built the destined town, His banished gods restored to rites divine, And settled sure succession in his line, From whence the race of Alban fathers come, and the long glories of majestic Rome. O muse, the causes and the crimes relate, what goddess was provoked, and whence her hate, for what offence the queen of heaven began, to persecute so brave, so just a man, involved his anxious life in endless cares, exposed to wants, and hurried into wars. Can heavenly minds such high resentment show, or exercise their spite in human woe against the tiber's mouth but far away an ancient town was seated on the sea a tyrian colony the people made stout for the war and studious of their trade carthage the name beloved by juno more than her own argos or the samian shore here stood her chariot here if heaven were kind the seat of awful empire she designed Yet she had heard an ancient rumour fly, long sighted by the people of the sky, that times to come should see the Trojan race her Carthage ruin and her towers deface. Nor thus confined the yoke of sovereign sway should on the necks of all the nations lay. She pondered this, and feared it was in fate, nor could forget the war she waged of late, for conquering Greece against the Trojan state. Besides, long causes working in her mind, and secret seeds of envy lay behind, deep graven in her heart the doom remained, of partial Paris, and her form disdained. The grace bestowed on ravished Ganymede, Electra's glories, and her injured bed. Each was a cause alone, and all combined, to kindle vengeance in her haughty mind for this far distant from the latian coast she drove the remnants of the trojan host and seven long years the unhappy wandering train were tossed by storms and scattered through the main such time such toil required the roman name such length of labour for so vast a frame now scarce the trojan fleet with sails and oars had left behind the fair sicilian shores entering with cheerful shouts the watery rain and ploughing frothy furrows in the main when labouring still with endless discontent the queen of heaven did thus her fury vent then am i vanquished must i yield said she and must the trojans reign in italy so fate will have it and jove adds his force nor can my power divert their happy course could angry Pallas with revengeful spleen the Grecian navy burn and drown the men? She, for the fault of one offending foe, the bolts of Jove himself presumed to throw. With whirlwinds from beneath she tossed the ship, and bare exposed the bosom of the deep. Then as an eagle gripes the trembling game, the wretch yet hissing with her father's flame, she strongly seized, and with a burning wound transfixed and naked on a rock she bound. But I, who walk in awful state above, the majesty of heaven, the sister-wife of Jove, for length of years my fruitless force employ against the thin remains of ruined Troy, what nations now to Juno's power will pray, or offerings on my slighted altars lay? Thus raged the goddess, and with fury fraught the restless regions of the storms she sought, where in a spacious cave of living stone 
the tyrant aeolus from his airy throne with power imperial curbs the struggling winds and sounding tempests in dark prisons binds this way and that the impatient captives tend and pressing for release the mountains rend high in his hall the undaunted monarch stands and shakes his sceptre and their rage commands which did he not their unresisted sway would sweep the world before them in their way earth air and seas through empty space would roll and heaven would fly before the driving soul in fear of this the father of the gods confined their fury to those dark abodes and locked him safe within oppressed with mountain loads imposed a king with arbitrary sway to loose their fetters or their force allay to whom the suppliant queen her prayers addressed and thus the tenor of her suit expressed o aeolus for to thee the king of heaven the power of tempests and of winds has given thy force alone their fury can restrain and smooth the waves or swell the troubled main a race of wandering slaves abhorred by me with prosperous passage cut the tuscan sea to fruitful italy their course they steer and for their vanquished gods design new temples there raise all thy winds with night involve the skies sink or disperse my fatal enemies twice seven the charming daughters of the main around my person wait and bear my train succeed my wish and second my design the fairest deopia shall be thine and make thee father of a happy line to this the god tis yours o queen to will the work which duty binds me to fulfil these airy kingdoms and this wide command are all the presence of your bounteous hand yours is my sovereign's grace and as your guest i sit with gods at their celestial feast raise tempests at your pleasure or subdue dispose of empire which i hold from you he said and hurled against the mountain side his quivering spear and all the god applied the raging winds thrush through the hollow wound and dance aloft in air and skim along the ground then settling on the sea the surges sweep raise liquid mountains and disclose the deep south east and west with mixed confusion roar and roll the foaming billows to the shore the cables crack the sailors fearful cries ascend and sable night involves the skies and heaven itself is ravished from their eyes loud peals of thunder from the poles ensue then flashing fires the transient light renew the face of things a frightful image bears and present death in various forms appears struck with unusual fright the trojan chief with lifted hands and eyes invokes relief and thrice and four times happy those he cried that under ilian walls before their parents died tydides bravest of the grecian train why could not i by that strong arm be slain and lie by noble hector on the plain or great sarpedon in those bloody fields where simois rolls the bodies and the shields of heroes whose dismembered hands yet bear that dart aloft and clinch the pointed spear thus while the pious prince his fate bewails fierce boreas strove against his flying sails and rent the sheets the raging billows rise and mount the tossing vessels to the skies nor can the shivering oars sustain the blow the galley gives her side and turns her prow while those astern descending down the steep through gaping waves behold the boiling deep three ships were hurried by the southern blast and on the secret shelves with fury cast those hidden rocks the ausonian sailors knew they called them altars when they rose in view and showed their spacious backs above the flood three more fierce eurus in his angry mood dashed on the shallows of the moving sand and in mid-ocean left them moored a land orontes bark that bore the lycian crew a horrid sight even in the hero's view from stem to stern by waves was overborne the trembling pilot from his rudder torn was headlong hurled thrice round the ship was tossed then bulged at once and in the deep was lost 
and here and there above the waves were seen arms pictures precious goods and floating men the stoutest vessel to the storm gave way and sucked through loosened planks the rushing sea Ilionius was her chief alethes old achates faithful abas young and bold endured not less their ships with gaping seams admit the deluge of the briny streams meantime imperial neptune heard the sound of raging billows breaking on the ground displeased and fearing for his watery reign he reared his awful head above the main serene in majesty then rolled his eyes around the space of earth and seas and skies he saw the trojan fleet dispersed distressed by stormy winds and wintry heaven oppressed full well the god his sister's envy knew and what her aims and what her arts pursue he summoned eurus and the western blast and first an angry glance on both he cast then thus rebuked audacious winds from whence this bold attempt this rebel insolence is it for you to ravage seas and land unauthorized by my supreme command to raise such mountains on the troubled main whom i but first tis fit the billows to restrain and then you shall be taught obedience to my reign hence to your lord my royal mandate bear the realms of ocean and the fields of air are mine not his by fatal lot to me the liquid empire fell and trident of the sea his power to hollow caverns is confined there let him reign the jailer of the wind with hoarse commands his breathing subjects call and boast and bluster in his empty hall he spoke and while he spoke he smoothed the sea dispelled the darkness and restored the day Kimothoe, triton and the sea-green train of beauteous nymphs the daughters of the main clear from the rocks the vessels with their hands the god himself with ready trident stands and opes the deep and spreads the moving sands then heaves them off the shoals where'er he guides his finny coursers and in triumph rides the waves unruffle and the sea subsides as when in tumults rise the ignoble crowd mad are their motions and their tongues are loud and stones and brands and rattling volleys fly and all the rustic arms that fury can supply if then some grave and pious man appear they hush their noise and lend a listening ear he soothes with sober words their angry mood and quenches their innate desire of blood so when the father of the flood appears and o'er the seas his sovereign trident rears their fury falls he skims the liquid plains high on his chariot and with loosened reins majestic moves along and awful peace maintains the weary trojans ply their shattered oars to nearest land and make the libyan shores within a long recess there lies a bay an island shades it from the rolling sea and forms a port secure for ships to ride broke by the jutting land on either side in double streams the briny waters glide betwixt two rows of rocks a sylvan scene appears above and groves forever green a grot is formed beneath with mossy seats to rest the nereids and exclude the heats down through the crannies of the living walls the crystal streams descend in murmuring falls no halsers need to bind the vessels here nor bearded anchors for no storms they fear seven ships within this happy harbour meet the thin remainders of the scattered fleet the trojans worn with toils and spent with woes leap on the welcome land and seek their wished repose first good achates with repeated strokes of clashing flints their hidden fire provokes short flame succeeds a bed of withered leaves the dying sparkles in their fall receives caught into life in fiery fumes they rise and fed with stronger food invade the skies the trojans dropping wet or stand around the cheerful blaze or lie along the ground some dry their corn infected with the brine then grind with marbles and prepare to dine aeneas climbs the mountain's airy brow and takes a prospect of the seas below if Capis thence or antheus he could spy or see the streamers of caicus fly 
no vessels were in view but on the plain three beamy stags command a lordly train of branching heads the more ignoble throng attend their stately steps and slowly graze along he stood and while secure they fed below he took the quiver and the trusty bow achates used to bear the leaders first he laid along and then the vulgar pierced nor ceased his arrows till the shady plain seven mighty bodies with their blood disdain for the seven ships he made an equal share and to the port returned triumphant from the war the jars of generous wine acestes gift when his trinacrian shores the navy left he set a brooch and for the feast prepared in equal portions with the venison shared thus while he dealt it round the pious chief with cheerful words allayed the common grief endure and conquer jove will soon dispose to future good our past and present woes with me the rocks of scylla you have tried the inhuman cyclops and his din defied what greater ills hereafter can you bear resume your courage and dismiss your care an hour will come with pleasure to relate your sorrows past as benefits of fate through various hazards and events we move to Lytium, and the realms foredoomed by Jove, called to the seat the promise of the skies, where Trojan kingdoms once again may rise, endure the hardships of your present state, live and reserve yourselves for better fate. These words he spoke, but spoke not from his heart, his outward smiles concealed his inward smart the jolly crew unmindful of the past their quarry share their plenteous dinner haste some strip the skin some portion out the spoil the limbs yet trembling in the cauldrons boil some on the fire the reeking entrails broil stretched on the grassy turf at ease they dine restore their strength with meat and cheer their souls with wine their hunger thus appeased their care attends the doubtful fortune of their absent friends alternate hopes and fears their minds possess whether to deem em dead or in distress above the rest aeneas mourns the fate of brave orontes and the uncertain state of gaius lycus and of amicus the day but not their sorrows ended thus when from aloft almighty jove surveys earth air and shores and navigable seas at length on libyan realms he fixed his eyes whom pondering thus on human miseries when venus saw she with a lowly look not free from tears her heavenly sire bespoke o king of gods and men whose awful hand disperses thunder on the seas and land disposing all with absolute command how could my pious son thy power incense or what alas is vanished troy's offence our hope of italy not only lost on various seas by various tempests tossed but shut from every shore and barred from every coast you promised once a progeny divine of romans rising from the trojan line in after times should hold the world in awe and to the land and ocean give the law how is your doom reversed which eased my care when troy was ruined in that cruel war then fates to fates i could oppose but now when fortune still pursues her former blow what can i hope what worse can still succeed what end of labours has your will decreed antenor from the midst of grecian hosts could pass secure and pierce the illyrian coasts where rolling down the steep timavus raves and through nine channels disembogues his waves at length he founded padua's happy seat and gave his trojans a secure retreat there fixed their arms and there renewed their name and there in quiet rules and crowned with fame but we descended from your sacred line entitled to your heaven and rights divine our banished earth and for the wrath of one removed from latium and the promised throne are these our sceptres these our due rewards and is it thus that jove his plighted faith regards to whom the father of the immortal race smiling with that serene indulgent face with which he drives the clouds and clears the skies first gave a holy kiss then thus replies daughter dismiss thy fears 
To thy desire the fates of thine are fixed, and stand entire. Thou shalt behold thy wished Lavinian walls, And ripe for heaven when fate Aeneas calls, Then shalt thou bear him up sublime to me. No counsels have reversed my firm decree. And lest new fears disturb thy happy state, Know I have searched the mystic rolls of fate. Thy son, nor is the appointed season far, In Italy shall wage successful war, Shall tame fierce nations in the bloody field, And sovereign laws impose and cities build. Till, after every foe subdued, The sun thrice through the signs his annual race shall run, This is his time prefixed. Ascanius then, now called Iulus, shall begin his reign. He thirty rolling years the crown shall wear, Then from Lavinium shall the seat transfer, And with hard labor Alba Longa build. The throne with his succession shall be filled Three hundred circuits more, then shall be seen Ilia the fair, a priestess and a queen, Who, full of Mars in time with kindly throes, Shall at a birth two goodly boys disclose. The royal babes a tawny wolf shall train. Then Romulus his grandsire's throne shall gain. Of martial towers the founder shall become. The people Romans call the city Rome. To them no bounds of empire I assign nor term of years to their immortal line. Even haughty Juno, who with endless broils, earth, seas, and heaven, and Jove himself turmoils, at length atoned, her friendly power shall join to cherish and advance the Trojan line. The subject world shall Rome's dominion own, and prostrate shall adore the nation of the gown. An age is ripening in revolving fate, when Troy shall overturn the Grecian state, and sweet revenge her conquering sons shall call, to crush the people that conspired her fall. Then Caesar from the Julian stock shall rise, whose empire ocean and whose fame the skies alone shall bound, whom fraught with eastern spoils our heaven, the just reward of human toils, securely shall repay with rites divine and incense shall ascend before his sacred shrine. Then dire debate and impious war shall cease, and the stern age be softened into peace. Then banished faith shall once again return, and vestal fires in hallowed temples burn, and Remus with Quirinus shall sustain the righteous laws, and fraud and force restrain. Janus himself before his fane shall wait, and keep the dreadful issues of his gate with bolts and iron bars within remains imprisoned fury bound in brazen chains high on a trophy raised of useless arms he sits and threats the world with vain alarms he said and sent Cyllenius with command to free the ports and ope the punic land to trojan guests lest ignorant of fate the queen might force them from her town and state down from the steep of heaven Cyllenius flies, And cleaves with all his wings the yielding skies. Soon on the Libyan shore descends the god, Performs his message, and displays his rod. The surly murmurs of the people cease, And as the fates required they give the peace. The queen herself suspends the rigid laws, The Trojans pities, and protects their cause. Meantime, in shades of night, Aeneas lies. Care seized his soul, and sleep forsook his eyes. But when the sun restored the cheerful day, he rose the coast and country to survey. Anxious and eager to discover more, it looked a wild, uncultivated shore. But whether humankind or beasts alone possessed the new-found region was unknown. Beneath a ledge of rocks his fleet he hides. Tall trees surround the mountain's shady sides. The bending brow above a safe retreat provides. Armed with two pointed darts he leaves his friends, And true Achates on his steps attends. Lo, in the deep recesses of the wood, Before his eyes his goddess-mother stood. A huntress in her habit and her mien, 
her dress a maid, her air confessed a queen. Bare were her knees, and knots her garments bind, loose was her hair, and wantoned in the wind. Her hand sustained a bow, her quiver hung behind. She seemed a virgin of the Spartan blood, with such array Harpalis bestrode her Thracian courser and outstripped the rapid flood. Ho, oh, strangers, have you lately seen, she said, one of my sisters like myself arrayed, who crossed the lawn or in the forest strayed, a painted quiver at her back she bore, varied with spots, a lynx's hide she wore, and at full cry pursued the tusky boar. Thus Venus, thus her son replied again, None of your sisters have we heard or seen, O virgin, or what other name you bear above that style, O more than mortal fair. Your voice and mien celestial birth betray, if, as you seem, the sister of the day, or one at least of chaste Diana's train, let not an humble suppliant sue in vain, but tell a stranger long in tempests tossed what earth we tread and who commands the coast. Then on your name shall wretched mortals call, and offered victims at your altars fall. I dare not, she replied, assume the name of goddess or celestial honor's claim, for Tyrian virgins bows and quivers bear, and purple buskins o'er their ankles wear. No, gentle youth, in Libyan lands you are, a people rude in peace and rough in war. The rising city, which from far you see, is Carthage, and a Tyrian colony. Phoenician Dido rules the growing state, who fled from Tyre to shun her brother's hate. Great were her wrongs, her story full of fate, which I will sum in short. Sicaeus, known for wealth and brother to the Punic throne, possessed fair Dido's bed, and either heart at once was wounded with an equal dart. Her father gave her, yet a spotless maid, Pygmalion then the Tyrian scepter swayed, one who condemned divine and human laws. Then strife ensued and cursed gold the cause. The monarch, blinded with desire of wealth, with steel invades his brother's life by stealth, before the sacred altar made him bleed, and long from her concealed the cruel deed. Some tale, some new pretense he daily coined to soothe his sister and delude her mind. At length, in dead of night, the ghost appears of her unhappy lord. The spectre stares, and with erected eyes his bloody bosom bears. The cruel alters, and his fate he tells, and the dire secret of his house reveals. Then warns the widow with her household gods to seek a refuge in remote abodes. Last, to support her in so long a way, he shows her where his hidden treasure lay. Admonished thus, and seized with mortal fright, the queen provides companions of her flight. They meet, and all combine to leave the state, who hate the tyrant, or who fear his hate. They seize a fleet, which ready rigged they find, nor is Pygmalion's treasure left behind. The vessels, heavy laden, put to sea with prosperous winds, a woman leads the way. I know not if by stress of weather driven, or was their fatal course disposed by heaven? At last they landed, where from far your eyes may view the turrets of new Carthage rise. There bought a space of ground which, Bersa called, from the bull's hide they first enclosed and walled. But whence are you? What country claims your birth? What seek you, strangers, on our Libyan earth? To whom, with sorrow streaming from his eyes, and deeply sighing, thus her son replies. Could you with patience hear or I relate, O nymph, the tedious annals of our fate? Through such a train of woes, if I should run, the day would sooner than the tale be done. From ancient Troy, by force expelled, we came, if you by chance have heard the Trojan name. On various seas, by various tempests tossed, at length we landed on your Libyan coast. The good Aeneas am I called, a name, while fortune favoured, not unknown to fame. My household gods, companions of my woes, with pious care I rescued from our foes. To fruitful Italy my course was bent, 
and from the king of heaven is my descent with twice ten sail i crossed the phrygian sea fate and my mother goddess led my way scarce seven the thin remainders of my fleet from storms preserved within your harbour meet myself distressed an exile and unknown debarred from europe and from asia thrown in libyan deserts wander thus alone end of section one section two of the aeneid of virgil this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, Part Two. His tender parent could no longer bear, but interposing sought to soothe his care. Whoe'er you are, not unbeloved by heaven, since on our friendly shore your ships are driven, have courage, to the gods permit the rest, and to the queen expose your just request now take this earnest of success for more your scattered fleet is joined upon the shore the winds are changed your friends from danger free or i renounce my skill in augury twelve swans behold in beauteous order move and stoop with closing pinions from above whom late the bird of jove had driven along and through the clouds pursued the scattering throng now all united in a goodly team they skim the ground and seek the quiet stream as they with joy returning clap their wings and ride the circuit of the skies in rings not otherwise your ships and every friend already hold the port or with swift sails descend no more advice is needful but pursue the path before you and the town in view thus having said she turned and made appear her neck refulgent and dishevelled hair which flowing from her shoulders reached the ground and widely spread ambrosial scents around in length of train descends her sweeping gown and by her graceful walk the queen of love is known the prince pursued the parting deity with words like these ah whither do you fly unkind and cruel to deceive your son in borrowed shapes and his embraced shun never to bless my sight but thus unknown and still to speak in accents not your own against the goddess these complaints he made but took the path and her commands obeyed they march obscure for venus kindly shrouds with mists their persons and involves in clouds that thus unseen their passage none might stay or force to tell the causes of their way this part performed the goddess flies sublime to visit paphos and her native clime where garlands ever green and ever fair with vows are offered and with solemn prayer a hundred altars in her temples smoke a thousand bleeding hearts her power invoke they climb the next ascent and looking down now at a nearer distance view the town the prince with wonder sees the stately towers which late were huts and shepherds homely bowers the gates and streets and hears from every part the noise and busy concourse of the mart the toiling tyrians on each other call to ply their labour some extend the wall some build the citadel the brawny throng or dig or push unwieldy stones along some for their dwellings choose a spot of ground which first designed with ditches they surround some laws ordain and some attend the choice of holy senates and elect by voice here some design a mole while others there lay deep foundations for a theatre from marble quarries mighty columns hew for ornaments of scenes and future view such is their toil and such their busy pains as exercise the bees in flowery plains when winter past and summer scarce begun invites them forth to labour in the sun some lead their youth abroad while some condense their liquid store and some in cells dispense some at the gate stand ready to receive the golden burthen and their friends relieve all with united force combine to drive the lazy drones from the laborious hive with envy stung they view each other's deeds the fragrant work with diligence proceeds thrice happy you whose walls already rise aeneas said and viewed with lifted eyes their lofty towers 
then entering at the gate concealed in clouds prodigious to relate he mixed unmarked among the busy throng borne by the tide and passed unseen along full in the centre of the town there stood thick set with trees a venerable wood the tyrians landing near this holy ground and digging here a prosperous omen found from under earth a courser's head they drew their growth and future fortune to foreshow this fated sign their foundress juno gave of a soil fruitful and a people brave sidonian dido here with solemn state did juno's temple build and consecrate enriched with gifts and with a golden shrine but more the goddess made the place divine on brazen steps the marble threshold rose and brazen plates the cedar beams enclose the rafters are with brazen coverings crowned the lofty doors on brazen hinges sound what first aeneas this place beheld revived his courage and his fear expelled for while expecting there the queen he raised his wondering eyes and round the temple gazed admired the fortune of the rising town the striving artists and their arts renown he saw in order painted on the wall whatever did unhappy troy befall the wars that fame around the world had blown all to the life and every leader known there agamemnon priam here he spies and fierce achilles who both kings defies he stopped and weeping said o oh, friend even here the monuments of trojan woes appear our known disasters fill even foreign lands see there where old unhappy priam stands even the mute walls relate the warrior's fame and trojan griefs the tyrians pity claim he said his tears a ready passage find devouring what he saw so well designed and with an empty picture fed his mind for there he saw the fainting grecians yield and here the trembling trojans quit the field pursued by fierce achilles through the plain on his high chariot driving o'er the slain the tents of rhesus next his grief renew by their white sails betray to nightly view and wakeful diomed whose cruel sword the sentries slew nor spared their slumbering lord then took the fiery steeds ere yet the food of troy they taste or drink the xanthian flood elsewhere he saw where troilus defied achilles and unequal combat tried then where the boy disarmed with loosened reins was by his horses hurried o'er the plains hung by the neck and hair and dragged around the hostile spear yet sticking in his wound with tracks of blood inscribed the dusty ground meantime the trojan dames oppressed with woe to pallas fain in long procession go in hopes to reconcile their heavenly foe they weep they beat their breasts they rend their hair and rich embroidered vests for presents bear but the stern goddess stands unmoved with prayer thrice round the trojan walls achilles drew the corpse of hector whom in fight he slew here priam sues and there for sums of gold the lifeless body of his son is sold so sad an object and so well expressed drew sighs and groans from the grieved hero's breast to see the figure of his lifeless friend and his old sire his helpless hand extend himself he saw amidst the grecian train mixed in the bloody battle on the plain and swarthy memnon in his arms he knew his pompous incense and his indian crew penthesilea there with haughty grace leads to the wars an amazonian race in their right hands a pointed dart they wield the left for ward sustains the lunar shield athwart her breast a golden belt she throws amidst the press alone provokes a thousand foes and dares her maiden arms to manly force oppose thus while the trojan prince employs his eyes fixed on the walls with wonder and surprise 
the beauteous dido with a numerous train and pomp of guards ascends the sacred fane such on eurotas banks or kynthos height diana seems and so she charms the sight when in the dance the graceful goddess leads the choir of nymphs and overtops their heads known by her quiver and her lofty mien she walks majestic and she looks their queen latona sees her shine above the rest and feeds with secret joy her silent breast such dido was with such becoming state amidst the crowd she walks serenely great their labor to her future sway she speeds and passing with a gracious glance proceeds then mounts the throne high placed before the shrine in crowds around the swarming people join she takes petitions and dispenses laws hears and determines every private cause their tasks in equal portions she divides and where unequal there by lots decides another way by chance aeneas bends his eyes and unexpected sees his friends antheus sergestus grave cloanthus strong and at their backs a mighty trojan throng whom late the tempest on the billows tossed and widely scattered on another coast the prince unseen surprised with wonder stands and longs with joyful haste to join their hands but doubtful of the wished event he stays and from the hollow cloud his friends surveys impatient till they told their present state and where they left their ships and what their fate and why they came and what was their request for these were sent commissioned by the rest to sue for leave to land their sickly men and gain admission to the gracious queen entering with cries they filled the holy fane then thus with lowly voice Ilioneus began o queen indulged by favor of the gods to found an empire in these new abodes to build a town with statutes to restrain the wild inhabitants beneath thy reign we wretched trojans tossed on every shore from sea to sea thy clemency implore forbid the fires our shipping to deface receive the unhappy fugitives to grace and spare the remnant of a pious race we come not with design of wasteful prey to drive the country force the swains away nor such our strength nor such is our desire the vanquished dare not to such thoughts aspire a land there is hesperia named of old the soil is fruitful and the men are bold the enotrians held it once by common fame now called italia from the leader's name to that sweet region was our voyage bent when winds and every warring element disturbed our course and far from sight of land cast our torn vessels on the moving sand the sea came on the south with mighty roar dispersed and dashed the rest upon the rocky shore those few you see escaped the storm and fear unless you interpose a shipwreck here what men what monsters what inhuman race what laws what barbarous customs of the place shut up a desert shore to drowning men and drive us to the cruel seas again if our hard fortune no compassion draws nor hospitable rights nor human laws the gods are just and will revenge our cause aeneas was our prince a juster lord or nobler warrior never drew a sword observant of the right religious of his word if yet he lives and draws this vital air nor we his friends of safety shall despair nor you great queen these offices repent which he will equal and perhaps augment we want not cities nor sicilian coasts where king acestes trojan lineage boasts permit our ships a shelter on your shores refitted from your woods with planks and oars that if our prince be safe we may renew our destined course and italy pursue but if o best of men the fates ordain that thou art swallowed in the libyan main and if our young eulus be no more dismiss our navy from your friendly shore that we to good acestes may return 
and with our friends our common losses mourn thus spoke ilioneus the trojan crew with cries and clamours his request renew the modest queen a while with downcast eyes pondered the speech then briefly thus replies trojans dismiss your fears my cruel fate and doubts attending an unsettled state force me to guard my coast from foreign foes who has not heard the story of your woes the name and fortune of your native place the fame and valor of the phrygian race we tyrians are not so devoid of sense nor so remote from phoebus influence whether to latian shores your course is bent or driven by tempests from your first intent you seek the good acestes government your men shall be received your fleet repaired and sail with ships of convoy for your guard or would you stay and join your friendly powers to raise and to defend the tyrian towers my wealth my city and myself are yours and would to heaven the storm you felt would bring on carthaginian coasts your wandering king my people shall by my command explore the ports and creeks of every winding shore and towns and wilds and shady woods in quest of so renowned and so desired a guest raised in his mind the trojan hero stood and longed to break from out his ambient cloud achates found it and thus urged his way from whence o goddess born this long delay what more can you desire your welcome sure your fleet in safety and your friends secure one only wants and him we saw in vain oppose the storm and swallowed in the main orontes in his fate our forfeit paid the rest agrees with what your mother said scarce had he spoken when the cloud gave way the mists flew upward and dissolved in day the trojan chief appeared in open sight august in visage and serenely bright his mother goddess with her hands divine had formed his curling locks and made his temples shine and given his rolling eyes a sparkling grace and breathed a youthful vigor on his face like polished ivory beauteous to behold or parian marble when enchased in gold thus radiant from the circling cloud he broke and thus with manly modesty he spoke he whom you seek am i by tempest tossed and saved from shipwreck on your libyan coast presenting gracious queen before your throne a prince that owes his life to you alone fair majesty the refuge and redress of those whom fate pursues and wants oppress you who your pious offices employ to save the relics of abandoned troy receive the shipwrecked on your friendly shore with hospitable rites relieve the poor associate in your town a wandering train and strangers in your palace entertain what thanks can wretched fugitives return who scattered through the world in exile mourn the gods if gods to goodness are inclined if acts of mercy touch their heavenly mind and more than all the gods your generous heart conscious of worth requite its own desert in you this age is happy and this earth and parents more than mortal gave you birth while rolling rivers into seas shall run and round the space of heaven the radiant sun while trees the mountain tops with shade supply your honor name and praise shall never die whate'er abode my fortune has assigned your image shall be present in my mind thus having said he turned with pious haste and joyful his expecting friends embraced with his right hand ilioneus was graced serestes with his left then to his breast cloanthus and the noble gaius pressed and so by turns descended to the rest the tyrian queen stood fixed upon his face pleased with his motions ravished with his grace admired his fortunes more admired the man then recollected stood and thus began what fate o goddess born what angry powers have cast you shipwrecked on our barren shores are you the great aeneas known to fame who from celestial seed your lineage claim 
the same aeneas whom fair venus bore to famed anchises on the idaean shore it calls into my mind though then a child when teucer came from salamis exiled and sought my father's aid to be restored my father belus then with fire and sword invaded cyprus made the region bare and conquering finished the successful war from him the trojan siege i understood the grecian chiefs and your illustrious blood your foe himself the dardan valor praised and his own ancestry from trojans raised enter my noble guest and you shall find if not a costly welcome yet a kind for i myself like you have been distressed till heaven afforded me this place of rest like you an alien in a land unknown i learn to pity woes so like my own she said and to the palace led her guest then offered incense and proclaimed a feast nor yet less careful for her absent friends twice ten fat oxen to the ships she sends besides a hundred boars a hundred lambs with bleating cries attend their milky dams and jars of generous wine and spacious bowls she gives to cheer the sailors drooping souls now purple hangings clothe the palace walls and sumptuous feasts are made in splendid halls on tyrian carpets richly wrought they dine with loads of massy plate the sideboards shine and antique vases all of gold embossed the gold itself inferior to the cost of curious work where on the sides were seen the fights and figures of illustrious men from their first founder to the present queen the good aeneas paternal care iulus absence could no longer bear dispatched achates to the ships in haste to give a glad relation of the past and fraught with precious gifts to bring the boy snatched from the ruins of unhappy troy a robe of tissue stiff with golden wire an upper vest once helen's rich attire from argos by the famed adulteress brought with golden flowers and winding foliage wrought her mother led us present when she came to ruin troy and set the world on flame the sceptre priam's eldest daughter bore her orient necklace and the crown she wore of double texture glorious to behold one order set with gems and one with gold instructed thus the wise Achates goes, and in his diligence his duty shows. But Venus, anxious for her son's affairs, new counsels tries, and new designs prepares, that Cupid should assume the shape and face of sweet Ascanius, and the sprightly grace should bring the presence in her nephew's stead, and in Eliza's veins the gentle poison shed for much she feared the tyrians double-tongued and knew the town to juno's care belonged these thoughts by night her golden slumbers broke and thus alarmed to winged love she spoke my son my strength whose mighty power alone controls the thunderer on his awful throne to thee thy much afflicted mother flies and on thy succour and thy faith relies thou knowest my son how jove's revengeful wife by force and fraud attempts thy brother's life and often hast thou mourned with me his pains him dido now with blandishment detains but i suspect the town where juno reigns for this tis needful to prevent her art and fire with love the proud phoenician's heart a love so violent so strong so sure as neither age can change nor art can cure how this may be performed now take my mind ascanius by his father is designed to come with presents laden from the port to gratify the queen and gain the court i mean to plunge the boy in pleasing sleep and ravished in idalian bowers to keep or high Cythera, that the sweet deceit may pass unseen and none prevent the cheat take thou his form and shape i beg the grace but only for a knight's revolving space thyself a boy assume a boy's dissembled face that when amidst the fervour of the feast the tyrian hugs and fawns thee on her breast and with sweet kisses in her arms constrains 
thou mayst infuse thy venom in her veins. The god of love obeys, and sets aside his bow and quiver and his plumy pride. He walks Aeolus in his mother's sight, and in the sweet resemblance takes delight. The goddess then to young Ascanius flies, and in a pleasing slumber seals his eyes. Lulled in her lap amidst a train of loves, she gently bears him to her blissful groves. Then with a wreath of myrtle crowns his head, and softly lays him on a flowery bed. Cupid, meantime, assumed his form and face, following Achates with a shorter pace, and brought the gifts. The queen already sate amidst the Trojan lords in shining state, high on a golden bed. Her princely guest was next her side, in order sate the rest. Then canisters with bread are heaped on high, the attendants water for their hands supply, and having washed with silken towels dry, next fifty handmaids in long order bore the censers, and with fumes the gods adore, then youths and virgins twice as many join to place the dishes and to serve the wine. The Tyrian train admitted to the feast approach, and on the painted couches rest. All on the Trojan gifts with wonder gaze, but view the beauteous boy with more amaze. His rosy-colored cheeks, his radiant eyes, his motions, voice, and shape, and all the gods disguise nor pass unpraised the vest and veil divine which wandering foliage and rich flowers entwine but far above the rest the royal dame already doomed to love's disastrous flame with eyes insatiate and tumultuous joy beholds the presence and admires the boy the guileful god about the hero long with children's play and false embraces hung then sought the queen. She took him to her arms with greedy pleasure and devoured his charms. Unhappy Dido little thought what guest how dire a god she drew so near her breast. But he, not mindless of his mother's prayer, works in the pliant bosom of the fair, and moulds her heart anew, and blots her former care. The dead is to the living love resigned, and all Aeneas enters in her mind. Now when the rage of hunger was appeased, the meat removed, and every guest was pleased, the golden bowls with sparkling wine are crowned, and through the palace cheerful cries resound. From gilded roofs depending lamps display nocturnal beams that emulate the day. A golden bowl that shone with gems divine, the queen commanded to be crowned with wine the bowl that Belus used, and all the Tyrian line. Then silence through the hall proclaimed, she spoke, O hospitable Jove, we thus invoke with solemn rites thy sacred name and power, bless to both nations this auspicious hour. So may the Trojan and the Tyrian line in lasting concord from this day combine. Thou, Bacchus, god of joys and friendly cheer, and gracious Juno, both be present here. And you, my lords of Tyre, your vows address to heaven with mine to ratify the peace. The goblet then she took with nectar crowned, sprinkling the first libations on the ground, and raised it to her mouth with sober grace, then sipping offered the next in place. T'was Bitius whom she called a thirsty soul. He took challenge and embraced the bowl, with pleasure swilled the gold, nor ceased to draw, till he the bottom of the brimmer saw. The goblet goes around, Eopas brought his golden lyre, and sung what ancient Atlas taught, the various labors of the wandering moon, and whence proceed the eclipses of the sun, the original of men and beasts, and whence the rains arise, and fires their warmth dispense, and fixed and erring stars dispose their influence. What shakes the solid earth, what cause delays the summer nights, and shortens winter days? With peals of shouts the Tyrians praise the song. Those peals are echoed by the Trojan throng. The unhappy queen with talk prolonged the night, and drank large draughts of love with vast delight, of Priam much inquired, of Hector more, 
then asked what arms the swarthy memnon wore what troops he landed on the trojan shore the steeds of diomede varied the discourse and fierce achilles with his matchless force at length as fate and her ill stars required to hear the series of the war desired relate at large my godlike guest she said the grecian stratagems the town betrayed the fatal issue of so long a war your flight your wanderings and your woes declare for since on every sea on every coast your men have been distressed your navy tossed seven times the sun has either tropic viewed the winter banished and the spring renewed end of section two section three of the aeneid of virgil this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil Translated by John Dryden Book Two, Part One All were attentive to the godlike man, when from his lofty couch he thus began. Great Queen, what you command me to relate, renews the sad remembrance of our fate. An empire from its old foundations rent, and every woe the Trojans underwent. A peopled city made a desert place, all that I saw and part of which I was, not even the hardest of our foes could hear, nor stern Ulysses tell without a tear. And now the latter watch of wasting night and setting stars to kindly rest invite. But since you take such interest in our woe, and Troy's disastrous end desire to know. I will restrain my tears, and briefly tell what in our last and fatal night befell. By destiny compelled, and in despair, the Greeks grew weary of the tedious war, and by Minerva's aid a fabric reared, which like a steed of monstrous height appeared. The sides were planked with pine, they feigned it made for their return, and this the vow they paid. Thus they pretend, but in the hollow side selected numbers of their soldiers hide. With inward arms the dire machine they load, and iron bowels stuff the dark abode. In sight of Troy lies Tenedos, an isle, while fortune did on Priam's empire smile, renowned for wealth but since a faithless bay where ships exposed to wind and weather lay there was their fleet concealed we thought for greece their sails were hoisted and our fears release the trojans cooped within their walls so long unbar their gates and issue in a throng like swarming bees and with delight survey the camp deserted where the grecians lay the quarters of the several chiefs they showed here phoenix here achilles made abode here joined the battles there the navy rode part on the pile their wandering eyes employ the pile by pallas raised to ruin troy Thymetus first tis doubtful whether hired or so the trojan destiny required moved that the ramparts might be broken down to lodge the monster fabric in the town but Capis and the rest of sounder mind the fatal present to the flames designed or to the watery deep at least to bore the hollow sides and hidden frauds explore the giddy vulgar as their fancies guide with noise say nothing and in parts divide laocon followed by a numerous crowd ran from the fort and cried from far aloud o wretched countrymen what fury reigns what more than madness has possessed your brains think you the grecians from your coasts are gone and are ulysses arts no better known this hollow fabric must either enclose within its blind recess our secret foes or tis an engine raised above the town to o'erlook the walls and then to batter down somewhat is sure designed by fraud or force 
trust not their presence nor admit the horse thus having said against the steed he threw his forceful spear which hissing as flew pierced through the yielding planks of jointed wood and trembling in the hollow belly stood the sides transpierced return a rattling sound and groans of greeks enclosed come issuing through the wound and had not heaven the fall of troy designed or had not men been fated to be blind enough was said and done to inspire a better mind then had our lances pierced the treacherous wood and ilian towers and priam's empire stood meantime with shouts the trojan shepherds bring a captive greek in bands before the king taken to take who made himself their prey to impose on their belief and troy betray fixed on his aim and obstinately bent to die undaunted or to circumvent about the captive tides of trojans flow all press to see and some insult the foe now hear how well the greeks their wiles disguised behold a nation in a man comprised trembling the miscreant stood unarmed and bound he stared and rolled his haggard eyes around then said alas what earth remains what sea is open to receive unhappy me what fate a wretched fugitive attends scorned by my foes abandoned by my friends he said and sighed and cast a rueful eye our pity kindles and our passions die we cheer youth to make his own defence and freely tell us what he was and whence what news he could impart we long to know and what to credit from a captive foe his fear at length dismissed he said whate'er my fate ordains my words shall be sincere i neither can nor dare my birth disclaim greece is my country sinon is my name though plunged by fortune's power in misery tis not in fortune's power to make me lie if any chance has hither brought the name of palamedes not unknown to fame who suffered from the malice of the times accused and sentenced for pretended crimes because these fatal wars he would prevent whose death the wretched greeks too late lament me then a boy my father poor and bare of other means committed to his care his kinsman and companion in the war while fortune favoured while his arms support the cause and ruled the councils of the court i made some figure there nor was my name obscure nor i without my share of fame but when ulysses with fallacious arts had made impression in the people's hearts and forged a treason in my patron's name i speak of things too far divulged by fame my kinsman fell then i without support in private mourned his loss and left the court mad as i was i could not bear his fate with silent grief but loudly blamed the state and cursed the direful author of my woes twas told again and hence my ruin rose i threatened if indulgent heaven once more would land me safely on my native shore his death with double vengeance to restore this moved the murderer's hate and soon ensued the effects of malice from a man so proud ambiguous rumours through the camp he spread and sought by treason my devoted head new crimes invented left unturned no stone to make my guilt appear and hide his own till calchas was by force and threatening wrought but why why dwell i on that anxious thought if on my nation just revenge you seek and tis to appear a foe to appear a greek already you my name and country know assuage your thirst of blood and strike the blow my death will both the kingly brothers please and set insatiate ithacus at ease this fair unfinished tale these broken starts raised expectations in our longing hearts unknowing as we were in grecian arts his former trembling once again renewed with acted fear the villain thus pursued long had the grecians tired with fruitless care and wearied with an unsuccessful war resolved to raise the siege and leave the town 
and had the gods permitted they had gone but oft the wintry seas and southern winds withstood their passage home and changed their minds portents and prodigies their souls amazed but most when this stupendous pile was raised then flaming meteors hung in air were seen and thunders rattled through a sky serene dismayed and fearful of some dire event eurypylus to inquire their fate was sent he from the gods this dreadful answer brought o grecians when the trojan shores you sought your passage with a virgin's blood was bought so must your safe return be bought again and grecian blood once more atone the main the spreading rumour round the people ran all feared and each believed himself the man ulysses took the advantage of their fright called calchas and produced in open sight then bade him name the wretch ordained by fate the public victim to redeem the state already some presaged the dire event and saw what sacrifice ulysses meant for twice five days the good old seer withstood the intended treason and was dumb to blood till tired with endless clamours and pursuit of ithacus he stood no longer mute but as it was agreed pronounced that i was destined by the wrathful gods to die all praised the sentence pleased the storm should fall on one alone whose fury threatened all the dismal day was come the priests prepare their leavened cakes and fillets for my hair i followed nature's laws and must avow i broke my bonds and fled the fatal blow hid in a weedy lake all night i lay secure of safety when they sailed away but now what further hopes for me remain to see my friends or native soil again my tender infants or my careful sire whom they returning will to death require will perpetrate on them their first design and take the forfeit of their heads for mine which oh if pity mortal minds can move if there be faith below or gods above if innocence and truth can claim desert ye trojans from an injured wretch avert false tears true pity move the king commands to loose his fetters and unbind his hands then adds these friendly words dismiss thy fears forget the greeks be mine as thou wert theirs but truly tell was it for force or guile or some religious end you raised the pile thus said the king he full of fraudful arts this well-invented tale for truth imparts ye lamps of heaven he said and lifted high his hands now free thou venerable sky inviolable powers adored with dread ye fatal fillets that once bound this head ye sacred altars from whose flames i fled be all of you adjured and grant i may without a crime the ungrateful greeks betray reveal the secrets of the guilty state and justly punish whom i justly hate but you o king preserve the faith you gave if i to save myself your empire save the grecian hopes and all the attempts they made were only founded on minerva's aid but from the time when impious diomed and false ulysses that inventive head her fatal image from the temple drew the sleeping guardians of the castle slew her virgin statue with their bloody hands polluted and profaned her holy bands from thence the tide of fortune left their shore and ebbed much faster than it flowed before their courage languished as their hopes decayed and pallas now averse refused her aid nor did the goddess doubtfully declare her altered mind and alienated care when first her fatal image touched the ground she sternly cast her glaring eyes around that sparkled as they rolled and seemed to threat her heavenly limbs to still the briny sweat thrice from the ground she leaped was seen to wield her brandished lance and shake her horrid shield then calchas bade our host for flight and hope no conquest from the tedious war till first they sailed for greece with prayers besought her injured power and better omens brought and now their navy ploughs the watery main yet soon expect it on your shores again with pallas pleased as calchas did ordain but first to reconcile the blue-eyed maid 
for her stolen statue and her tower betrayed warned by the seer to her offended name we raised and dedicate this wondrous frame so lofty lest through your forbidden gates it pass and intercept our better fates for once admitted there our hopes are lost and troy may then a new palladium boast for so religion and the gods ordain that if you violate with hands profane minerva's gift your town in flames shall burn which omen o ye gods on grecia turn but if it climb with your assisting hands the trojan walls and in the city stands then troy shall argos and mycenae burn and the reverse of fate on us return with such deceits he gained their easy hearts too prone to credit his perfidious arts what diomede nor thetis greater son a thousand ships nor ten years siege had done false tears and fawning words the city won a greater omen and of worse portent did our unwary minds with fear torment concurring to produce the dire event laocoon neptune's priest by lot that year with solemn pomp then sacrificed a steer when dreadful to behold from sea we spied two serpents ranked abreast the seas divide and smoothly sweep along the swelling tide their flaming crests above the waves they show their bellies seem to burn the seas below their speckled tails advance to steer their course and on the sounding shore the flying billows force and now the strand and now the plain they held their ardent eyes with bloody streaks were filled their nimble tongues they brandished as they came and licked their hissing jaws that sputtered flame we fled amazed their destined way they take and to laocoon and his children make and first around the tender boys they wind then with their sharpened fangs their limbs and bodies grind the wretched father running to their aid with pious haste but vain they next invade twice round his waist their winding volumes rolled and twice about his gasping throat they fold the priest thus doubly choked their crests divide and towering o'er his head in triumph ride with both his hands he labours at the knots his holy fillets the blue venom blots his roaring fills the flitting air around thus when an ox receives a glancing wound he breaks his bands the fatal altar flies and with loud bellowings breaks the yielding skies their tasks performed the serpents quit their prey and to the tower of pallas make their way couched at her feet they lie protected there by her large buckler and protended spear amazement seizes all the general cry proclaims laocoon justly doomed to die whose hand the will of pallas had withstood and dared to violate the sacred wood all vote to admit the steed that vows be paid and incense offered to the offended maid a spacious breach is made the town lies bare some hoisting levers some the wheels prepare and fasten to the horse's feet the rest with cables haul along the unwieldy beast each on his fellow for assistance calls at length the fatal fabric mounts the walls big with destruction boys with chaplets crowned and choirs of virgins sing and dance around thus raised aloft and then descending down it enters o'er our heads and threats the town o sacred city built by hands divine o valiant heroes of the trojan line four times he struck as oft the clashing sound of arms was heard and inward groans rebound yet mad with zeal and blinded with our fate we haul along the horse in solemn state then place the dire portent within the tower cassandra cried and cursed the unhappy hour foretold our fate but by the god's decree all heard and none believed the prophecy with branches we the fanes adorn and waste in jollity the day ordained to be the last meantime the rapid heavens rolled down the light and on the shaded ocean rushed the night our men secure nor guards nor sentries held but easy sleep their weary limbs compelled 
The Grecians had embarked their naval powers from Tenedos and sought our well-known shores, safe under covert of the silent night, and guided by the imperial galley's light, when Sinon, favored by the partial gods, unlocked the horse and oped his dark abodes, restored to vital air our hidden foes, who, joyful from their long confinement, rose, Tysander bold, and Sthenelus their guide, and dire Ulysses down the cable slide. Then Thoas, Athamas, and Pyrrhus haste, nor was the Podalirian hero last, nor injured Menelaus, nor the famed Epeus, who the fatal engine framed. A nameless crowd succeed, their forces join to invade the town, oppressed with sleep and wine. Those few they find awake first meet their fate, then to their fellows they unbar the gate. Twas in the dead of night, when sleep repairs our bodies worn with toils, our minds with cares, when Hector's ghost before my sight appears, a bloody shroud he seemed and bathed in tears, such as he was when by Pelides slain, Thessalian courses dragged him o'er the plain. Swollen were his feet, as when the thongs were thrust through the board holes, his body black with dust, unlike that Hector who returned from toils of war triumphant in Achaean spoils, or him who made the fainting Greeks retire and launched against their navy Phrygian fire. His hair and beard stood stiffened with his gore, and all the wounds he for his country bore now streamed afresh and with new purple ran. I wept to see the visionary man, and while my trance continued thus began, O light of Trojans and support of Troy, thy father's champion and thy country's joy, O long expected by thy friends, from whence art thou so late returned for our defence? Do we behold thee, wearied as we are with length of labours and with toils of war? After so many funerals of thy own, art thou restored to thy declining town? But say, what wounds are these? What new disgrace deforms the manly features of thy face? To this the spectre no reply did frame, but answered to the cause for which he came, and, groaning from the bottom of his breast, this warning in these mournful words expressed, O goddess born, escape by timely flight the flames and horrors of this fatal night. The foes already have possessed the wall, Troy nods from high and totters to her fall. Enough is paid to Priam's royal name, more than enough to duty and to fame. If by a mortal hand my father's throne could be defended, t'was by mine alone. Now Troy to thee commends her future state, and gives her gods companions of thy fate. From their assistance walls expect, which wandering long at last thou shalt erect. He said, and brought me from their blessed abodes, the venerable statues of the gods, with ancient Vesta from the sacred choir, the wreaths and relics of the immortal fire. Now peals of shouts come thundering from afar, cries, threats, and loud laments, and mingled war. The noise approaches, though our palace stood aloof from streets, encompassed with a wood. Louder and yet more loud I hear the alarms of human cries distinct and clashing arms. Fear broke my slumbers. I no longer stay, but mount the terrace, thence the town survey, and hearken what the frightful sounds convey. Thus, when a flood of fire by wind is borne, crackling it rolls and mows the standing corn, or deluges descending on the plains, sweep o'er the yellow year, destroy the pains of labouring oxen and the peasants' gains, unroot the forest oaks and bear away flocks, folds, and trees, and undistinguished prey. The shepherd climbs the cliff, and sees from far the wasteful ravage of the watery war. Then Hector's faith was manifestly cleared, and Grecian frauds in open light appeared. The palace of Deiphobus ascends in smoky flames, and catches on his friends. Ucalagon burns next, the seas are bright with splendor not their own, and shine with Trojan light. New clamors and new clangors now arise, 
the sound of trumpets mixed with fighting cries with frenzy seized i run to meet the alarms resolved on death resolved to die in arms but first to gather friends with them to oppose if fortune favored and repel the foes spurred by my courage by my country fired with sense of honor and revenge inspired pantheus apollo's priest a sacred name had scaped the grecian swords and passed the flame with relics loaden to my doors he fled and by the hand his tender grandson led what hope o pantheus whither can we run where make a stand and what may yet be done scarce had i said when pantheus with a groan troy is no more and ilium was a town the fatal day the appointed hour is come when wrathful jove's irrevocable doom transfers the trojan state to grecian hands the fire consumes the town the foe commands and armed hosts an unexpected force break from the bowels of the fatal horse within the gates proud sinon throws about the flames and foes for entrance press without with thousand others whom i fear to name more than from argos or mycenae came to several posts their parties they divide some block the narrow streets some scour the wide the bold they kill the unwary they surprise who fights finds death and death finds him who flies the warders of the gate but scarce maintain the unequal combat and resist in vain i heard and heaven that well-born souls inspires prompts me through lifted swords and rising fires to run where clashing arms and clamour calls and rush undaunted to defend the walls ripheus and ephetus by my side engage for valour one renowned and one for age demos and hippanis by moonlight knew my motions and my mien and to my party drew with young coribus who by love was led to win renown and fair cassandra's bed and lately brought his troops to priam's aid forewarned in vain by the prophetic maid whom when i saw resolved in arms to fall and that one spirit animated all brave souls said i but brave alas in vain come finish what our cruel fates ordain you see the desperate state of our affairs and heaven's protecting powers are deaf to prayers the passive gods behold the greeks defile their temples and abandon to the spoil their own abodes we feeble few conspire to save a sinking town involved in fire then let us fall but fall amidst our foes despair of life the means of living shows so bold a speech encouraged their desire of death and added fuel to their fire as hungry wolves with raging appetite scour through the fields nor fear the stormy night their whelps at home expect the promised food and long to temper their dry chaps in blood so rushed we forth at once resolved to die resolved in death the last extremes to try we leave the narrow lanes behind and dare the unequal combat in the public square night was our friend our leader was despair what tongue can tell the slaughter of that night what eyes can weep the sorrows and affright an ancient and imperial city falls the streets are filled with frequent funerals houses and holy temples float in blood and hostile nations make a common flood not only trojans fall but in their turn the vanquished triumph and the victors mourn ours take new courage from despair and night confused the fortune is confused the fight all parts resound with tumults plaints and fears and grisly death in sundry shapes appears androgeos fell among us with his band who thought us grecians newly come to land from whence said he my friends this long delay you loiter while the spoils are borne away our ships are laden with the trojan store and you like truants come too late ashore he said but soon corrected his mistake found by the doubtful answers which we make amazed he would have shunned the unequal fight but we more numerous intercept his flight as when some peasant in a bushy brake has with unwary footing pressed a snake he starts aside astonished when he spies his rising crest blue neck and rolling eyes 
So from our arms surprised Androgeos flies, in vain, for him and his we compassed round, possessed with fear, unknowing of the ground, and of their lives an easy conquest found. Thus fortune on our first endeavor smiled. Coribus then, with youthful hopes beguiled, swollen with success and a daring mind, this new invention fatally designed. My friends, said he, since fortune shows the way, tis fit we should the auspicious guide obey. For what has she these Grecian arms bestowed, but their destruction and the Trojans' good? Then change we shields, and their devices bear. Let fraud supply the want of force in war. They find us arms. This said, himself he dressed in dead Androgeos' spoils, his upper vest, his painted buckler, and his plumy crest. Thus Rephaeus, Demas, all the Trojan train, lay down their own attire and strip the slain. Mixed with the Greeks we go with ill presage, flattered with hopes to glut our greedy rage. Unknown, assaulting whom we blindly meet, and strew with Grecian carcasses the street. Thus, while their straggling parties we defeat, some to the shore and safer ships retreat, and some, oppressed with more ignoble fear, remount the hollow horse and pant in secret there. End of section 3section four of the aeneid of virgil this librivox recording is in the public domain book two part two but ah what use of valor can be made when heaven's propitious powers refuse their aid behold the royal prophetess the fair cassandra dragged by her dishevelled hair whom not minerva's shrine nor sacred bands in safety could protect from sacrilegious hands on heaven she cast her eyes she sighed she cried twas all she could her tender arms were tied so sad a sight coribus could not bear but fired with rage distracted with despair amid the barbarous ravishers he flew our leader's rash example we pursue but storms of stones from the proud temple's height pour down and on our battered helms alight we from our friends received this fatal blow who thought us grecians as we seemed in show they aim at the mistaken crests from high and ours beneath the ponderous ruin lie then moved with anger and disdain to see their troops dispersed the royal virgin free the grecians rally and their powers unite with fury charge us and renew the fight the brother kings with ajax join their force and the whole squadron of thessalian horse thus when the rival winds their quarrel try contending for the kingdom of the sky south east and west on airy courses borne the whirlwind gathers and the woods are torn the nereus strikes the deep the billows rise and mixed with ooze and sand pollute the skies the troops we squandered first again appear from several quarters and enclose the rear they first observe and to the rest betray our different speech our borrowed arms survey oppressed with odds we fall coribus first at pallas altar by peneleus pierced then rephaeus followed in the unequal fight just of his word observant of the right heaven thought not so demas their fate attends with hippanis mistaken by their friends nor pantheus thee thy mitre nor the bands of awful phoebus save from impious hands ye trojan flames your testimony bear what i performed and what i suffered there no sword avoiding in the fatal strife exposed to death and prodigal of life witness ye heavens i live not by my fault i strove to have deserved the death i sought but when i could not fight and would have died borne off to distance by the growing tide old ephitus and i were hurried thence with peleus wounded and without defence new clamours from the invested palace ring we run to die or disengage the king so hot the assault so high the tumult rose whiles ours defend and while the greeks oppose as all the dardan and argolic race had been contracted in that narrow space or as all ilium else were void of fear and tumult war and slaughter only there their targets in a tortoise cast the foes secure advancing to the turrets rose some mount the scaling ladders some more bold swerve upwards and by posts and pillars hold their left hand grips their bucklers in the ascent while with their right they seize the battlement 
From their demolished towers the Trojans throw huge heaps of stones that falling crush the foe, and heavy beams and rafters from the sides, such arms their last necessity provides, and gilded roofs come tumbling from on high the marks of state and ancient royalty. The guards below, fixed in the pass, attend the charge undaunted and the gate defend. Renewed in courage with recovered breath, a second time we ran to tempt our death, to clear the palace from the foe, succeed the weary living, and revenge the dead. A postern door, yet unobserved and free, joined by the length of a blind gallery, to the king's closet led, a way well known to Hector's wife while Priam held the throne, through which she brought Astyanax unseen to cheer his grandsire and his grandsire's queen. Through this we pass and mount the tower, from whence with unavailing arms the Trojans make defence. From this the trembling king had oft descried the Cretian camp and saw their navy ride. Beams from its lofty height with swords we hew, then wrenching with our hands the assault renew. And where the rafters on the columns meet, we push them headlong with our arms and feet. The lightning flies not swifter than the fall, nor thunder louder than the ruined wall. Down goes the top at once, the Greeks beneath are piecemeal torn, are pounded into death. Yet more succeed, and more to death are sent. We cease not from above, nor they below relent. Before the gate stood Pyrrhus, threatening loud, with glittering arms conspicuous in the crowd. So shines, renewed in youth, the crested snake, who slept the winter in a thorny brake and casting off his slough when spring returns, now looks aloft and with new glory burns. Restored with poisonous herbs, his ardent sides reflect the sun, and raised on spires he rides. High o'er the grass hissing he rolls along, and brandishes by fits his forky tongue. Proud Periphas and fierce Automedon, his father's charioteer, together run to force the gate, the Syrian infantry rush on in crowds, and the barred passage free. Entering the court with shouts the skies they rend, and flaming firebrands to the roofs ascend. Himself among the foremost deals his blows, and with his axe repeated strokes bestows on the strong doors. Then all their shoulders ply, till from the posts the brazen hinges fly. He hews apace, the double bars at length yield to his axe and unresisted strength. A mighty breach is made, the rooms concealed appear, and all the palaces revealed. The halls of audience and of public state, and where the lonely queen in secret sat. Armed soldiers now by trembling maids are seen, with not a door and scarce a space between. The house is filled with loud laments and cries, and shrieks of women rend the vaulted skies. The fearful matrons run from place to place, and kiss the thresholds and the posts embrace the fatal work inhuman pyrrhus plies and all his father sparkles in his eyes nor bars nor fighting guards his force sustain the bards are broken and the guards are slain in rush the greeks and all the apartments fill those few defendants whom they find they kill not with so fierce a rage the foaming flood roars when he finds his rapid course withstood bears down the dams with unresisted sway and sweeps the cattle and the cots away these eyes beheld him when he marched between the brother kings i saw the unhappy queen the hundred wives and where old priam stood to stain his hallowed altar with his brood the fifty nuptial beds such hopes had he so large a promise of a progeny the posts of plated gold and hung with spoils fell the reward of the proud victor's toils where e'er the raging fire had left a space, the Grecians enter and possess the place. Perhaps you may of Priam's fate inquire. He, when he saw his regal town on fire, his ruined palace and his entering foes, on every side inevitable woes, in arms disused, invests his limbs decayed, like them with age, a late and useless aid. His feeble shoulders scarce the weight sustain, Loaded, not armed, he creeps along with pain, despairing of success, ambitious to be slain. Uncovered but by heaven there stood in view an altar, near the hearth a laurel grew, daughtered with age, whose boughs encompass round the household gods, and shade the holy ground. 
Here Hecuba, with all her helpless train of dames, for shelter sought, but sought in vain. Driven like a flock of doves along the sky, their images they hug, and to their altars fly. The queen, when she beheld her trembling lord, and hanging by his side a heavy sword, What rage, she cried, has seized my husband's mind? What arms are these, and to what use designed? These times want other aids. Were Hector here, even Hector now in vain, like Priam would appear. With us one common shelter thou shalt find, or in one common fate with us be joined. She said, and with a last salute embraced the poor old man, and by the laurel placed. Behold Politis, one of Priam's sons, pursued by Pyrrhus, there for safety runs, through swords and foes, amazed and hurt he flies, through empty courts and open galleries. Him Pyrrhus, urging with his lance, pursues, and often reaches, and his thrusts renews. The youth, transfixed with lamentable cries, expires before his wretched parent's eyes, whom gasping at his feet when Priam saw the fear of death gave place to nature's law, and shaking more with anger than with age, the gods, said he, requite thy brutal rage. As sure they will, barbarian, sure they must, if there be gods in heaven and gods be just, who takest in wrongs an insolent delight, with a son's death to infect a father's sight, not he whom thou and lying fame conspire to call thee his, not he thy vaunted sire thus used my wretched age. The gods he feared, the laws of nature and of nations heard. He cheered my sorrows, and for sums of gold the bloodless carcass of my Hector sold, pitied the woes a parent underwent, and sent me back in safety from his tent. This said, his feeble hand a javelin threw, which fluttering seemed to loiter as it flew, just and but barely to the mark it held, and faintly tinkled on the brazen shield. Then Pyrrhus said, Go thou from me to fate, and to my father my foul deeds relate. Now die. With that he dragged the trembling sire, slittering through clottered blood and holy mire, the mingled paste his murdered son had made old from beneath the violated shade, and on the sacred pile the royal victim laid, his right hand held his bloody falchion bare, his left he twisted in his hoary hair. Then with a speeding thrust his heart he found, the lukewarm blood came rushing through the wound, and sanguine streams disdained the sacred ground. Thus Priam fell, and shared one common fate, with Troy and ashes and his ruined state, he who the sceptre of all Asia swayed, whom monarchs like domestic slaves obeyed, on the bleak shore now lies the abandoned king, a headless carcass and a nameless thing. Then, not before, I felt my cruddled blood congeal with fear, my hair with horror stood. My father's image filled my pious mind, lest equal years might equal fortune find. Again I thought on my forsaken wife, and trembled for my son's abandoned life. I looked about, but found myself alone. Deserted at my need, my friends were gone. Some spent with toil, some with despair oppressed, leaped headlong from the heights, the flames consumed the rest. Thus, wandering in my way, without a guide, the graceless Helen in the porch I spied of Vesta's temple. There she lurked alone, muffled she sat, and what she could unknown. But by the flames that cast their blaze around, that common bane of Greece and Troy I found, for Ilium burnt she dreads the Trojan sword, more dreads the vengeance of her injured lord, even by those gods who refuged her abhorred. Trembling with rage, the strumpet I regard, resolved to give her guilt the due reward. Shall she triumphant sail before the wind, and leave in flames unhappy Troy behind? Shall she her kingdom and her friends review, in state attended with a captive crew, while unrevenged the good old Priam falls, and Grecian fires consume the Trojan walls? For this the Phrygian fields and Xanthian flood were swelled with bodies and were drunk with blood? Tis true a soldier can small honour gain, and boast no conquest from a woman slain, Yet shall the fact not pass without applause of vengeance taken in so just a cause. The punished crime shall set my soul at ease, and murmuring manes of my friends appease. 
Thus while I rave, a gleam of pleasing light spread o'er the place, and shining heavenly bright, my mother stood revealed before my sight. Never so radiant did her eyes appear, not her own star confessed a light so clear. Great in her charms, as when on gods above she looks, and breathes herself into their love, she held my hand, the destined blow to break, then from her rosy lips began to speak. My son, from whence this madness, this neglect of my commands, and those whom I protect, why this unmanly rage? Recall to mind whom you forsake, what pledges leave behind. Look if your helpless father yet survive, or if Ascanius or Crusa live. Around your house the greedy Grecians err, and these had perished in the nightly war, but for my presence and protecting care. Not Helen's face nor Paris was in fault, but by the gods was this destruction brought. Now cast your eyes around while I dissolve the mists and films that mortal eyes involve. Purge from your sight the dross, and make you see the shape of each avenging deity. Enlightened thus, my just commands fulfill, nor fear obedience to your mother's will. Where yon disordered heap of ruin lies, stones rent from stones, where clouds of dust arise, amid that smother Neptune holds his place. Below the wall's foundation drives his mace, and heaves the building from the solid base. Look where in arms imperial Juno stands, full in the sky and gate, with loud commands, urging on shore the tardy Grecian bands. See, palace of her snaky buckler proud, bestrides the tower refulgent through the cloud. See, Jove new courage to the foe supplies, and arms against the town the partial deities. Haste hence, my son, this fruitless labor end. Haste where your trembling spouse and sire attend. Haste, and a mother's care your passage shall befriend. She said, and swiftly vanished from my sight, Obscure in clouds and gloomy shades of night. I looked, I listened, dreadful sounds I hear, And the dire forms of hostile gods appear. Troy sunk in flames I saw nor could prevent, and Ilium from its old foundations rent, rent like a mountain ash which dared the winds, and stood the sturdy strokes of labouring hinds. About the roots the cruel axe resounds, the stumps are pierced with oft-repeated wounds. The war is felt on high, the nodding crown now threats a fall, and throws the leafy honours down. To their united force it yields, though late, and mourns with mortal groans the approaching fate. The roots no more their upper load sustain, but down she falls, and spreads a ruin through the plain. Descending thence, I scape through foes and fire, before the goddess foes and flames retire. Arrived at home, he, for whose only sake, or most for his, such toils I undertake. The good Anchises, whom by timely flight I purpose to secure on Ida's height, refused the journey resolute to die and add his funerals to the fate of troy rather than exile and old age sustain go you whose blood runs warm in every vein had heaven decreed that i should life enjoy heaven had decreed to save unhappy troy tis sure enough if not too much for one twice to have seen our ilium overthrown make haste to save the poor remaining crew and give this useless corpse a long adieu these weak old hands suffice to stop my breath. At least the pitying foes will aid my death, To take my spoils and leave my body bare. As for my sepulchre, let heaven take care. Tis long since I, for my celestial wife, Loathed by the gods, have dragged a lingering life, Since every hour and moment I expire, Blasted from heaven by Jove's avenging fire. This oft repeated, he stood fixed to die. Myself, my wife, my son, my family, entreat, pray, beg, and raise a doleful cry. What will he still persist on death resolve, and in his ruin all his house involve? He still persists his reasons to maintain. Our prayers, our tears, our loud laments are vain. Urged by despair, again I go to try the fate of arms, resolved in fight to die. 
what hope remains but what my death must give can i without so dear a father live you term it prudence what i baseness call could such a word from such a parent fall if fortune please and so the gods ordain that nothing should have ruined troy remain and you conspire with fortune to be slain the way to death is wide the approach is near for soon relentless pyrrhus will appear reeking with priam's blood the wretch who slew the son inhuman in the father's view and then the sire himself to the dire altar drew o goddess mother give me back to fate your gift was undesired and came too late did you for this unhappy me convey through foes and fires to see my house a prey shall i my father wife and son behold weltering in blood each other's arms enfold haste gird my sword though spent and overcome tis the last summons to receive our doom i hear thee fate and i obey thy call not unrevenged the foe shall see my fall restore me to the yet unfinished fight my death is wanting to conclude the night armed once again my glittering sword i wield while the other hand sustains my weighty shield and forth i rush to seek the abandoned field i went but sad creusa stopped my way and cross the threshold in my passage lay embraced my knees and when i would have gone showed me my feeble sire and tender son if death be your design at least said she take us along to share your destiny if any farther hopes in arms remain this place these pledges of your love maintain to whom do you expose your father's life your son's and mine your now forgotten wife while thus she fills the house with clamorous cries our hearing is diverted by our eyes for while i held my son in the short space betwixt our kisses and our last embrace strange to relate from young eulus head a lambent flame arose which gently spread around his brows and on his temples fed amazed with running water we prepare to quench the sacred fire and slake his hair but old anchises versed in omens reared his hands to heaven and this request preferred if any vows almighty jove can bend thy will if piety can prayers commend confirm the glad presage which thou art pleased to send scarce had he said when on our left we hear a peal of rattling thunder roll in air there shot a streaming lamp along the sky which on the winged lightning seemed to fly from o'er the roof the blaze began to move and trailing vanished in the Edean grove it swept a path in heaven and shone a guide then in a steaming stench of sulphur died the good old man with suppliant hands implored the gods protection and their star adored now now said he my son no more delay i yield i follow where heaven shows the way keep o oh my country gods our dwelling place and guard this relic of the trojan race this tender child these omens are your own and you can yet restore the ruined town at least accomplish what your signs foreshow i stand resigned and am prepared to go he said the crackling flames appear on high and driving sparkles dance along the sky with vulcan's rage the rising winds conspire and near our palace roll the flood of fire haste my dear father tis no time to wait and load my shoulders with a willing freight whate'er befalls your life shall be my care one death or one deliverance we will share my hand shall lead our little son and you my faithful consort shall our steps pursue next you my servants heed my strict commands without the walls a ruined temple stands to ceres hallowed once a cypress nigh shoots up her venerable head on high by long religion kept there bend your feet and in divided parties let us meet our country gods the relics and the bands hold you my father in your guiltless hands in me tis impious holy things to bear red as i am with slaughter new from war till in some living stream i cleanse the guilt of dire debate and blood and battle spilt 
Thus, ordering all that prudence could provide, I clothe my shoulders with a lion's hide and yellow spoils, then on my bending back the welcome load of my dear father take, while on my better hand Ascanius hung, and with unequal paces tripped along. Crusa kept behind, by choice we stray through every dark and every devious way. I, who so bold and dauntless, just before the Grecian darts and shock of lances bore, at every shadow now am seized with fear, not for myself, but for the charge I bear. Till, near the ruined gate arrived at last, secure and deeming all the danger past, a frightful noise of trampling feet we hear. My father, looking through the shades with fear, cried out, Haste, haste, my son, the foes are nigh, their swords and shining armor I descry. Some hostile god, for some unknown offense, had sure bereft my mind of better sense. For while through winding ways I took my flight, and sought the shelter of the gloomy night, alas, I lost Crusa, hard to tell, if by her fatal destiny she fell, or weary sate, or wandered with affright. But she was lost for ever to my sight. I knew not, or reflected, till I meet my friends at Ceres' now deserted seat. We met, not one was wanting, only she, deceived her friends, her son, and wretched me. What mad expressions did my tongue refuse? Whom did I not of gods or men accuse? This was the fatal blow that pained me more than all I felt from ruined Troy before. Stung with my loss and raving with despair, abandoning my now forgotten care, of counsel, comfort, and of hope bereft, my sire, my son, my country gods I left. In shining armor once again I sheathe my limbs, not feeling wounds nor fearing death, then headlong to the burning walls I run, and seek the danger I was forced to shun. I tread my former tracks, through night explore each passage, every street I crossed before. All things were full of horror and affright, and dreadful even the silence of the night. Then to my father's house I make repair, with some small glimpse of hope to find her there. Instead of her the cruel Greeks I meet, the house was filled with foes, with flames beset, driven on the wings of winds, whole sheets of fire through air transported to the roofs aspire. From thence to Priam's palace I resort, and search the citadel and desert court. Then, unobserved, I pass by Juno's church, a guard of Grecians had possessed the porch. There Phoenix and Ulysses watch prey, and thither all the wealth of Troy convey. The spoils which they from ransacked houses brought, and golden bowls from burning altars caught, the tables of the gods, the purple vests, the people's treasure and the pomp of priests, a rank of wretched youths with pinioned hands, and captive matrons in long order stands. Then with ungoverned madness I proclaim through all the silent street Crusa's name. Crusa still I call, at length she hears, and sudden through the shades of night appears, appears no more crusa nor my wife but a pale spectre larger than the life aghast astonished and struck dumb with fear i stood like bristles rose my stiffened hair then thus the ghost began to soothe my grief nor tears nor cries can give the dead relief desist my much-loved lord to indulge your pain you bear no more than what the gods ordain my fates permit me not from hence to fly, nor he the great controller of the sky. Long wandering ways for you the powers decree, on land hard labors and a length of sea. Then after many painful years are past, on Latium's happy shore you shall be cast, where gentle Tiber from his bed beholds the flowery meadows and the feeding folds. There end your toils, and there your fates provide a quiet kingdom and a royal bride. There fortune shall the Trojan line restore, and you for lost Crusa weep no more. Fear not that I shall watch with servile shame the imperious looks of some proud Grecian dame, or stooping to the victor's lust disgrace my goddess mother or my royal race. And now farewell. The parent of the gods restrains my fleeting soul in her abodes. I trust our common issue to your care. She said, and gliding past unseen in air. I strove to speak, but horror tied my tongue, 
and thrice about her neck my arms i flung and thrice deceived on vain embraces hung light as an empty dream at break of day or as a blast of wind she rushed away thus having passed the night in fruitless pain i to my longing friends return again amazed the augmented number to behold of men and matrons mixed of young and old a wretched exiled crew together brought with arms appointed and with treasure fraught resolved and willing under my command to run all hazards both of sea and land the morn began from ida to display her rosy cheeks and phosphor led the day before the gates the grecians took their post and all pretence of late relief was lost i yield to fate unwillingly retire and loaded up the hill convey my sire end of section four section five of the aeneid of virgil this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the aeneid of virgil translated by john dryden book three part one when heaven had overturned the trojan state and priam's throne by too severe a fate when ruined troy became the grecian's prey and ilium's lofty towers and ashes lay warned by celestial omens we retreat to seek in foreign lands a happier seat near old antandros and at ida's foot the timber of the sacred groves we cut and build our fleet uncertain yet to find what place the gods for our repose assigned friends daily flock and scarce the kindly spring began to clothe the ground and birds to sing when old anchises summoned all to see the crew my father and the fates obey with sighs and tears i leave my native shore and empty fields where ilium stood before my sire my son our less and greater gods all sail at once and cleave the briny floods against our coast appears a spacious land which once the fierce lycurgus did command thracia the name the people bold in war vast are their fields and tillage is their care a hospitable realm while fate was kind with troy in friendship and religion joined i land with luckless omens then adore their gods and draw a line along the shore i lay the deep foundations of a wall and Enos named from me the city call to dionian venus vows are paid and all the powers that rising labors aid a bull on jove's imperial altar laid not far a rising hillock stood in view sharp myrtles on the sides and cornels grew there while i went to crop the sylvan scenes and shade our altar with their leafy greens i pulled a plant with horror i relate a prodigy so strange and full of fate the rooted fibres rose and from the wound black bloody drops distilled upon the ground mute and amazed my hair with terror stood fear shrunk my sinews and congealed my blood manned once again another plant i try that other gushed with the same sanguine dye then fearing guilt for some offence unknown with prayers and vows the dryads i atone with all the sisters of the woods and most the god of arms who rules the thracian coast that they or he these omens would avert release our fears and better signs impart cleared as i thought and fully fixed at length to learn the cause i tugged with all my strength i bent my knees against the ground once more the violated myrtle ran with gore scarce dare i tell the sequel from the womb of wounded earth and caverns of the tomb a groan as of a troubled ghost renewed my fright and then these dreadful words ensued why dost thou thus my buried body rend o oh, spare the corpse of thy unhappy friend spare to pollute thy pious hands with blood 
the tears distill not from the wounded wood but every drop this living tree contains is kindred blood and ran in trojan veins o oh, fly from this unhospitable shore warned by my fate for i am polydore here loads of lances in my blood imbrued again shoot upward by my blood renewed my faltering tongue and shivering limbs declare my horror and in bristles rose my hair when troy with grecian arms was closely pent old priam fearful of the war's event this hapless polydore to thracia sent loaded with gold he sent his darling far from noise and tumults and destructive war committed to the faithless tyrant's care who when he saw the power of troy decline forsook the weaker with the strong to join broke every bond of nature and of truth and murdered for his wealth the royal youth o oh, sacred hunger of pernicious gold what bands of faith can impious lucre hold now when my soul had shaken off her fears i call my father and the trojan peers relate the prodigies of heaven require what he commands and their advice desire all vote to leave that execrable shore polluted with the blood of polydore but ere we sail his funeral rites prepare then to his ghost a tomb and altars rear in mournful pomp the matrons walk the round with baleful cypress and blue fillets crowned with eyes dejected and with hair unbound then bowls of tepid milk and blood we pour and thrice invoke the soul of polydore now when the raging storms no longer reign but southern gales invite us to the main we launch our vessels with a prosperous wind and leave the cities and the shores behind an island in the aegean main appears neptune and watery dorus claim it theirs it floated once till phoebus fixed the sides to rooted earth and now it braves the tides here borne by friendly winds we come ashore with needful ease our weary limbs restore and the sun's temple and his town adore aeneus the priest and king with laurel crowned his hoary locks with purple fillets bound who saw my sire the delian shore ascend came forth with eager haste to meet his friend invites him to his palace and in sign of ancient love their plighted hands they join then to the temple of the god i went and thus before the shrine my vows present give o thimbraeus give a resting place to the sad relics of the trojan race a seat secure a region of their own a lasting empire and a happier town where shall we fix where shall our labours end whom shall we follow and what fate attend let not my prayers a doubtful answer find but in clear auguries unveil thy mind scarce had i said he shook the holy ground the laurels and the lofty hills around and from the tripos rushed a bellowing sound prostrate we fell confessed the present god who gave this answer from his dark abode undaunted youths go seek that mother earth from which your ancestors derive their birth the soil that sent you forth her ancient race in her old bosom shall again embrace through the wide world the aeneian house shall reign and children's children shall the crown sustain thus phoebus did our future fates disclose a mighty tumult mixed with joy arose all are concerned to know what place the god assigned and where determined our abode my father long revolving in his mind the race and lineage of the trojan kind thus answered their demands ye princes hear your pleasing fortune and dispel your fear the fruitful isle of crete well known to fame sacred of old to jove's imperial name in the mid-ocean lies with large command and on its plains a hundred cities stand another ida rises there and we from thence derive our trojan ancestry from thence as tis divulged by certain fame to the rhetian shores old teucrus came there fixed and there the seat of empire chose ere ilium and the trojan towers arose 
In humble vales they built their soft abodes, Till Sibylle, the mother of the gods, With tinkling cymbals charmed the Idaean woods. She secret rites and ceremonies taught, And to the yoke the savage lions brought. Let us the land which heaven appoints explore, Appease the winds, and seek the Gnossian shore. If Jove assists the passage of our fleet, The third propitious dawn discovers Crete. Thus having said, the sacrifices laid On smoking altars to the gods he paid. A bull to Neptune an oblation due, Another bull to bright Apollo slew. A milk-white hue the western winds to please, and one coal-black to calm the stormy seas. Ere this, a flying rumour had been spread, that fierce Idomeneus from Crete was fled, expelled and exiled, that the coast was free from foreign or domestic enemy. We leave the Delian ports and put to sea, by Noxos famed for vintage make our way, then green Donisa pass, and sail in sight of Paros isle, with marble quarries white. We pass the scattered isles of Cyclades, that scarce distinguished seem to stud the seas. The shouts of sailors double near the shores, they stretch their canvas, and they ply their oars. All hands aloft, for Crete, for Crete, they cry, and swiftly through the foamy billows fly. Full on the promised land at length we bore, with joy descending on the Cretan shore. With eager haste a rising town I frame, which from the Trojan Pergamus I name. The name itself was grateful. I exhort to found their houses and erect a fort. Our ships are hauled upon the yellow strand. The youth begin to till the labored land. And I myself new marriages promote, give laws and dwellings I divide by lot. When rising vapors choke the wholesome air, and blasts of noisome winds corrupt the year, the trees devouring caterpillars burn, parched was the grass, and blighted was the corn. Nor scape the beasts, for Sirius from on high, with pestilential heat infects the sky. My men, some fall, the rest in fevers fry. Again my father bids me seek the shore of sacred Delos, and the god implore, to learn what end of woes we might expect, and to what clime our weary course direct. T'was night, when every creature, void of cares, the common gift of balmy slumber shares. The statues of my gods, for such they seemed, those gods whom I from flaming Troy redeemed, before me stood, majestically bright, full in the beams of Phoebe's entering light. Then thus they spoke, and eased my troubled mind. What from the Delian god thou goest to find, he tells thee here, and sends us to relate. Those powers are we, companions of thy fate, who from the burning town by thee were brought, thy fortune followed, and thy safety wrought. Through seas and lands, as we thy steps attend, so shall our care thy glorious race befriend. An ample realm for thee thy fates ordain, a town that o'er the conquered world shall reign. Thou mighty walls for mighty nations build, nor let thy weary mind to labors yield. But change thy seat, for not the Delian god, nor we have given thee Crete for our abode. A land there is, Hesperia called of old. The soil is fruitful, and the natives bold. The Enotrians held it once, by later fame, now called Italia, from the leader's name. Iasius there and Dardanus were born. From thence we came, and thither must return. Rise, and thy sire with these glad tidings greet. Search Italy. For Jove denies thee, Crete. Astonished at their voices and their sight, Nor were they dreams, but visions of the night, I saw, I knew their faces, and descried in perfect view Their hair with fillets tied. I started from my couch. A clammy sweat on all my limbs and shivering body sat. To heaven I lifted my hands with pious haste, And sacred incense in the flames I cast. Thus to the gods their perfect honours done, 
more cheerful to my good old sire i run and tell the pleasing news in little space he found his error of the double race not as before he deemed derived from crete no more deluded by the doubtful seat then said o son turmoiled in trojan fate such things as these cassandra did relate this day revives within my mind what she foretold of troy renewed in italy and latian lands but who could then have thought that phrygian gods to latium should be brought or who believed what mad cassandra taught now let us go where phoebus leads the way he said and we with glad consent obey forsake the seat and leaving few behind we spread our sails before the willing wind now from the sight of land our galleys move with only seas around and skies above when o'er our heads descends a burst of rain and night with sable clouds involves the main the ruffling winds the foamy billows raise the scattered fleet is forced to several ways the face of heaven is ravished from our eyes and in redoubled peals the roaring thunder flies cast from our course we wander in the dark no stars to guide no point of land to mark even palinurus no distinction found betwixt the night and day such darkness reigned around three starless nights the doubtful navy strays without distinction and three sunless days the fourth renews the light and from our shrouds we view a rising land like distant clouds the mountain tops confirm the pleasing sight and curling smoke ascending from their height the canvas falls their oars the sailors ply from the rude strokes the whirling waters fly at length i land upon the strophades safe from the danger of the stormy seas those isles are compassed by the ionian main the dire abode where the foul harpies reign forced by the winged warriors to repair to their old homes and leave their costly fare monsters more fierce offended heaven ne'er sent from hell's abyss for human punishment with virgin faces but with wombs obscene foul paunches and with order still unclean with claws for hands and looks for ever lean we landed at the port and soon beheld fat herds of oxen graze the flowery field and wanton goats without a keeper strayed with weapons we the welcome prey invade then call the gods for partners of our feast and jove himself the chief invited guest we spread the tables on the greensward ground we feed with hunger and the bowls go round when from the mountain tops with hideous cry and clattering wings the hungry harpies fly they snatch the meat defiling all they find and parting leave a loathsome stench behind close by a hollow rock again we sit new dress the dinner and the beds refit secure from sight beneath a pleasing shade where tufted trees a native arbor made again the holy fires on altars burn and once again the ravenous birds return or from the dark recesses where they lie or from another quarter of the sky with filthy claws their odious meal repeat and mix their loathsome orders with their meat i bid my friends for vengeance then prepare and with the hellish nation wage the war they as commanded for the fight provide and in the grass their glittering weapons hide then when along the crooked shore we hear their clattering wings and saw the foes appear misenus sounds a charge we take the alarm and our strong hands with swords and bucklers arm in this new kind of combat all employ their utmost force the monsters to destroy in vain the fated skin is proof to wounds and from their plumes the shining sword rebounds at length rebuffed they leave their mangled prey and their stretched pinions to the skies display yet one remained the messenger of fate high on a craggy cliff selino sat and thus her dismal errand did relate what not contented with our oxen slain dare you with heaven an impious war maintain and drive the harpies from their native reign heed therefore what i say 
and keep in mind what jove decrees what phoebus has designed and i the furies queen from both relate you seek the italian shores foredoomed by fate the italian shores are granted you to find and a safe passage to the port assigned but know that ere your promised walls you build my curses shall severely be fulfilled fierce famine is your lot for this misdeed reduced to grind the plates on which you feed she said and to the neighboring forest flew our courage fails us and our fears renew hopeless to win by war to prayers we fall and on the offended harpies humbly call and whether gods or birds obscene they were our vows for pardon and for peace prefer but old anchises offering sacrifice and lifting up to heaven his hands and eyes adored the greater gods avert said he these omens render vain this prophecy and from the impending curse a pious people free thus having said he bids us put to sea we loose from shore our halsers and obey and soon with swelling sails pursue the watery way amidst our course zacynthian woods appear and next by rocky neritos we steer we fly from ithaca's detested shore and curse the land which dire ulysses bore at length leucate's cloudy top appears and the sun's temple which the sailor fears resolved to breathe a while from labor past our crooked anchors from the prow we cast and joyful to the little city haste here safe beyond our hopes our vows we pay to jove the guide and patron of our way the customs of our country we pursue and trojan games on actian shores renew our youth their naked limbs besmear with oil and exercise the wrestler's noble toil pleased to have sailed so long before the wind and left so many grecian towns behind the sun had now fulfilled his annual course and boreas on the seas displayed his force i fixed upon the temple's lofty door the brazen shield which a vanquished abbas bore the verse beneath my name and action speaks these arms aeneas took from conquering greeks then i command to weigh the seamen ply their sweeping oars the smoking billows fly the sight of high phaeacia soon we lost and skimmed along epirus rocky coast then to chionia's port our course we bend and landed to bothrotus heights ascend here wondrous things were loudly blazed fame how helenus revived the trojan name and reigned in greece that priam's captive son succeeded pyrrhus in his bed and throne and fair andromache restored by fate once more was happy in a trojan mate i leave my galleys riding in the port and long to see the new dardanian court by chance the mournful queen before the gate then solemnized her former husband's fate green altars raised of turf with gifts she crowned and sacred priests in order stand around and thrice the name of hapless hector sound the grove itself resembles ida's wood and simois seemed the well dissembled flood but when at nearer distance she beheld my shining armor and my trojan shield astonished at the sight the vital heat forsakes her limbs her veins no longer beat she faints she falls and scarce recovering strength thus with a faltering tongue she speaks at length are you alive o goddess born she said or if a ghost then where is hector's shade at this she cast a loud and frightful cry with broken words i made this brief reply all of me that remains appears in sight i live if living be to loathe the light no phantom but i drag a wretched life my fate resembling that of hector's wife what have you suffered since you lost your lord by what strange blessing are you now restored still are you hector's 
or is Hector fled, and his remembrance lost in Pyrrhus' bed? With eyes dejected in a lowly tone, after a modest pause she thus begun. O only happy maid of Priam's race, whom death delivered from the foe's embrace, commanded on Achilles' tomb to die, not forced like us to hard captivity, or in a haughty master's arms to lie, in Grecian ships unhappy we were born, endured the victor's lust, sustained the scorn. Thus I submitted to the lawless pride of Pyrrhus, more a handmaid than a bride. Cloyed with possession, he forsook my bed, and Helen's lovely daughter sought to wed. Then me to Trojan Helenus resigned, and his two slaves in equal marriage joined, till young Orestes, pierced with a deep despair, and longing to redeem the promised fair, before Apollo's altar slew the ravisher. By Pyrrhus' death the kingdom we regained, at least one half with Helenus remained. Our part from Caon he Caonia calls, and names from Pergamus his rising walls. But you what fates have landed on our coast? What gods have sent you, or what storms have tossed? Does young Ascanius life and health enjoy, save from the ruins of unhappy Troy? O oh, tell me how his mother's loss he bears, what hopes are promised from his blooming years, how much of Hector in his face appears. She spoke, and mixed her speech with mournful cries, and fruitless tears came trickling from her eyes. At length, her lord descends upon the plain in pomp attended with a numerous train receives his friends and the city leads and tears of joy amidst his welcome sheds proceeding on another troy i see or in less compass troy's epitome a rivulet by the name of xanthus ran and i embrace the scyan gate again my friends and porticos were entertained and feasts and pleasures through the city reigned the tables filled the spacious hall around and golden bowls with sparkling wine were crowned two days we passed in mirth till friendly gales blown from the south supplied our swelling sails then to the royal seer i thus began o thou who knowest beyond the reach of man the laws of heaven and what the stars decree whom phoebus taught unerring prophecy from his own tripod and his holy tree skilled in the winged inhabitants of air what auspices their notes and flights declare o oh, say for all religious rites portend a happy voyage and a prosperous end and every power and omen of the sky direct my course for destined italy but only dire selino from the gods a dismal famine fatally forebodes o oh, say what dangers i am first to shun what toils vanquish and what course to run end of section five section six of the aeneid of virgil this librivox recording is in the public domain book three part two the prophet first with sacrifice adores the greater gods their pardon then implores unbinds the fillet from his holy head to phoebus next my trembling steps he led full of religious doubts and awful dread then with his god possessed before the shrine these words proceeded from his mouth divine o goddess born for heaven's appointed will with greater auspices of good than ill for shows thy voyage and thy course directs thy fates conspire and jove himself protects of many things some few i shall explain teach thee to shun the dangers of the main and how at length the promised shore to gain the rest the fates from helenus conceal and juno's angry power forbids to tell first then that happy shore that seems so nigh will far from your deluded wishes fly long tracts of seas divide your hopes from italy for you must cruise along sicilian shores and stem the currents with your struggling oars then round the italian coast your navies steer 
and after this to Circe's island veer, and last, before your new foundations rise, must pass the Stygian lake and view the nether skies. Now mark the signs of future ease and rest, and bear them safely treasured in thy breast. When, in the shady shelter of a wood, and near the margin of a gentle flood, thou shalt behold a sow upon the ground, with thirty sucking young encompassed round, the dam and offspring white as falling snow, these on thy city shall their name bestow, and there shall end thy labours and thy woe. Nor let the threatened famine fright thy mind, for Phoebus will assist, and fate the way will find. Let not thy course to that ill coast be bent, which fronts from far the Epirian continent. Those parts are all by Grecian foes possessed, the savage Locrians here the shores infest. There fierce Idomeneus his city builds, and guards with arms the Salentinian fields, and on the mountain's brow Petilia stands, which Philoctetes with his troops commands. Even when thy fleet is landed on the shore, and priests with holy vows the gods adore, then with a purple veil involve your eyes, lest hostile faces blast the sacrifice. These rites and customs to the rest commend, that to your pious race they may descend. When parted hence, the wind that ready waits for Sicily shall bear you to the straits, where proud Pelorus opes a wider way, tack to the larboard and stand off to sea. Veer starboard, sea, and land, the Italian shore and fair Sicilia's coast were one before an earthquake caused the flaw. The roaring tides, the passage broke that land from land divides, and where the lands retired, the rushing ocean rides. Distinguished by the straits, on either hand, now rising cities in long order stand and fruitful fields. So much can time invade the mouldering work that beauteous nature made. Far on the right, her dog's foul Scylla hides, Charybdis roaring on the left presides, and in her greedy whirlpool sucks the tides, then spouts them from below. With fury driven, the waves mount up and wash the face of heaven. But Scylla from her din with open jaws, the sinking vessel in her eddy draws, then dashes on the rocks. A human face and virgin bosom hides her tail's disgrace. Her parts obscene below the waves descend, with dogs enclosed and in a dolphin end. Tis safer then to bear aloof to sea, and coast Pachinus, though with more delay, than once to view misshapen Scylla near, and the loud yell of watery wolves to hear. Besides, if faith to Helenus be due, and if prophetic Phoebus tell me true, do not this precept of your friend forget, which therefore more than once I must repeat. Above the rest great Juno's name adore. Pay vows to Juno, Juno's aid implore. Let gifts be to the mighty queen designed, and mollify with prayers her haughty mind. Thus at the length your passage shall be free, and you shall safe descend on Italy. Arrived at Cume, when you view the flood of black Avernus and the sounding wood, the mad prophetic sibyl you shall find, dark in a cave and on a rock reclined. She sings the fates, and in her frantic fits the notes and names inscribed to leafs commits. What she commits to leafs in order laid before the cavern's entrance are displayed. Unmoved they lie, but if a blast of wind without or vapors issue from behind, the leafs are borne aloft in liquid air, and she resumes no more her museful care, nor gathers from the rocks her scattered verse, nor sets in order what the winds disperse. Thus many not succeeding most upbraid the madness of the visionary maid, 
and with loud curses leave the mystic shade think it not loss of time a while to stay though thy companions chide thy long delay though summoned to the seas though pleasing gales invite thy course and stretch thy swelling sails but beg the sacred priestess to relate with willing words and not to write thy fate the fierce italian people she will show and all thy wars and all thy future woe and what thou mayst avoid and what must undergo she shall direct thy course instruct thy mind and teach thee how the happy shores to find this is what heaven allows me to relate now part in peace pursue thy better fate and raise by strength of arms the trojan state this when the priest with friendly voice declared he gave me license and rich gifts prepared bounteous of treasure he supplied my want with heavy gold and polished elephant then Doronean cauldrons put on board, and every ship with sums of silver stored. A trusty coat of mail to me he sent, thrice chained with gold for use and ornament. The helm of Pyrrhus added to the rest, that flourished with a plume and waving crest. Nor was my sire forgotten, nor my friends, and large recruits he to my navy sends men horses captains arms and warlike stores supplies new pilots and new sweeping oars meantime my sire commands to hoist our sails lest we should lose the first auspicious gales the prophet blessed the parting crew and last with words like these his ancient friend embraced old happy man the care of gods above whom heavenly venus honoured with her love and twice preserved thy life when troy was lost behold from far the wished ausonian coast their land but take a larger compass round for that before is all forbidden ground the shore that phoebus has designed for you at farther distance lies concealed from view go happy hence and seek your new abodes blessed in a son and favoured by the gods for i with useless words prolong your stay when southern gales have summoned you away nor less the queen our parting thence deplored nor was less bounteous than her trojan lord a noble present to my son she brought a robe with flowers on golden tissue wrought a phrygian vest and loads with gifts beside of precious texture and of asian pride except she said these monuments of love which in my youth with happier hands i wove regard these trifles for the giver's sake tis the last present hector's wife can make thou callest my lost astyanax to mind in thee his features and his form i find his eyes so sparkled with a lively flame such were his motions such was all his frame and ah had heaven so pleased his years had been the same with tears i took my last adieu and said your fortune happy pair already made leaves you no farther wish my different state avoiding one incurs another fate to you a quiet seat the gods allow you have no shores to search no seas to plough nor fields of flying italy to chase deluding visions and a vain embrace you see another simois and enjoy the labour of your hands another troy with better auspice than her ancient towers and less obnoxious to the grecian powers if e'er the gods whom i with vows adore conduct my steps to tiber's happy shore if ever i ascend the latian throne and build a city i may call my own as both of us our birth from troy derive so let our kindred lines in concord live and both in acts of equal friendship strive our fortunes good or bad shall be the same the double troy shall differ but in name that what we now begin may never end but long to late posterity descend 
Near the Caronian rocks our course we bore, the shortest passage to the Italian shore. Now had the sun withdrawn his radiant light, and hills were hid in dusky shades of night. We land, and, on the bosom of the ground, a safe retreat and a bare lodging found. Close by the shore we lay, the sailors keep their watches, and the rest securely sleep. The night, proceeding on with silent pace, stood in her noon, and viewed with equal face her steepy rise and her declining race. Then wakeful Palinurus rose to spy the face of heaven and the nocturnal sky, and listened every breath of air to try. Observes the stars and notes their sliding course, the Pleiads, Hyads, and their watery force, and both the bears is careful to behold, and bright Orion armed with burnished gold. Then, when he saw no threatening tempest nigh, but a sure promise of a settled sky, he gave the sign to weigh, we break our sleep, forsake the pleasing shore, and plough the deep. And now the rising morn with rosy light adorns the skies and puts the stars to flight, when we from far like bluish mists descry the hills and then the plains of Italy. Achates first pronounced the joyful sound, then Italy the cheerful crew rebound. My sire Anchises crowned a cup with wine, and offering thus implored the powers divine. Ye gods presiding over lands and seas, and you who raging winds and waves appease, breathe on our swelling sails a prosperous wind, and smooth our passage to the port assigned. The gentle gales their flagging force renew, and now the happy harbor is in view. Minerva's temple then salutes our sight, placed as a landmark on the mountain's height. We furl our sails and turn the prows to shore, the curling waters round the galleys roar. The land lies open to the raging east, then bending like a bow with rocks compressed, shuts out the storms, the winds and waves complain, and vent their malice on the cliffs in vain. The port lies hid within, on either side two towering rocks, the narrow mouth divide. The temple which aloft we viewed before, to distance flies, and seems to shun the shore. Scarce landed, the first omens I beheld were four white steeds that cropped the flowery field. War, war is threatened from this foreign ground, my father cried, where warlike steeds are found. Yet since reclaimed to chariots they submit, and bend to stubborn yokes and champ the bit, peace may succeed to war. Our way we bend to palace, and the sacred hill ascend. There, prostrate to the fierce Virago pray, whose temple was the landmark of our way. Each with the Phrygian mantle veiled his head, and all commands of Helenus obeyed, and pious rites to Grecian Juno paid. These dues performed, we stretch our sails and stand to sea, forsaking that suspected land. From hence Tarantum's bay appears in view, for Hercules renowned if fame be true. Just opposite, Lacinian Juno stands, Caulonian towers and Scylacaean strands, for shipwrecks feared. Mount Etna thence we spy, known by the smoky flames which cloud the sky. Far off we hear the waves with surly sound invade the rocks, the rocks their groans rebound. The billows break upon the sounding strand, and roll the rising tide impure with sand. Then thus Anchises in experience old, Tis that Charybdis which the seer foretold, And those the promised rocks, bear off to sea. With haste the frightened mariners obey. First Palinurus to the larboard veered, Then all the fleet by his example steered. To heaven aloft on ridgy waves we ride, Then down to hell descend when they divide and thrice our galleys knocked the stony ground, and thrice the hollow rocks returned the sound, 
and thrice we saw the stars that stood with dews around the flagging winds forsook us with the sun and wearied on cyclopean shores we run the port capacious and secure from wind is to the foot of thundering etna joined by turns a pitchy cloud she rolls on high by turns hot embers from her entrails fly and flakes of mounting flames that lick the sky oft from her bowels massy rocks are thrown and shivered by the force come piecemeal down oft liquid lakes of burning sulphur flow fed from the fiery springs that boil below in Celadus, they say transfixed by jove with blasted limbs came tumbling from above and where he fell the avenging father drew this flaming hill and on his body threw as often as he turns his weary sides he shakes the solid isle and smoke the heavens hides in shady woods we pass the tedious night where bellowing sounds and groans our souls affright of which no cause is offered to the sight for not one star was kindled in the sky nor could the moon her borrowed light supply for misty clouds involved the firmament the stars were muffled and the moon was pent scarce had the rising sun the day revealed scarce had his heat the pearly dews dispelled when from the woods there bolts before our sight somewhat betwixt a mortal and a sprite so thin so ghastly meagre and so wan so bare of flesh he scarce resembled man this thing all tattered seemed from far to implore our pious aid and pointed to the shore we look behind then view his shaggy beard his clothes were tagged with thorns and filth his limbs besmeared the rest in mien in habit and in face appeared a greek and such indeed he was he cast on us from far a frightful view whom soon for trojans and for foes he knew stood still and paused then all at once began to stretch his limbs and trembled as he ran soon as approached upon his knees he falls and thus with tears and sighs for pity calls now by the powers above and what we share from nature's common gift this vital air o trojans take me hence i beg no more but bear me far from this unhappy shore tis true i am a greek and farther own among your foes besieged the imperial town for such demerits if my death be due no more for this abandoned life i sue this only favour let my tears obtain to throw me headlong in the rapid main since nothing more than death my crime demands i die content to die by human hands he said and on his knees my knees embraced i bade him boldly tell his fortune past his present state his lineage and his name the occasion of his fears and whence he came the good anchises raised him with his hand who thus encouraged answered our demand from ithaca my native soil i came to troy and Achaemenides, my name me my poor father with ulysses sent o oh, had i stayed with poverty content but fearful for themselves my countrymen left me forsaken in the cyclops din the cave though large was dark the dismal floor was paved with mangled limbs and putrid gore our monstrous host of more than human size erects his head and stares within the skies bellowing his voice and horrid is his hue ye gods remove this plague from mortal view the joints of slaughtered wretches are his food and for his wine he quaffs the streaming blood these eyes beheld when with his spacious hand he seized two captives of our grecian band stretched on his back he dashed against the stones their broken bodies and their crackling bones with spouting blood the purple pavement swims while the dire glutton grinds the trembling limbs not unrevenged ulysses bore their fate nor thoughtless of his own unhappy state for gorged with flesh and drunk with human wine while fast asleep the giant lay supine 
snoring aloud and belching from his maw his indigested foam and morsels raw we pray we cast the lots and then surround the monstrous body stretched along the ground each as he could approach him lends a hand to bore his eyeball with a flaming brand beneath his frowning forehead lay his eye for only one did the vast frame supply but that a globe so large his front it filled like the sun's disk or like a grecian shield the stroke succeeds and down the pupil bends this vengeance followed for our slaughtered friends but haste unhappy wretches haste to fly your cables cut and on your oars rely such and so vast as polypheme appears a hundred more this hated island bears like him in caves they shut their woolly sheep like him their herds on tops of mountains keep like him with mighty strides they stalk from steep to steep and now three moons their sharpened horns renew since thus in woods and wilds obscure from view i drag my loathsome days with mortal fright and in deserted caverns lodge by night oft from the rocks a dreadful prospect see of the huge cyclops like a walking tree from far i hear his thundering voice resound and trampling feet that shake the solid ground cornels and savage berries of the wood and roots and herbs have been my meagre food while all around my longing eyes i cast i saw your happy ships appear at last on those i fixed my hopes to these i run tis all i ask this cruel race to shun what other death you please yourselves bestow scarce had he said when on the mountain's brow we saw the giant shepherd stalk before his following flock and leading to the shore a monstrous bulk deformed deprived of sight his staff a trunk of pine to guide his steps aright his ponderous whistle from his neck descends his woolly care their pensive lord attends this only solace his hard fortune sends soon as he reached the shore and touched the waves from his bored eye the guttering blood he laves he gnashed his teeth and groaned through seas he strides and scarce the topmost billows touched his sides seized with a sudden fear we run to see the cables cut and silent haste away the well-deserving stranger entertain then buckling to the work our oars divide the main the giant hearkened to the dashing sound but when our vessels out of reach he found he strided onward and in vain essayed the onian deep and durst no farther wade with that he roared aloud the dreadful cry shakes earth and air and seas the billows fly before the bellowing noise to distant italy the neighing etna trembling all around the winding caverns echo to the sound his brother cyclops hear the yelling roar and rushing down the mountains crowd the shore we saw their stern distorted looks from far and one-eyed glance that vainly threatened war a dreadful council with their heads on high the misty clouds about their foreheads fly not yielding to the towering tree of jove or tallest cypress of diana's grove new pangs of mortal fear our minds assail we tug at every oar and hoist up every sail and take the advantage of the friendly gale for warned by helenus we strive to shun charybdis gulf nor dare to scylla run an equal fate on either side appears we tacking to the left are free from fears for from pelorus point the north arose and drove us back where swift pantagius flows his rocky mouth we pass and make our way by thapsus and megara's winding bay this passage achaemenides had shown tracing the course which he before had run right o'er against plemerium's watery strand there lies an isle once called the ortygian land alpheus as old fame reports has found from greece a secret passage underground by love to beauteous arethusa led and mingling here they roll in the same sacred bed as helenus enjoined we next adore diana's name protectress of the shore 
with prosperous gales we pass the quiet sounds of still elorus and his fruitful bounds then doubling cape pachinus we survey the rocky shore extended to the sea the town of camarine from far we see and fenny lake undrained by fate's decree in sight of the geloan fields we pass and the large walls where mighty gela was then agragas with lofty summits crowned long for the race of warlike steeds renowned we passed selinus and the palmy land and widely shun the lilibaean strand unsafe for secret rocks and moving sand at length on shore the weary fleet arrived which trepanum's unhappy port received here after endless labors often tossed by raging storms and driven on every coast my dear dear father spent with age i lost ease of my cares and solace of my pain saved through a thousand toils but saved in vain the prophet who my future woes revealed yet this the greatest and the worst concealed and dire selino whose foreboding skill denounced all else was silent of the ill this my last labor was some friendly god from thence conveyed us to your blessed abode thus to the listening queen the royal guest his wandering course and all his toils expressed and here concluding he retired to rest end of section six section seven of the aeneid of virgil this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the aeneid of virgil translated by john dryden book four part one but anxious cares already seized the queen she fed within her veins a flame unseen the hero's valor acts and birth inspire her soul with love and fan the secret fire his words his looks imprinted in her heart improve the passion and increase the smart now when the purple morn had chased away the dewy shadows and restored the day her sister first with early care she sought and thus in mournful accents eased her thought my dearest anna what new dreams affright my laboring soul what visions of the night disturb my quiet and distract my breast with strange ideas of our trojan guest his worth his actions and majestic air a man descended from the gods declare fear ever argues a degenerate kind his birth is well asserted by his mind then what he suffered when by fate betrayed what brave attempts for falling troy he made such were his looks so gracefully he spoke that were i not resolved against the yoke of hapless marriage never to be cursed with second love so fatal was my first to this one error i might yield again for since sichaeus was untimely slain this only man is able to subvert the fixed foundations of my stubborn heart and to confess my frailty to my shame somewhat i find within if not the same too like the sparkles of my former flame but first let yawning earth a passage rend and let me through the dark abyss descend first let avenging jove with flames from high drive down this body to the nether sky condemned with ghosts and endless night to lie before i break the plighted faith i gave no he who had my vows shall ever have for whom i loved on earth i worship in the grave she said the tears ran gushing from her eyes and stopped her speech her sister thus replies o oh, dearer than the vital air i breathe will you to grief your blooming years bequeath 
condemned to waste in woes your lonely life without the joys of mother or of wife think you these tears this pompous train of woe are known or valued by the ghosts below i grant that while your sorrows yet were green it well became a woman and a queen the vows of tyrian princes to neglect to scorn hyarbas and his love reject with all the libyan lords of mighty name but will you fight against a pleasing flame this little spot of land which heaven bestows on every side is hemmed with warlike foes gaetulian cities here are spread around and fierce numidians there your frontiers bound here lies a barren waste of thirsty land and there the Syrtes raise the moving sand barcaean troops besiege the narrow shore and from the sea pygmalion threatens more propitious heaven and gracious juno lead this wandering navy to your needful aid how will your empire spread your city rise from such a union and with such allies implore the favor of the powers above and leave the conduct of the rest to love continue still your hospitable way and still invent occasions of their stay till storms and winter winds shall cease to threat and planks and oars repair their shattered fleet these words which from a friend and sister came with ease resolved the scruples of her fame and added fury to the kindled flame inspired with hope the project they pursue on every altar sacrifice renew a chosen ewe of two years old they pay to ceres bacchus and the god of day preferring juno's power for juno ties the nuptial knot and makes the marriage joys the beauteous queen before her altar stands and holds the golden goblet in her hands a milk-white heifer she with flowers adorns and pours the ruddy wine betwixt her horns and while the priests with prayer the gods invoke she feeds their altars with sabaean smoke with hourly care the sacrifice renews and anxiously the panting entrails views what priestly rites alas what pious art what vows avail to cure a bleeding heart a gentle fire she feeds within her veins where the soft god secure in silence reigns sick with desire and seeking him she loves from street to street the raving dido roves so in the watchful shepherd from the blind wounds with a random shaft the careless hind distracted with her pain she flies the woods bounds o'er the lawn and seeks the silent floods with fruitless care for still the fatal dart sticks in her side and rankles in her heart and now she leads the trojan chief along the lofty walls amidst the busy throng displays her tyrian wealth and rising town which love without his labor makes his own this pomp she shows to tempt her wandering guest her faltering tongue forbids to speak the rest when day declines and feasts renew the night still on his face she feeds her famished sight she longs again to hear the prince relate his own adventures and the trojan fate he tells it o'er and o'er but still in vain for still she begs to hear it once again the hearer on the speaker's mouth depends and thus the tragic story never ends then when they part when phoebe's paler light withdraws and falling stars to sleep invite she last remains when every guest is gone sits on the bed he pressed and sighs alone absent her absent hero sees and hears or in her bosom young ascanius bears and seeks the father's image in the child if love by likeness might be so beguiled meantime the rising towers are at a stand no labors exercise the youthful band nor use of arts nor toils of arms they know the mole is left unfinished to the foe the mounds the works the walls neglected lie short of their promised height 
that seemed to threat the sky but when imperial juno from above saw dido fettered in the chains of love hot with the venom which her veins inflamed and by no sense of shame to be reclaimed with soothing words to venus she begun high praises endless honors you have won and mighty trophies with your worthy son two gods a silly woman hath undone nor am i ignorant you both suspect this rising city which my hands erect but shall celestial discord never cease tis better ended in a lasting peace you stand possessed of all your soul desired poor dido with consuming love is fired your trojan with my tyrian let us join so dido shall be yours aeneas mine one common kingdom one united line eliza shall a dardan lord obey and lofty carthage for a dower convey then venus who her hidden fraud descried which would the sceptre of the world misguide to libyan shores thus artfully replied who but a fool would wars with juno choose and such alliance and such gifts refuse if fortune with our joint desires comply the doubt is all from jove and destiny lest he forbid with absolute command to mix the people in one common land or will the trojan and the tyrian line in lasting leagues and sure succession join but you the partner of his bed and throne may move his mind my wishes are your own mine said imperial juno be the care time urges now to perfect this affair attend my counsel and the secret share when next the sun his rising light displays and gilds the world below with purple rays the queen aeneas and the tyrian court shall to the shady woods for sylvan game resort there while the huntsmen pitch their toils around and cheerful horns from side to side resound a pitchy cloud shall cover all the plain with hail and thunder and tempestuous rain the fearful train shall take their speedy flight dispersed and all involved in gloomy night one cave a grateful shelter shall afford to the fair princess and the trojan lord i will myself the bridal bed prepare if you to bless the nuptials will be there so shall their loves be crowned with due delights and hymen shall be present at the rites the queen of love consents and closely smiles at her vain project and discovered wiles the rosy morn was risen from the main and horns and hounds awake the princely train they issue early through the city gate where the more wakeful huntsmen ready wait with nets and toils and darts beside the force of spartan dogs and swift massilian horse the tyrian peers and officers of state for the slow queen in antechambers wait her lofty courser in the court below who his majestic rider seems to know proud of his purple trappings paws the ground and champs the golden bit and spreads the foam around the queen at length appears on either hand the brawny guards in martial order stand a flowered simar with golden fringe she wore and at her back a golden quiver bore her flowing hair a golden cowl restrains a golden clasp the tyrian robe sustains then young ascanius with a sprightly grace leads on the trojan youth to view the chase but far above the rest in beauty shines the great aeneas the troop he joins like fair apollo when he leaves the frost of wintry xanthus and the lycian coast when to his native delos he resorts ordains the dances and renews the sports where painted scythians mixed with cretan bands before the joyful altars join their hands himself on kynthos walking sees below the merry madness of the sacred show green wreaths of bays his length of hair enclose a golden fillet binds his awful brows his quiver sounds not less the prince is seen in manly presence or in lofty mien 
Now had they reached the hills and stormed the seat of savage beasts in dens their last retreat. The cry pursues the mountain goats. They bound from rock to rock and keep the craggy ground. Quite otherwise the stags, a trembling train, in herds unsingled scour the dusty plain and a long chase in open view maintain. The glad Ascanius, as his courser guides, spurs through the vale, and these and those outrides. His horse's flanks and sides are forced to feel the clanking lash and goring of the steel. Impatiently he views the feeble prey, wishing some nobler beast to cross his way, and rather would the tusky boar attend, or see the tawny lion downward bend. Meantime the gathering clouds obscure the skies. From pole to pole the forky lightning flies. The rattling thunders roll, and Juno pours a wintry deluge down, and sounding showers. The company, dispersed to converts, ride, and seek the homely cots or mountain's hollow side. The rapid rains descending from the hills to rolling torrents raise the creeping rills. The queen and prince, as love or fortune guides, one common cavern in her bosom hides. Then first the trembling earth the signal gave, and flashing fires enlighten all the cave. Hell from below, and Juno from above, and howling nymphs were conscious of their love. From this ill-omened hour in time arose debate and death, and all succeeding woes the queen whom sense of honour could not move no longer made a secret of her love but called it marriage by that specious name to veil the crime and sanctify the shame the loud report through libyan cities goes fame the great ill from small beginnings grows swift from the first and every moment brings new vigour to her flights new pinions to her wings soon grows the pygmy to gigantic size her feet on earth her forehead in the skies enraged against the gods revengeful earth produced her last of the titanian birth swift is her walk more swift her winged haste a monstrous phantom horrible and vast as many plumes as raise her lofty flight so many piercing eyes enlarge her sight millions of opening mouths to fame belong and every mouth is furnished with a tongue and round with listening ears the flying plague is hung she fills the peaceful universe with cries no slumbers ever close her wakeful eyes by day from lofty towers her head she shows and spreads through trembling crowds disastrous news with court informers haunts and royal spies things done relates not done she feigns and mingles truth with lies talk is her business and her chief delight to tell of prodigies and cause of fright she fills the people's ears with dido's name who lost to honour and the sense of shame admits into her throne and nuptial bed a wandering guest who from his country fled whole days with him she passes in delights and wastes in luxury long winter nights forgetful of her fame and royal trust dissolved in ease abandoned to her lust the goddess widely spreads the loud report and flies at length to king hyarba's court when first possessed with this unwelcome news whom did he not of men and gods accuse this prince from ravished garamantis born a hundred temples did with spoils adorn in ammon's honour his celestial sire a hundred altars fed with wakeful fire and through his vast dominions priests ordained whose watchful care these holy rites maintained the gates and columns were with garlands crowned and blood of victim beasts enriched the ground he when he heard a fugitive could move the tyrian princess who disdained his love his breast with fury burned his eyes with fire mad with despair impatient with desire 
then on the sacred altars pouring wine he thus with prayers implored his sire divine great jove propitious to the moorish race who feast on painted beds with offerings grace thy temples and adore thy power divine with the blood of victims and with sparkling wine seest thou not this or do we fear in vain thy boasted thunder and thy thoughtless reign do thy broad hands the forky lightning's lance thine are the bolts or the blind work of chance a wandering woman builds within our state a little town bought at an easy rate she pays me homage and my grants allow a narrow space of libyan lands to plough yet scorning me by passion blindly led admits a banished trojan to her bed and now this other paris with his train of conquered cowards must in Africa reign whom what they are their looks and garb confess their locks with oil perfumed their lydian dress he takes the spoil enjoys the princely dame and i rejected i adore an empty name his vows in haughty terms he thus preferred and held his altar's horns the mighty thunderer heard then cast his eyes on carthage where he found the lustful pair in lawless pleasure drowned lost in their loves insensible of shame and both forgetful of their better fame he calls Cyllenius, and the god attends by whom his menacing command he sends go mount the western winds and cleave the sky then with a swift descent to carthage fly there find the trojan chief who wastes his days in slothful riot and in glorious ease nor minds the future city given by fate to him this message from my mouth relate not so fair venus hoped when twice she won thy life with prayers nor promised such a son hers was a hero destined to command a martial race and rule the latian land who should his ancient line from teucer draw and on the conquered world impose the law if glory cannot move a mind so mean nor future praise from fading pleasure wean yet why should he defraud his son of fame and grudge the romans their immortal name what are his vain designs what hopes he more from his long lingering on a hostile shore regardless to redeem his honour lost and for his race to gain the ausonian coast bid him with speed the tyrian court forsake with this command the slumbering warrior wake hermes obeys with golden pinions binds his flying feet and mounts the western winds and whether o'er the seas or earth he flies with rapid force they bear him down the skies but first he grasps within his awful hand the mark of sovereign power his magic wand with this he draws the ghosts from hollow graves with this he drives them down the stygian waves with this he seals in sleep the wakeful sight and eyes though closed in death restores to light thus armed the god begins his airy race and drives the racking clouds along the liquid space now sees the tops of atlas as he flies whose brawny back supports the starry skies atlas whose head with piny forests crowned is beaten by the winds with foggy vapours bound snows hide his shoulders from beneath his chin the founts of rolling streams their race begin a beard of ice on his large breast depends here poised upon his wings the god descends then rested thus he from the towering height plunged downward with precipitated flight lights on the seas and skims along the flood as waterfowl who seek their fishy food less and yet less to distant prospect show by turns they dance aloft and dive below like these the steerage of his wings he plies and near the surface of the water flies 
till, having passed the seas and crossed the sands, he closed his wings and stooped on Libyan lands, where shepherds once were housed in homely sheds, now towers within the clouds advance their heads. Arriving there, he found the Trojan prince, new ramparts raising for the town's defense, a purple scarf with gold embroidered o'er Queen Dido's gift about his waist he wore a sword with glittering gems diversified for ornament not use hung idly by his side then thus with winged words the god began resuming his own shape degenerate man thou woman's property what mix'st thou here these foreign walls and tyrian towers to rear forgetful of thy own all-powerful jove who sways the world below and heaven above has sent me down with this severe command. What means thy lingering in the Libyan land? If glory cannot move a mind so mean, nor future praise from flitting pleasure wean, regard the fortunes of thy rising heir, the promised crown let young Ascanius wear, to whom the Ausonian scepter and the state of Rome's imperial name is owed by fate. So spoke the god and speaking took his flight involved in clouds and vanished out of sight the pious prince was seized with sudden fear mute was his tongue and upright stood his hair revolving in his mind the stern command he longs to fly and loathes the charming land what should he say or how should he begin what course alas remains to steer between the offended lover and the powerful queen this way and that he turns his anxious mind and all expedients tries and none can find fixed on the deed but doubtful of the means after long thought to this advice he leans three chiefs he calls commands them to repair the fleet and ship their men with silent care some plausible pretense he bids them find to color what in secret he designed himself meantime the softest hours would choose before the lovesick lady heard the news and move her tender mind by slow degrees to suffer what the sovereign power decrees jove will inspire him when and what to say they hear with pleasure and with haste obey but soon the queen perceives the thin disguise what arts can blind a jealous woman's eyes she was the first to find the secret fraud before the fatal news was blazed abroad love the first motions of the lover hears quick to presage and even in safety fears nor impious fame was wanting to report the ships repaired the trojans thick resort and purpose to forsake the tyrian court frantic with fear impatient of the wound and impotent of mind she roves the city round less wild the bacchanalian dames appear when from afar their nightly god they hear and howl about the hills and shake the wreathy spear at length she finds the dear perfidious man prevents his formed excuse and thus began base and ungrateful could you hope to fly and undiscovered scape a lover's eye nor could my kindness your compassion move nor plighted vows nor dearer bands of love or is the death of a despairing queen not worth preventing though too well foreseen even when the wintry winds command your stay you dare the tempests and defy the sea false as you are suppose you were not bound to lands unknown and foreign coasts to sound were troy restored and priam's happy reign now durst you tempt for troy the raging main see whom you fly am i the foe you shun now by those holy vows so late begun by this right hand since i have nothing more to challenge but the faith you gave before i beg you by these tears too truly shed by the new pleasures of our nuptial bed if ever dido when you most were kind were pleasing in your eyes or touched your mind by these my prayers 
if prayers may yet have place pity the fortunes of a falling race for you i have provoked a tyrant's hate incensed the libyan and the tyrian state for you alone i suffer in my fame bereft of honour and exposed to shame whom have i now to trust ungrateful guest that only name remains of all the rest what have i left or whither can i fly must i attend pygmalion's cruelty or till hyarba shall in triumph lead a queen that proudly scorned his proffered bed had you deferred at least your hasty flight and left behind some pledge of our delight some babe to bless the mother's mournful sight some young aeneas to supply your place whose features might express his father's face i should not then complain to live bereft of all my husband or be wholly left here paused the queen unmoved he holds his eyes by jove's command nor suffered love to rise though heaving in his heart and thus at length replies fair queen you never can enough repeat your boundless favours or i own my debt nor can my mind forget eliza's name while vital breath inspires this mortal frame this only let me speak in my defence i never hoped a secret flight from hence much less pretended to the lawful claim of sacred nuptials or a husband's name for if indulgent heaven would leave me free and not submit my life to fate's decree my choice would lead me to the trojan shore those relics to review their dust adore and priam's ruined palace to restore but now the delphian oracle commands and fate invites me to the latian lands that is the promised place to which i steer and all my vows are terminated there if you a tyrian and a stranger born with walls and towers a libyan town adorn why may not we like you a foreign race like you seek shelter in a foreign place as often as the night obscures the skies with humid shades or twinkling stars arise and Chyses' angry ghost in dreams appears chides my delay and fills my soul with fears and young ascanius justly may complain of his defrauded and destined reign even now the herald of the gods appeared waking i saw him and his message heard from jove he came commissioned heavenly bright with radiant beams and manifest to sight the sender and the scent i both attest these walls he entered and those words expressed fair queen oppose not what the gods command forced by my fate i leave your happy land end of section seven section eight of the aeneid of virgil this librivox recording is in the public domain book four part two thus while he spoke already she began with sparkling eyes to view the guilty man from head to foot surveyed his person o'er nor longer these outrageous threats forbore false as thou art and more than false forsworn not sprung from noble blood nor goddess born but hewn from hardened entrails of a rock and rough hyrcanian tigers gave thee suck why should i fawn what have i worse to fear did he once look or lent a listening ear sighed when i sobbed or shed one kindly tear all symptoms of a base ungrateful mind so foul that which is worst is hard to find of man's injustice why should i complain the gods and jove himself behold in vain triumphant treason yet no thunder flies nor juno views my wrongs with equal eyes faithless is earth and faithless are the skies justice is fled and truth is now no more i saved the shipwrecked exile on my shore with needful food his hungry trojans fed i took the traitor to my throne and bed 
fool that i was tis little to repeat the rest i stored and rigged his ruined fleet i rave i rave a god's command he pleads and makes heaven accessory to his deeds now lycian lots and now the delian god now hermes is employed from jove's abode to warn him hence as if the peaceful state of heavenly powers were touched with human fate but go thy flight no longer i detain go seek thy promised kingdom through the main yet if the heavens will hear my pious vow the faithless waves not half so false as thou or secret sands shall sepulchres afford to thy proud vessels and their perjured lord then shalt thou call on injured dido's name dido shall come in a black sulphury flame when death has once dissolved her mortal frame shall smile to see the traitor vainly weep her angry ghost arising from the deep shall haunt thee waking and disturb thy sleep at least my shade thy punishment shall know and fame shall spread the pleasing news below abruptly here she stops then turns away her loathing eyes and shuns the sight of day amazed he stood revolving in his mind what speech to frame and what excuse to find her fearful maids their fainting mistress led and softly laid her on her ivory bed but good aeneas though he much desired to give that pity which her grief required though much he mourned and labored with his love resolved at length obeys the will of jove reviews his forces they with early care on moor their vessels and for sea prepare the fleet is soon afloat in all its pride and well-cocked galleys in the harbor ride then oaks for oars they felled or as they stood of its green arms despoiled the growing wood studious of flight the beach is covered o'er with trojan bands that blacken all the shore on every side are seen descending down thick swarms of soldiers loaden from the town thus in battalia march embodied ants fearful of winter and of future wants to invade the corn and to their cells convey the plundered forage of their yellow prey the sable troops along the narrow tracks scarce bear the weighty burthen on their backs some set their shoulders to the ponderous grain some guard the spoil some lash the lagging train all ply their several tasks and equal toil sustain what pangs the tender breast of dido tore when from the tower she saw the covered shore and heard the shouts of sailors from afar mixed with the murmurs of the watery war all powerful love what changes canst thou cause in human hearts subjected to thy laws once more her haughty soul the tyrant bends to prayers and mean submissions she descends no female arts or aids she left untried nor counsels unexplored before she died look anna look the trojans crowd to see they spread their canvas and their anchors weigh the shouting crew their ships with garlands bind invoke the sea gods and invite the wind could i have thought this threatening blow so near my tender soul had been forewarned to bear but do not you my last request to deny with yon perfidious man your interest try and bring me news if i must live or die you are his favorite you alone can find the dark recesses of his inmost mind in all his trusted secrets you have part and know the soft approaches to his heart haste then and humbly seek my haughty foe tell him i did not with the grecians go nor did my fleet against his friends employ nor swore the ruin of unhappy troy nor moved with hands profane his father's dust why should he then reject a suit so just whom does he shun and whither would he fly can he this last this only prayer deny let him at least his dangerous flight delay 
wait better winds and hope a calmer sea the nuptials he disclaims i urge no more let him pursue the promised latian shore a short delay is all i ask him now a pause of grief an interval from woe till my soft soul be tempered to sustain accustomed sorrows and inured to pain if you in pity grant this one request my death shall glut the hatred of his breast this mournful message pious anna bears and seconds with her own her sister's tears but all her arts are still employed in vain again she comes and is refused again his hardened heart nor prayers nor threatenings move fate and the god had stopped his ears to love as when the winds their airy quarrel try justling from every quarter of the sky this way and that the mountain oak they bend his boughs they shatter and his branches rend with leaves and falling mast they spread the ground the hollow valleys echo to the sound unmoved the royal plant their fury mocks or shaken clings more closely to the rocks far as he shoots his towering head on high so deep in earth his fixed foundations lie no less a storm the trojan hero bears thick messages and loud complaints he hears and bandied words still beating on his ears sighs groans and tears proclaim his inward pains but the firm purpose of his heart remains the wretched queen pursued by cruel fate begins at length the light of heaven to hate and loathes to live then dire portents she sees to hasten on the death her soul decrees strange to relate for when before the shrine she pours in sacrifice the purple wine the purple wine is turned to putrid blood and the white offered milk converts to mud this dire presage to her alone revealed from all and even her sister she concealed a marble temple stood within the grove sacred to death and to her murdered love that honoured chapel she had hung around with snowy fleeces and with garlands crowned oft when she visited this lonely dome strange voices issued from her husband's tomb she thought she heard him summon her away invite her to his grave and chide her stay hourly it is heard when with a boding note the solitary screech owl strains her throat and on a chimney's top or turret's height with songs obscene disturbs the silence of the night besides old prophecies augment her fears and stern aeneas in her dreams appears disdainful as by day she seems alone to wander in her sleep through ways unknown guideless and dark or in a desert plain to seek her subjects and to seek in vain like pentheus when distracted with his fear he saw two sons and double thebes appear or mad orestes when his mother's ghost full in his face infernal torches tossed and shook her snaky locks he shuns the sight flies o'er the stage surprised with mortal fright the furies guard the door and intercept his flight now sinking underneath a load of grief from death alone she seeks her last relief the time and means resolved within her breast she to her mournful sister thus addressed dissembling hope her cloudy front she clears and a false vigour in her eyes appears rejoice she said instructed from above my lover i shall gain or lose my love nigh rising atlas next the falling sun long tracts of ethiopian climates run there a Massilian priestess i have found honoured for age for magic arts renowned the hesperian temple was her trusted care twas she supplied the wakeful dragon's fare she poppy seeds and honey taught to steep reclaimed his rage and soothed him into sleep she watched the golden fruit her charms unbind the chains of love or fix them on the mind she stops the torrents leaves the channel dry repels the stars and backward bears the sky the yawning earth rebellows to her call pale ghosts ascend and mountain ashes fall witness ye gods and thou my better part how loath i am to try this impious art 
within the secret court with silent care erect a lofty pile exposed in air hang on the topmost part the trojan vest spoils arms and presents of my faithless guest next under these the bridal bed be placed where i my ruin in his arms embraced all relics of the wretch are doomed to fire for so the priestess and her charms require thus far she said and farther speech forbears a mortal paleness in her face appears yet the mistrustless anna could not find the secret funeral in these rites designed nor thought so dire a rage possessed her mind unknowing of a train concealed so well she feared no worse than when sichaeus fell therefore obeys the fatal pile they rear within the secret court exposed in air the cloven holms and pines are heaped on high and garlands on the hollow spaces lie sad cypress vervain yew compose the wreath and every baleful green denoting death the queen determined to the fatal deed the spoils and sword he left in order spread and the man's image on the nuptial bed and now the sacred altars placed around the priestess enters with her hair unbound and thrice invokes the powers below the ground night erebus and chaos she proclaims and threefold hecate with her hundred names and three dianas next she sprinkles round with feigned avernian drops the hallowed ground culls hoary simples found by phoebe's light with brazen sickles reaped at noon of night then mixes baleful juices in the bowl and cuts the forehead of a new-born foal robbing the mother's love the destined queen observes assisting at the rites obscene a leavened cake in her devoted hands she holds and next to the highest altar stands one tender foot was shod her other bare girt was her gathered gown and loose her hair thus dressed she summoned with her dying breath the heavens and planets conscious of her death and every power if any rules above who minds or who revenges injured love twas dead of night when weary bodies close their eyes in balmy sleep and soft repose the winds no longer whisper through the woods nor murmuring tides disturb the gentle floods the stars in silent order moved around and peace with downy wings was brooding on the ground the flocks and herds and party-coloured fowl which haunt the woods or swim the weedy pool stretched on the quiet earth securely lay forgetting the past labours of the day all else of nature's common gift partake unhappy dido was alone awake nor sleep nor ease the furious queen can find sleep fled her eyes as quiet fled her mind despair and rage and love divide her heart despair and rage had some but love the greater part then thus she said within her secret mind what shall i do what succour can i find become a suppliant to hyerba's pride and take my turn to court and be denied shall i with this ungrateful trojan go forsake an empire and attend a foe himself i refuged and his train relieved tis true but am i sure to be received can gratitude in trojan souls have place laomedon still lives in all his race then shall i seek alone the churlish crew or with my fleet their flying sails pursue what force have i but those whom scarce before i drew reluctant from their native shore will they again embark at my desire once more sustain the seas and quit their second tire rather with steel thy guilty breast invade and take the fortune thou thyself hast made your pity sister first seduced my mind or seconded too well what i designed these dear-bought pleasures had i never known had i continued free and still my own avoiding love i had not found despair but shared with savage beasts the common air like them a lonely life i might have led not mourned the living nor disturbed the dead these thoughts she brooded in her anxious breast 
on board the trojan found more easy rest resolved to sail in sleep he passed the night and ordered all things for his early flight to whom once more the winged god appears his former youthful mien and shape he wears and with this new alarm invades his ears sleep'st thou o goddess born and canst thou drown thy needful cares so near a hostile town beset with foes nor hear'st the western gales invite thy passage and inspire thy sails she harbors in her heart a furious hate and thou shalt find the dire effects too late fixed on revenge and obstinate to die haste swiftly hence while thou hast power to fly the sea with ships will soon be covered o'er and blazing firebrands kindle all the shore prevent her rage while night obscures the skies and sail before the purple morn arise who knows what hazards thy delay may bring woman's a various and a changeful thing thus hermes in the dream then took his flight aloft in air unseen and mixed with night twice warned by the celestial messenger the pious prince arose with hasty fear then roused his drowsy train without delay haste to your banks your crooked anchors weigh and spread your flying sails and stand to sea a god commands he stood before my sight and urged us once again to speedy flight o sacred power what power soe'er thou art to thy blessed orders i resign my heart lead thou the way protect thy trojan bands and prosper the design thy will commands he said and drawing forth his flaming sword his thundering arm divides the many twisted cord an emulating zeal inspires his train they run they snatch they rush into the main with headlong haste they leave the desert shores and brush the liquid seas with laboring oars aurora now had left her saffron bed and beams of early light the heavens o'erspread when from a tower the queen with wakeful eyes saw day point upward from the rosy skies she looked to seaward but the sea was void and scarce in ken the sailing ships descried stung with despite and furious with despair she struck her trembling breast and tore her hair and shall the ungrateful traitor go she said my land forsaken and my love betrayed shall we not arm not rush from every street to follow sink and burn his perjured fleet haste haul my galleys out pursue the foe bring flaming brands set sail and swiftly row what have i said where am i fury turns my brain and my distempered bosom burns then when i gave my person and my throne this hate this rage had been more timely shown see now the promised faith the vaunted name the pious man who rushing through the flame preserved his gods and to the phrygian shore the burthen of his feeble father bore i should have torn him piecemeal strode in floods his scattered limbs or left exposed in woods destroyed his friends and son and from the fire have set the reeking boy before the sire events are doubtful which on battles wait yet where's the doubt to soul secure of fate my tyrians at their injured queen's command had tossed their fires amid the trojan band at once extinguished all the faithless name and i myself in vengeance of my shame had fallen upon the pile to mend the funeral flame thou son who viewest at once the world below thou juno guardian of the nuptial vow thou hecate hearken from thy dark abodes ye furies fiends and violated gods all powers invoked with dido's dying breath attend her curses and avenge her death if so the fates ordain jove commands the ungrateful wretch should find the latian lands yet let a race untamed and haughty foes his peaceful entrance with dire arms oppose oppressed with numbers in the unequal field his men discouraged and himself expelled let him for succor sue from place to place torn from his subjects and his sons embrace first let him see his friends in battle slain and their untimely fate lament in vain and when at length the cruel war shall cease 
On hard conditions may he buy his peace. Nor let him then enjoy supreme command, But fall untimely by some hostile hand, And lie unburied on the barren sand. These are my prayers, and this my dying will, And you, my Tyrians, every curse fulfill. Perpetual hate and mortal wars proclaim Against the prince, the people, and the name, these grateful offerings on my grave bestow nor league nor love the hostile nations know now and from hence in every future age when rage excites your arms and strength supplies the rage rise some avenger of our libyan blood with fire and sword pursue the perjured brood our arms our seas our shores opposed to theirs and the same hate descend on all our heirs. This said, within her anxious mind she weighs the means of cutting short her odious days. Then to Sicaeus' nurse she briefly said, for when she left her country hers was dead, Go, Barke, call my sister, let her care the solemn rites of sacrifice prepare, the sheep and all the atoning offerings bring, sprinkling her body from the crystal spring with living drops then let her come and thou with sacred fillets bind thy hoary brow thus will i pay my vows to stygian jove and end the cares of my disastrous love then cast the trojan image on the fire and as that burns my passions shall expire the nurse moves onward with officious care and all the speed her aged limbs can bear but furious dido with dark thoughts involved shook at the mighty mischief she resolved with livid spots distinguished was her face red were her rolling eyes and discomposed her pace ghastly she gazed with pain she drew her breath and nature shivered at approaching death then swiftly to the fatal place she passed and mounts the funeral pile with furious haste unsheathes the sword the trojan left behind not for so dire an enterprise designed but when she viewed the garments loosely spread which once he wore and saw the conscious bed she paused and with a sigh the robes embraced then on the couch her trembling body cast repressed the ready tears and spoke her last dear pledges of my love while heaven so pleased receive a soul of mortal anguish eased my fatal course is finished and i go a glorious name among the ghosts below a lofty city by my hands is raised pygmalion punished and my lord appeased what could my fortune have afforded more had the false trojan never touched my shore then kissed the couch and must i die she said and unrevenged tis doubly to be dead yet even this death with pleasure i receive on any terms tis better than to live these flames from far may the false trojan view these boding omens his base flight pursue she said and struck deep entered in her side the piercing steel with reeking purple dyed clogged in the wound the cruel weapon stands the spouting blood came streaming on her hands her sad attendants saw the deadly stroke and with loud cries the sounding palace shook distracted from the fatal sight they fled and through the town the dismal rumour spread first from the frighted court the yell began redoubled thence from house to house it ran the groans of men with shrieks laments and cries of mixing women mount the vaulted skies not less the clamour than if ancient tyre or the new carthage set by foes on fire the rolling ruin with their loved abodes involved the blazing temples of their gods her sister hears and furious with despair she beats her breast and rends her yellow hair and calling on eliza's name aloud runs breathless to the place and breaks the crowd was all that pomp of woe for this prepared these fires this funeral pile these altars reared was all this train of plots contrived said she all only to deceive unhappy me 
which is the worst didst thou in death pretend to scorn thy sister or delude thy friend thy summoned sister and thy friend had come one sword had served us both one common tomb was i to raise the pile the powers invoke not to be present at the fatal stroke at once thou hast destroyed thyself and me thy town thy senate and thy colony bring water bathe the wound while i in death lay close my lips to hers and catch the flying breath this said she mounts the pile with eager haste and in her arms the gasping queen embraced her temples chafed and her own garments tore to staunch the streaming blood and cleanse the gore thrice dido tried to raise her drooping head and fainting thrice fell grovelling on the bed thrice oped her heavy eyes and sought the light but having found it sickened at the sight and closed her lids at last in endless night then juno grieving that she should sustain a death so lingering and so full of pain sent iris down to free her from the strife of laboring nature and dissolve her life for since she died not doomed by heaven's decree or her own crime but human casualty and rage of love that plunged her in despair the sisters had not cut the topmost hair which proserpine and they can only know nor made her sacred to the shades below downward the various goddess took her flight and drew a thousand colours from the light then stood above the dying lover's head and said i thus devote thee to the dead this offering to the infernal gods i bear thus while she spoke she cut the fatal hair the struggling soul was loosed and life dissolved in air end of section eight section nine of the aeneid of virgil this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil Translated by John Dryden Book Five, Part One Meantime the Trojan cuts his watery way, fixed on his voyage through the curling sea, then, casting back his eyes with dire amaze, sees on the Punic shore the mounting blaze, the cause unknown, yet his presaging mind the fate of dido from the fire divined he knew the stormy souls of womankind what secret springs their eager passions move how capable of death for injured love dire auguries from hence the trojans draw till neither fires nor shining shores they saw now seas and skies their prospect only bound an empty space above a floating field around but soon the heavens with shadows were o'erspread a swelling cloud hung hovering o'er their head livid it looked the threatening of a storm then night and horror ocean's face deform the pilot palinurus cried aloud what gusts of weather from that gathering cloud my thoughts presage ere yet the tempest roars stand to your tackle mates and stretch your oars contract your swelling sails and luff to the wind the frighted crew perform the task assigned then to his fearless chief not heaven said he though jove himself should promise italy can stem the torrent of this raging sea mark how the shifting winds from west arise and what collected night involves the skies nor can our shaken vessels live at sea much less against the tempest force their way tis fate diverts our course and fate we must obey not far from hence if i observed aright the southing of the stars and polar light sicilia lies whose hospitable shores in safety we may reach with struggling oars aeneas then replied too sure i find we strive in vain against the seas and wind now shift your sails what place can please me more than what you promise the sicilian shore 
whose hallowed earth Anchises bones contains, and where a prince of Trojan lineage reigns. The course resolved, before the western wind they scud amain, and make the port assigned. Meantime Acestes from a lofty stand beheld the fleet descending on the land, and, not unmindful of his ancient race, down from the cliff he ran with eager pace, and held the hero in a strict embrace. Of a rough Libyan bear the spoils he wore, and either hand a pointed javelin bore. His mother was a dame of Dardan blood, his sire Crinesus, a Sicilian flood. He welcomes his returning friends ashore, with plenteous country, cates, and homely store. Now, when the following morn had chased away the flying stars, and light restored the day, Aeneas called the Trojan troops around, and thus bespoke them from a rising ground. Offspring of heaven, divine Dardanian race, the sun revolving through the ethereal space, the shining circle of the year has filled, since first this isle my father's ashes held, and now the rising day renews the year. A day forever sad, forever dear. This would I celebrate with annual games, With gifts on altars piled and holy flames, Though banished to Gaetulia's barren sands, Caught on the Grecian seas or hostile lands. But since this happy storm our fleet has driven, Not, as I deem, without the will of heaven, Upon these friendly shores and flowery plains, Which hide Anchises and his blessed remains, let us with joy perform his honours due, and pray for prosperous winds our voyage to renew. Pray that in towns and temples of our own the name of great Anchises may be known, and yearly games may spread the gods' renown. Our sports Acestes of the Trojan race, with royal gifts ordained, is pleased to grace. Two steers on every ship the king bestows, his gods and ours shall share your equal vows. Besides, if nine days hence the rosy morn shall with unclouded light the skies adorn, that day with solemn sports I mean to grace. Light galleys on the seas shall run a watery race. Some shall in swiftness for the goal contend, and others try the twanging bow to bend. The strong with iron gauntlets armed shall stand opposed in combat on the yellow sand. Let all be present at the games prepared, and joyful victors wait the just reward. But now assist the rites with garlands crowned. He said, and first his brows with myrtle bound. Then Helimus by his example led, and old Acestes each adorned his head. Thus young Ascanius, with a sprightly grace, his temples tied, and all the Trojan race. Aeneas then advanced amidst the train, by thousands followed through the flowery plain, to great Anchises' tomb, which when he found, he poured to Bacchus on the hallowed ground, two bowls of sparkling wine, of milk two more, and two from offered bowls of purple gore. With roses then the sepulchre he strode, and thus his father's ghost bespoke aloud. Hail, O ye holy manes, hail again, paternal ashes now reviewed in vain. The gods permitted not that you with me should reach the promised shores of Italy, or Tiber's flood, what flood soe'er it be. Scarce had he finished when, with speckled pride, a serpent from the tomb began to glide, his huge bulk on seven high volumes rolled, blue was his breadth of back, but streaked with scaly gold. Thus riding on his curls, he seemed to pass a rolling fire along and singe the grass. More various colors through his body run than Iris when her bow imbibes the sun betwixt the rising altars and around the sacred monster shot along the ground. With harmless play amidst the bowls he passed, and with his lolling tongue assayed the taste. Thus fed with holy food, the wondrous guest within the hollow tomb retired to rest. The pious prince, surprised at what he viewed, the funeral honours with more zeal renewed. 
doubtful if this place's genius were or guardian of his father's sepulchre five sheep according to the rites he slew as many swine and steers of sable hue new generous wine he from the goblets poured and called his father's ghost from hell restored the glad attendants in long order come offering their gifts at great anchises tomb some add more oxen some divide the spoil some place the chargers on the grassy soil some blow the fires and offered entrails broil now came the day desired the skies were bright with rosy lustre of the rising light the bordering people roused by sounding fame of trojan feasts and great acestes name the crowded shore with acclamations fill part to behold and part to prove their skill and first the gifts in public view they place green laurel wreaths and palm the victor's grace within the circle arms and tripods lie ingots of gold and silver heaped on high and vests embroidered of the tyrian dye the trumpets clangor then the feast proclaims and all prepare for their appointed games four galleys first which equal rowers bear advancing in the watery lists appear the speedy dolphin that outstrips the wind bore menestheus author of the memian kind gaius the vast chimera's bulk commands which rising like a towering city stands three trojans tug at every laboring oar three banks in three degrees the sailors bore beneath their sturdy strokes the billows roar sergestus who began the sergian race in the great centaur took the leading place cloanthus on the sea-green scylla stood from whom cluentius draws his trojan blood far in the sea against the foaming shore there stands a rock the raging billows roar above his head in storms but when tis clear uncurl their ridgy backs and at his foot appear in peace below the gentle waters run the cormorants above lie basking in the sun on this the hero fixed an oak in sight the mark to guide the mariners aright to bear with this the seamen stretch their oars then round the rock they steer and seek the former shores the lots decide their place above the rest each leader shining in his tyrian vest the common crew with wreaths of poplar boughs their temples crown and shade their sweaty brows besmeared with oil their naked shoulders shine all take their seats and wait the sounding sign they grip their oars and every panting breast is raised by turns with hope by turns with fear depressed the clangor of the trumpet gives the sign at once they start advancing in a line with shouts the sailors rend the starry skies lashed with their oars the smoky billows rise sparkles the briny main and the vexed ocean fries exact in time with equal strokes they row at once the brushing oars and brazen prow dash up the sandy waves and ope the depths below not fiery coursers in a chariot race invade the field with half so swift a pace not the fierce driver with more fury lends the sounding lash and ere the stroke descends lo to the wheels his pliant body bends the partial crowd their hopes and fears divide and aid with eager shouts the favoured side cries murmurs clamours with a mixing sound from woods to woods from hills to hills rebound amidst the loud applauses of the shore gaius outstripped the rest and sprung before cloanthus better manned pursued him fast but his o'ermasted galley checked his haste the centaur and the dolphin brush the brine with equal oars advancing in a line and now the mighty centaur seems to lead and now the speedy dolphin gets ahead now board to board the rival vessels row the billows lave the skies and ocean groans below they reached the mark proud gaius and his train in triumph rode the victors of the main but steering round he charged his pilot stand 
more close to shore and skim along the sand let others bear to sea menetus heard but secret shelves too cautiously he feared and fearing sought the deep and still aloof he steered with louder cries the captain called again bear to the rocky shore and shun the main he spoke and speaking at his stern he saw the bold cloanthus near the shelving straw betwixt the mark and him the scylla stood and in a closer compass ploughed the flood he passed the mark and wheeling got before gaius blasphemed the gods devoutly swore cried out for anger and his hair he tore mindless of others lives so high was grown his rising rage and careless of his own the trembling dotard to the deck he drew then hoisted up and overboard he threw this done he seized the helm his fellows cheered turned short upon the shelves and madly steered hardly his head the plunging pilot rears clogged with his clothes and cumbered with his years now dropping wet he climbs the cliff with pain the crowd that saw him fall and float again shout from the distant shore and loudly laughed to see his heaving breast disgorge the briny draught the following centaur and the dolphin's crew their vanished hopes of victory renew while gaius lags they kindle in the race to reach the mark sergesthus takes the place menestheus pursues and while around they wind comes up not half his galley's length behind then on the deck amidst his mates appeared and thus their drooping courage he cheered my friends and hector's followers heretofore exert your vigour tug the labouring oar stretch to your strokes my still unconquered crew whom from the flaming walls of troy i drew in this our common interest let me find that strength of hand that courage of the mind as when you stemmed the strong malayan flood and o'er the syrtes broken billows rode i seek not now the foremost palm to gain though yet but ah that haughty wish is vain let those enjoy it whom the gods ordain but to be last the lags of all the race redeem yourselves and me from that disgrace now one and all they tug amain they row at the full stretch and shake the brazen prow the sea beneath them sinks their labouring sides are swelled and sweat runs guttering down in tides chance aids their daring with unhoped success sergesthus eager with his beak to press betwixt the rival galley and the rock shuts up the unwieldy centaur in the lock the vessel struck and with a dreadful shock her oars she shivered and her head she broke the trembling rowers from their banks arise and anxious for themselves renounce the prize with iron poles they heave her off the shores and gather from the sea their floating oars the crew of menestheus with elated minds urge their success and call the willing winds then ply their oars and cut their liquid way in larger compass on the roomy sea as when the dove her rocky hold forsakes roused in affright her sounding wings she shakes the cavern rings with clattering out she flies and leaves her callow care and cleaves the skies at first she flutters but at length she springs to smoother flight and shoots upon her wings so menestheus in the dolphin cuts the sea and flying with a force that force assists his way sergesthus in the centaur soon he passed wedged in the rocky shoals and sticking fast in vain the victor he with cries implores and practices to row with shattered oars then menestheus bears with gaius and outflies the ship without a pilot yields the prize unvanquished scylla now alone remains her he pursues and all his vigour strains shouts from the favouring multitude arise applauding echo to the shouts replies shouts wishes and applause run rattling through the skies these clamours with disdain the scylla heard much grudged the praise but more the robbed reward 
Resolved to hold their own, they mend their pace, All obstinate to die or gain the race. Raised with success, the dolphin swiftly ran, For they can conquer who believe they can. Both urge their oars, and fortune both supplies, And both perhaps had shared an equal prize. When to the seas, Cloanthus holds his hands, and succor from the watery powers demands. Gods of the liquid realms on which I row, if given by you the laurel bind my brow, assist to make me guilty of my vow. A snow-white bull shall on your shore be slain, his offered entrails cast into the main, and ruddy wine from golden goblets thrown, your grateful gift, and my return shall own. The choir of nymphs and forcus from below with virgin panopea heard his vow and old portunus with his breadth of hand pushed on and sped the galley to the land swift as a shaft or winged wind she flies and darting to the port obtains the prize the herald summons all and then proclaims cloanthus conqueror of the naval games the prince with laurel crowns the victor's head and three fat steers are to his vessel led the ship's reward with generous wine beside and sums of silver which the crew divide the leaders are distinguished from the rest the victor honored with a nobler vest where gold and purple strive an equal rose and needlework its happy cost bestows there ganymede is wrought with living art chasing through ida's groves the trembling heart breathless he seems yet eager to pursue when from aloft descends in open view the bird of jove and sousing on his prey with crooked talons bears the boy away in vain with lifted hands and gazing eyes his guards behold him soaring through the skies and dogs pursue his flight with imitated cries menestheus the second victor was declared and summoned there the second prize he shared a coat of mail brave demelios bore more brave aeneas from his shoulders tore in single combat on the trojan shore this was ordained for menestheus to possess in war for his defence for ornament and peace rich was the gift and glorious to behold but yet so ponderous with its plates of gold that scarce two servants could the weight sustain Yet loaded thus Demolius o'er the plain, Pursued and lightly seized the Trojan train. The third, succeeding to the last reward, Two goodly bowls of massy silver shared, With figures prominent and richly wrought, And two brass cauldrons from Dodona brought. Thus all, rewarded by the hero's hands, Their conquering temples bound with purple bands, and now Sergestus, clearing from the rock, brought back his galley shattered with a shock. Forlorn she looked without an aiding oar, and houted by the vulgar made to shore, as when a snake, surprised upon the road, is crushed athwart her body by the load of heavy wheels, or with a mortal wound her belly bruised and trodden to the ground. In vain with loosened curls she crawls along, yet fierce above she brandishes her tongue, glares with her eyes and bristles with her scales but groveling in the dust her parts unsound she trails so slowly to the port the centaur tends but what she wants in oars with sails amends yet for his galley saved the grateful prince is pleased the unhappy chief to recompense foloe the cretan slave rewards his care beauteous herself with lovely twins as fair from thence his way the trojan hero bent into the neighboring plain with mountains pent whose sides were shaded with surrounding wood full in the midst of this fair valley stood a native theatre which rising slow by just degrees o'erlooked the ground below high on a sylvan throne the leader sat a numerous train attend in solemn state here those that in the rapid course delight desire of honor and the prize invite the rival runners without order stand the trojans mixed with the sicilian band first nisus with euryalus appears euryalus a boy of blooming years 
with sprightly grace and equal beauty crowned nisus for friendship to the youth renowned diores next of priam's royal race then salius joined with patron took their place but patron in arcadia had his birth and salius his from arcananian earth then two sicilian youths the names of these swift helimus and lovely panopes both jolly huntsmen both in forest bred and owning old acestes for their head with several others of ignobler name whom time has not delivered o'er to fame to these the hero thus his thoughts explained in words which general approbation gained one common largesse is for all designed the vanquished and the victor shall be joined two darts of polished steel and gnosian wood a silver-studded axe alike bestowed the foremost three have olive wreaths decreed the first of these obtains a stately steed adorned with trappings and the next in fame the quiver of an amazonian dame with feathered thracian arrows well supplied a golden belt shall gird his manly side which with a sparkling diamond shall be tied the third this grecian helmet shall content he said to their appointed base they went with beating hearts the expected sign receive and starting all at once the barrier leave spread out as on the winged winds they flew and seized the distant goal with greedy view shot from the crowd swift nisus all o'erpast nor storms nor thunder equal half his haste the next but though the next yet far disjoined came salius and euryalus behind then helimus whom young diores plied step after step and almost side by side his shoulders pressing and in longer space had won or left at least a dubious race now spent the goal they almost reach at last when eager nisus hapless in his haste slipped first and slipping fell upon the plain soaked with the blood of oxen newly slain the careless victor had not marked his way but treading where the treacherous puddle lay his heels flew up and on the grassy floor he fell besmeared with filth and holy gore not mindless then euryalus of thee nor of the sacred bonds of amity he strove the immediate rivals hope to cross and caught the foot of salius as he rose so salius lay extended on the plain euryalus springs out the prize to gain and leaves the crowd applauding peals attend the victor to the goal who vanquished by his friend next helimus and then diores came by two misfortunes made the third in fame but salius enters and exclaiming loud for justice deafens and disturbs the crowd urges his cause may in the court be heard and pleads the prize is wrongfully conferred but favour for euryalus appears his blooming beauty with his tender tears had bribed the judges for the promised prize besides diores fills the court with cries who vainly reaches at the last reward if the first palm on salius be conferred then thus the prince let no disputes arise where fortune placed it i award the prize but fortune's errors give me leave to mend at least to pity my deserving friend he said and from the spoils he draws ponderous with shaggy mane and golden paws a lion's hide to salius this he gives nisus with envy sees the gift and grieves if such rewards to vanquished men are due he said and falling is to rise by you what prize may nisus from your bounty claim who merited the first rewards and fame in falling both an equal fortune tried would fortune for my fall so well provide with this he pointed to his face and showed his hand and all his habit smeared with blood the indulgent father of the people smiled and caused to be produced an ample shield of wondrous art by didymion wrought long since from neptune's bars in triumph brought this given to nisus he divides the rest and equal justice in his gifts expressed the race thus ended and rewards bestowed once more the prince bespeaks the attentive crowd if there be here whose dauntless courage dare in gauntlet fight with limbs and body bare his opposite sustain in open view 
stand forth the champion and the games renew two prizes i propose and thus divide a bull with gilded horns and fillets tied shall be the portion of the conquering chief a sword and helm shall cheer the loser's grief then haughty dares in the lists appears stalking he strides his head erected bears his nervous arms the weighty gauntlet wield and loud applauses echo through the field dares alone in combat used to stand the match of mighty paris hand to hand the same at hector's funerals undertook gigantic butes of the amician stock and by the stroke of his resistless hand stretched the vast bulk upon the yellow sand such dares was and such he strode along and drew the wonder of the gazing throng his brawny back and ample breast he shows his lifted arms around his head he throws and deals in whistling air his empty blows his match is sought but through the trembling band not one dares answer to the proud demand presuming of his force with sparkling eyes already he devours the promised prize he claims the bull with all his insolence and having seized his horns accosts the prince if none my matchless valor dares oppose how long shall dares wait his dastard foes permit me chief permit without delay to lead this uncontended gift away the crowd assents and with redoubled cries for the proud challenger demands the prize acestes fired with just disdain to see the palm usurped without a victory reproached entellus thus who sat beside and heard and saw unmoved the trojan's pride once but in vain a champion of renown so tamely can you bear the ravished crown a prize in triumph borne before your sight and shun for fear the danger of the fight where is our eryx now the boasted name the god who taught your thundering arm the game where now your baffled honor where the spoil that filled your house and fame that filled our isle and tell us thus my soul is still the same unmoved with fear and moved with martial fame but my chill blood is curdled in my veins and scarce the shadow of a man remains oh could i turn to that fair prime again that prime of which this boaster is so vain the brave who this decrepit age defies should feel my force without the promised prize he said and rising at the word he threw two ponderous gauntlets down in open view gauntlets which eryx wont in fight to wield and sheathe his hands with in the listed field with fear and wonder seized the crowd beholds the gloves of death with seven distinguished folds of tough bull hides the space within is spread with iron or with loads of heavy lead dares himself was daunted at the sight renounced his challenge and refused to fight astonished at their weight the hero stands and poised the ponderous engines in his hands what had your wonder said entellus ben had you the gauntlets of alcides seen or viewed the stern debate on this unhappy green these which i bear your brother eryx bore still marked with battered brains and mingled gore with these he long sustained the herculean arm and these i wielded while my blood was warm this languished frame while better spirits fed ere age unstrung my nerves or time or snowed my head but if the challenger these arms refuse and cannot wield their weight or dare not use if great aeneas and acestes join in his request these gauntlets i resign let us with equal arms perform the fight and let him leave to fear since i resign my right end of section nine Section 10 of the Aeneid of Virgil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 5, Part 2. This said, Entellus for the strife prepares. Stripped of his quilted coat, his body bears. Composed of mighty bones and brawn, he stands. A goodly towering object on the sands. 
Then just Aeneas equal arms supplied, which round their shoulders to their wrists they tied. Both on the tiptoe stand at full extent, their arms aloft, their bodies inly bent. Their heads from aiming blows they bear afar, with clashing gauntlets then provoke the war. One on his youth and pliant limbs relies, one on his sinews and his giant size. The last is stiff with age, his motion slow, he heaves for breath, he staggers to and fro, and clouds of issuing smoke his nostrils loudly blow. Yet equal in success they ward, they strike, their ways are different, but their art alike. Before, behind, the blows are dealt, around their hollow sides the rattling thumps resound, a storm of strokes, well meant with fury flies, and errs about their temples, ears, and eyes. Not always errs, for oft the gauntlet draws a sweeping stroke along the crackling jaws. Heavy with age, and Tellus stands his ground, but with his warping body wards the wound. His hand and watchful eye keep even pace, while Dares traverses and shifts his place. And, like a captain who beleaguers round some strong-built castle on a rising ground, views all the approaches with observing eyes, this and that other part in vain he tries, and more on industry than force relies. With hands on high, Entellus threats the foe, but Dares watched the motion from below, and slipped aside and shunned the long-descending blow. Entellus wastes his forces on the wind, and thus deluded of the stroke designed, headlong and heavy fell, his ample breast and weighty limbs his ancient mother pressed. So falls a hollow pine that long had stood on Ida's height, or Yerimanthus' wood, torn from the roots. The differing nations rise, and shouts and mingled murmurs rend the skies. Acestus runs with eager haste to raise the fallen companion of his youthful days. Dauntless he rose, and to the fight returned. With shame his glowing cheeks, his eyes with fury burned. Disdain and conscious virtue fired his breast, and with redoubled force his foe he pressed. He lays on load with either hand amain, and headlong drives the Trojan o'er the plain, nor stops, nor stays, nor rest, nor breath allows, but storms of strokes descend about his brows, a rattling tempest and a hail of blows. But now the prince, who saw the wild increase of wounds, commands the combatants to cease, and bounds in Tellus' wrath and bids the peace. First to the Trojan, spent with toil, he came, and soothed his sorrow for the suffered shame. What fury seized my friend, the gods, said he, to him propitious and averse to thee, have given his arm superior force to thine. Tis madness to contend with strength divine. The gauntlet fight thus ended from the shore, his faithful friends unhappy Dares bore. His mouth and nostrils poured a purple flood, and pounded teeth came rushing with his blood. Faintly he staggered through the hissing throng, and hung his head and trailed his legs along. The sword and casque are carried by his train, but with his foe the palm and ox remain. The champion then before Aeneas came, proud of his prize, but prouder of his fame. O goddess-born, and you, Dardanian host, mark with attention, and forgive my boast. Learn what I was, by what remains, and know from what impending fate you save my foe. Sternly he spoke, and then confronts the bull, and, on his ample forehead, aiming full, the deadly stroke, descending, pierced the skull. Down drops the beast, nor needs a second wound, but sprawls in pangs of death and spurns the ground. Then thus, in Dare's stead I offer this, Eryx, accept a nobler sacrifice, take the last gift my withered arms can yield, thy gauntlets I resign, and here renounce the field. This done, Aeneas orders for the close the strife of archers with contending bows. The mast Sergesthus shattered galley bore, with his own hands he raises on the shore. A fluttering dove upon the top they tie, the living mark at which their arrows fly. The rival archers in a line advance, their turn of shooting to receive from chance. A helmet holds their names, the lots are drawn. On the first scroll was read Hippocorn. The people shout, 
Upon the next was found young Menestheus, late with naval honors crowned. The third contained Eurytion's noble name, thy brother Pandarus, and next in fame, whom Pallas urged the treaty to confound, and send among the Greeks a feathered wound. Acestes in the bottom last remained, whom not his age from youthful sports restrained. Soon all the vigor bend their trusty bows. Soon all with vigor bend their trusty bows, and from the quiver each his arrow chose. Hippocorns was the first, with forceful sway it flew, and whizzing cut the liquid way. Fixed in the mast the feathered weapon stands, the fearful pigeon flutters in her bands, and the tree trembled, and the shouting cries of the pleased people rend the vaulted skies. Then Menestheus to the head his arrow drove, with lifted eyes, and took his aim above, but made a glancing shot, and missed the dove, yet missed so narrow that he cut the cord which fastened by the foot the flitting bird. The captive thus released, away she flies, and beats with clapping wings the yielding skies. His bow already bent, Eurytion stood, and having first invoked his brother god, his winged shaft with eager haste he sped. The fatal message reached her as she fled. She leaves her life aloft, she strikes the ground, and renders back the weapon in the wound. Acestes, grudging at his lot, remains, without a prize to gratify his pains. Yet shooting upward, sends his shaft to show an archer's art, and boasts his twanging bow. The feathered arrow gave a dire portent, and latter augurs judge from this event. Chafed by the speed, it fired, and as it flew, a trail of following flames ascending drew. Kindling they mount and mark the shiny way, across the skies as falling meteors play, and vanish into wind or in a blaze decay. The Trojans and Sicilians wildly stare, and trembling turn their wonder into prayer. The Dardan prince put on a smiling face, and strained Acestes with a close embrace. Then honoring him with gifts above the rest, turned the bad omen, nor his fears confessed. The gods, said he, this miracle have wrought, and ordered you the prize without the lot. Accept this goblet, rough with figured gold, which Thracian Caseus gave my sire of old. This pledge of ancient amity receive, which to my second sire I justly give. He said, and with the trumpet's cheerful sound, proclaimed him victor, and with laurel crowned. Nor good Eurytion envied him the prize, though he transfixed the pigeon in the skies, who cut the line with second gifts was graced. The third was his whose arrow pierced the mast. The chief, before the games were wholly done, called Periphantes, tutor to his son, and whispered thus, With speed Ascanius find, and if his childish troop be ready joined, on horseback let him grace his grandsire's day, and lead his equals armed in just array. He said, and calling out the cirque he clears, the crowd withdrawn, an open plain appears, and now the noble youths of form divine advance before their fathers in a line, the riders grace the steeds, the steeds with glory shine. Thus marching on in military pride, shouts of applause resound from side to side. Their casks adorned with laurel wreaths they wear, each brandishing aloft a cornel spear. Some at their backs their gilded quivers bore, their chains of burnished gold hung down before. Three graceful troops they formed upon the green, Three graceful leaders at their head were seen. Twelve followed every chief, and left a space between. The first young Priam led, a lovely boy, whose grandsire was the unhappy king of Troy. His race in after times was known to fame, new honors adding to the Latian name. And well the royal boy his Thracian steed became. White were the fetlocks of his feet before, and on his front a snowy star he bore. Then beauteous Atis with Eulus bred, of equal age the second squadron led, the last in order, but the first in place, first in the lovely features of his face, rode fair Ascanius on a fiery steed, Queen Dido's gift, and of the Tyrian breed. 
Sure coursers for the rest the king ordains, With golden bits adorned, and purple reins. The pleased spectators peals of shouts renew, And all the parents in the children view, Their make, their motions, and their sprightly grace, And hopes and fears alternate in their face. The unfledged commanders in their martial train First make the circuit of the sandy plain, Around their sires and at the appointed sign, Drawn up in beauteous order form a line. The second signal sounds, the troop divides In three distinguished parts, with three distinguished guides. Again they close, and once again disjoin, In troop to troop opposed, and line to line. They meet, they wheel, they throw their darts afar, With harmless rage and well-dissembled war. Then and around the mingled bodies run, Flying they follow, and pursuing shun, Broken they break, and rallying they renew, In other forms the military show. At last, in order, undiscerned they join, And march together in a friendly line. And, as the Cretan labyrinth of old, With wandering ways and many a winding fold, Involved the weary feet without redress, In a round error which denied recess, so fought the Trojan boys in warlike play, Turned and returned, and still a different way. Thus dolphins in the deep each other chase In circles when they swim around the watery race. This game these carousels Ascanius taught, And building Alba to the Latins brought. Showed what he learned, the Latin sires impart To their succeeding sons the graceful art. From these imperial Rome received the game, which Troy, the youths, the Trojan troop, they name. Thus far the sacred sports they celebrate, but fortune soon resumed her ancient hate. For while they pay the dead his annual dues, those envied rites Saturnian Juno views, and sends the goddess of the various bow to try new methods of revenge below, supplies the winds to wing her airy way, wherein the port secure the navy lay. Swiftly, fair Iris down her arch descends, and, undiscerned, her fatal voyage ends. She saw the gathering crowd, and gliding thence, the desert shore and fleet without defence, the Trojan matrons on the sands alone, with sighs and tears and Caeses' death bemoan. Then turning to the sea their weeping eyes, their pity to themselves renews their cries. Alas, said one, what oceans yet remain for us to sail, what labors to sustain. All take the word, and with a general groan, implore the gods for peace, and places of their own. The goddess, great in mischief, views their pains, and in a woman's form her heavenly limbs restrains. In face and shape old Beroe she became, Doriclus' wife, a venerable dame, once blessed with riches and a mother's name, thus changed amidst the crying crowd she ran, mixed with the matrons, and these words began, O wretched we whom not the Grecian power nor flames destroyed in Troy's unhappy hour, O wretched we, reserved by cruel fate beyond the ruins of the sinking state, now seven revolving years are wholly run since this improsperous voyage we begun, since tossed from shores to shores, from lands to lands, inhospitable rocks and barren sands, wandering in exile through the stormy sea, we search in vain for flying Italy. Now cast by fortune on this kindred land, what should our rest and rising walls withstand, or hinder here to fix our banished band? O country lost and gods redeemed in vain, if still in endless exile we remain. Shall we no more the Trojan walls renew, Or streams of some dissembled Simois view? Haste, join with me, the unhappy fleet consume. Cassandra bids, and I declare her doom. In sleep I saw her, she supplied my hands, For this I more than dreamt with flaming brands. With these, said she, these wandering ships destroy, These are your fatal seats, and this your Troy. Time calls you now, the precious hour employ, slack not the good presage, while heaven inspires our minds to dare and gives the ready fires. 
see neptune's altars minister their brands the god is pleased the god supplies our hands then from the pile a flaming fire she drew and tossed in air amidst the galleys threw wrapped in amaze the matrons wildly stare then pyrgo reverenced for her hoary hair pyrgo the nurse of priam's numerous race no beroe this though she belies her face what terrors from her frowning front arise behold a goddess in her ardent eyes what rays around her heavenly face are seen mark her majestic voice and more than mortal mien beroe but now i left whom pined with pain her age and anguish from these rites detain she said the matrons seized with new amaze roll their malignant eyes and on the navy gaze they fear and hope and neither part obey they hope the fated land but fear the fatal way the goddess having done her task below mounts up on equal wings and bends her painted bow struck with the sight and seized with rage divine the matrons prosecute their mad design they shriek aloud they snatch with impious hands the food of altars fires and flaming brands green boughs and saplings mingled in their haste and smoking torches on the ships they cast the flame unstopped at first more fury gains and vulcan rides at large with loosened reins triumphant to the painted sterns he soars and seizes in this way the banks and crackling oars eumelus was the first the news to bear while yet they crowd the rural theatre then what they hear is witnessed by their eyes a storm of sparkles and of flames arise ascanius took the alarm while yet he led his early warriors on his prancing steed and spurring on his equals soon o'erpassed nor could his frighted friends reclaim his haste soon as the royal youth appeared in view he sent his voice before him as he flew what madness moves you matrons to destroy the last remainders of unhappy troy not hostile fleets but your own hopes you burn and on your friends your fatal fury turn behold your own ascanius while he said he drew his glittering helmet from his head in which the youths to sportful arms he led by this aeneas and his train appear and now the women seized with shame and fear dispersed to woods and caverns take their flight abhor their actions and avoid the light their friends acknowledge and their error find and shake the goddess from their altered mind not so the raging fires their fury cease but lurking in the seams with seeming peace work on their way amid the smouldering tow sure in destruction but in motion slow the silent plague through the green timber eats and vomits out a tardy flame by fits down to the keels and upward to the sails the fire descends or mounts but still prevails nor buckets poured nor strength of human hand can the victorious element withstand the pious hero rends his robe and throws to heaven his hands and with his hands his vows o jove he cried if prayers can yet have place if thou abhorst not all the darden race if any spark of pity still remain if gods are gods and not invoked in vain yet spare the relics of the trojan train yet from the flames are burning vessels free or let thy fury fall alone on me at this devoted head thy thunder throw and send the willing sacrifice below scarce had he said when southern storms arise from pole to pole the forky lightning flies loud rattling shakes the mountains and the plain heaven bellies downward and descends in rain whole sheets of water from the clouds are sent which hissing through the planks the flames prevent and stop the fiery pest four ships alone burn to the waste and for the fleet atone but doubtful thoughts the hero's heart divide if he should still in sicily reside forgetful of his fates or tempt the main in hope the promised italy to gain the nautes old and wise to whom alone the will of heaven by pallas was foreshown versed in portents experienced and inspired to tell events and what the fates required thus while he stood to neither part inclined 
with cheerful words relieved his laboring mind o goddess born resigned in every state with patience bear with prudence push your fate by suffering well our fortune we subdue fly when she frowns and when she calls pursue your friend acestes is of trojan kind to him disclose the secrets of your mind trust in his hands your old and useless train too numerous for the ships which yet remain the feeble old indulgent of their ease the dames who dread the dangers of the seas with all the dastard crew who dare not stand the shock of battle with your foes by land here you may build a common town for all and from acestes name acesta call the reasons with his friends experience joined encouraged much but more disturbed his mind twas dead of night when to his slumbering eyes his father's shade descended from the skies and thus he spoke o oh, more than vital breath loved while i lived and dear even after death o oh, son in various toils and troubles tossed the king of heaven employs my careful ghost on his commands the god who saved from fire your flaming fleet and heard your just desire the wholesome counsel of your friend receive and here the coward train and woman leave the chosen youth and those who nobly dare transport to tempt the dangers of the war the stern italians will their courage try rough are their manners and their minds are high but first to pluto's palace you shall go and seek my shade among the blest below for not with impious ghosts my soul remains nor suffers with the damned perpetual pains but breathes the living air of soft elysian plains the chaste sibylla shall your steps convey and blood of offered victims free the way there shall you know what realms the gods assign and learn the fates and fortunes of your line but now farewell i vanish with the night and feel the blast of heaven's approaching light he said and mixed with shades he took his airy flight whither so fast the filial duty cried and why ah oh, why the wish to embrace denied he said and rose as holy zeal inspires he rakes hot embers and renews the fires his country gods and vesta then adores with cakes and incense and their aid implores next for his friends and royal host he sent revealed his vision and the gods intent with his own purpose all without delay the will of jove and his desires obey they list with women each degenerate name who dares not hazard life for future fame these they cashier the brave remaining few oars banks and cables half consumed renew the prince designs a city with the plough the lots their several tenements allow this part is named from ilium that from troy and the new king ascends the throne with joy a chosen senate from the people draws appoints the judges and ordains the laws then on the top of eryx they begin a rising temple to the paphian queen anchises last is honored as a god a priest is added annual gifts bestowed and groves are planted round his blessed abode nine days they pass in feasts their temples crowned and fumes of incense in the fanes abound then from the south arose a gentle breeze that curled the smoothness of the glassy seas the rising winds a ruffling gale afford and call the merry mariners aboard now loud laments along the shores resound of parting friends in close embraces bound the trembling women the degenerate train who shunned the frightful dangers of the main even those desire to sail and take their share of the rough passage and the promised war whom good aeneas cheers and recommends to their new master's care his fearful friends on eric's altars three fat calves he lays a lamb new fallen to the stormy seas then slips his halsers and his anchors weighs high on the deck the godlike hero stands with olive crowned a charger in his hands then cast the reeking entrails in the brine and poured the sacrifice of purple wine fresh gales arise with equal strokes they vie 
and brush the buxom seas and o'er the billows fly meantime the mother goddess full of fears to neptune thus addressed with tender tears the pride of jove's imperious queen the rage the malice which no sufferings can assuage compel me to these prayers since neither fate nor time nor pity can remove her hate even jove is thwarted by his haughty wife still vanquished yet she still renews the strife as if twere little to consume the town which awed the world and wore the imperial crown she prosecutes the ghost of troy with pains and gnaws even to the bones the last remains let her the causes of her hatred tell but you can witness its effects too well you saw the storm she raised on libyan floods that mixed the mounting billows with the clouds when bribing aeolus she shook the main and moved rebellion in your watery reign with fury she possessed the dardan dames to burn their fleet with execrable flames and forced aeneas when his ships were lost to leave his followers on a foreign coast for what remains your godhead i implore and trust my son to your protecting power if neither jove's nor fate's decree withstand secure his passage to the latian land then thus the mighty ruler of the main what may not venus hope from neptune's reign my kingdom claims your birth my late defence of your endangered fleet may claim your confidence nor less by land than sea my deeds declare how much your loved aeneas is my care thee xanthus and thee simois i attest your trojan troops when proud achilles pressed and drove before him headlong on the plain and dashed against the walls the trembling train when floods were filled with bodies of the slain when crimson xanthus doubtful of his way stood up on ridges to behold the sea new heaps came tumbling in and choked his way when your aeneas fought but fought with odds of force unequal and unequal gods i spread a cloud before the victor's sight sustained the vanquished and secured his flight even then secured him when i sought with joy the vowed destruction of ungrateful troy my will's the same fair goddess fear no more your fleet shall safely gain the latian shore their lives are given one destined head alone shall perish and for multitudes atone thus having armed with hopes her anxious mind his finny team saturnian neptune joined then adds the foamy bridle to their jaws and to the loosened reins permits the laws high on the waves as as your car he guides its axles thunder and the sea subsides and the smooth ocean rolls her silent tides the tempests fly before their father's face trains of inferior gods his triumph grace and monster whales before their master play and choirs of tritons crowd the watery way the marshalled powers in equal troops divide to right and left the gods his better side enclose and on the worse the nymphs and nereids ride now smiling hope with sweet vicissitude within the hero's mind his joys renewed he calls to raise the masts the sheets display the cheerful crew with diligence obey they scud before the wind and sail in open sea ahead of all the master pilot steers and as he leads the following navy veers the steeds of night had travelled half the sky the drowsy rowers on their benches lie when the soft god of sleep with easy flight descends and draws behind a trail of light thou palinurus art his destined prey to thee alone he takes his fatal way dire dreams to thee and iron sleep he bears and lighting on thy prow the form of forbus wears then thus the traitor god began his tale the winds my friend inspire a pleasing gale the ships without thy care securely sail now steal an hour of sweet repose and i will take the rudder and thy room supply to whom the yawning pilot half asleep 
me dost thou bid to trust the treacherous deep the harlot smiles of her dissembling face and to her faith commit the trojan race shall i believe the siren south again and oft betrayed not know the monster main he said his fastened hands the rudder keep and fixed on heaven his eyes repel invading sleep the god was wroth and at his temples threw a branch in leaf dipped and drunk with stygian dew the pilot vanquished by the power divine soon closed his swimming eyes and lay supine scarce were his limbs extended at their length the god insulting with superior strength fell heavy on him plunged him in the sea and with the stern the rudder tore away headlong he fell and struggling in the main cried out for helping hands but cried in vain the victor daimon mounts obscure in air while the ship sails without the pilot's care on neptune's faith the floating fleet relies but what the man forsook the god supplies and o'er the dangerous deep secure the navy flies glides by the siren's cliffs a shelfy coast long infamous for ships and sailors lost and white with bones the impetuous ocean roars and rocks rebellow from the sounding shores the watchful hero felt the knocks and found the tossing vessel sailed on shoaly ground sure of his pilot's loss he takes himself the helm and steers aloof and shuns the shelf inly he grieved and groaning from the breast deplored his death and thus his pain expressed for faith reposed on seas and on the flattering sky thy naked corpse is doomed on shores unknown to lie end of section ten section eleven of the aeneid of virgil this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil, translated by John Dryden. Book Six, Part One. He said and wept, then spread his sails before the winds and reached at length the Cumaean shore. Their anchors dropped, his crew the vessels moor. They turn their heads to sea, their sterns to land, and greet with greedy joy the Italian strand. Some strike from clashing flints their fiery seed, some gather sticks the kindled flames to feed, or search for hollow trees and fell the woods, or trace through valleys the discovered floods. Thus, while their several charges they fulfill, the pious prince ascends the sacred hill, where Phoebus is adored and seeks the shade which hides from sight his venerable maid. Deep in a cave the Sibyl makes abode, thence full of fate returns and of the god. Through Trivia's grove they walk, and now behold, and enter now the temple roofed with gold. When Daedalus, to fly the Cretan shore, his heavy limbs on jointed pinions bore, the first who sailed in air, tis sung by fame, to the Cumaean coast at length he came, and here alighting built this costly frame. Inscribed to Phoebus, here he hung on high the steerage of his wings that cut the sky. Then o'er the lofty gate his art embossed, Androgeus's death and offerings to his ghost. Seven youths from Athens yearly sent to meet the fate appointed by revengeful Crete, and next to those the dreadful urn was placed, in which the destined names by lots were cast. The mournful parents stand around in tears, and rising Crete against their shore appears. There, too, in living sculpture might be seen the mad affection of the Cretan queen, then how she cheats her bellowing lover's eye, the rushing leap, the doubtful progeny, the lower part a beast, a man above, the monument of their polluted love. Not far from thence he graved the wondrous maze, A thousand doors, a thousand winding ways. 
Here dwells the monster, hid from human view, Not to be found, but by the faithful clue. Till the kind artist, moved with pious grief, Lent to the loving maid this last relief, And all those erring paths described so well, That Theseus conquered, and the monster fell. Here hapless Icarus had found his part, Had not the father's grief restrained his art, he twice assayed to cast his son in gold, Twice from his hands he dropped the forming mould. All this with wondering eyes Aeneas viewed, Each varying object his delight renewed, Eager to read the rest. Achates came, and by his side the mad divining dame, The priestess of the god Deifobe her name. Time suffers not, she said, to feed your eyes with empty pleasures, Haste the sacrifice. Seven bullocks yet unyoked for Phoebus choose, And for Diana seven unspotted ewes. This said, the servants urge the sacred rites, While to the temple she the prince invites. A spacious cave within its farmost part Was hewed and fashioned by laborious art, Through the hill's hollow sides before the place a hundred doors, a hundred entries grace. As many voices issue, and the sound of Sibyl's words as many times rebound. Now to the mouth they come. Aloud she cries, This is the time. Inquire your destinies. He comes. Behold the god. Thus while she said, and shivering at the sacred entry stayed, her color changed, her face was not the same and hollow groans from her deep spirit came. Her hair stood up, convulsive rage possessed her trembling limbs and heaved her laboring breast. Greater than humankind she seemed to look, and with an accent more than mortal spoke. Her staring eyes with sparkling fury roll, when all the god came rushing on her soul. Swiftly she turned, and foaming as she spoke, Why this delay? she cried. The powers invoke, thy prayers alone can open this abode, else vain are my demands, and dumb the god. She said no more. The trembling Trojans hear, or spread with a damp sweat and holy fear. The prince himself with awful dread possessed, his vows to great Apollo thus addressed. Indulgent god, propitious power to Troy, swift to relieve, unwilling to destroy, Directed by whose hand the dart and dart Pierced the proud Grecian's only mortal part. Thus far by fate's decrees and thy commands, Through ambient seas and through devouring sands, Our exiled crew has sought the Ausonian ground, And now at length the flying coast is found. Thus far the fate of Troy from place to place With fury has pursued her wandering race. Here cease ye powers, and let your vengeance end. Troy is no more, and can no more offend. And thou, O sacred maid, inspired to see the event of things in dark futurity, give me what heaven has promised to my fate, to conquer and command the Latian state, to fix my wandering gods and find a place for the long exiles of the Trojan race. Then shall my grateful hands a temple rear To the twin gods with vows and solemn prayer, And annual rites and festivals and games Shall be performed to their auspicious names. Nor shalt thou want thy honours in my land, For there thy faithful oracles shall stand, Preserved in shrines and every sacred lay Which by thy mouth Apollo shall convey. All shall be treasured by a chosen train of holy priests, and ever shall remain. But, O, oh, commit not thy prophetic mind to flitting leaves, the sport of every wind, lest they disperse in air our empty fate. Write not, but what the powers ordain, relate. Struggling in vain, impatient of her load, and laboring underneath the ponderous god, the more she strove to shake him from her breast, with more and far superior force he pressed commands his entrance, and without control usurps her organs and inspires her soul. Now with a furious blast the hundred doors ope of themselves, 
A rushing whirlwind roars within the cave, and Sibyl's voice restores. Escaped the dangers of the watery rain, yet more and greater ills by land remain. The coast so long desired, nor doubt the event, thy troops shall reach, but having reached, repent. Wars, horrid wars, I view, a field of blood, and Tiber rolling with a purple flood. Simois nor Xanthus shall be wanting there, a new Achilles shall in arms appear, and he too goddess-born. Fierce Juno's hate, added to hostile force, shall urge thy fate. To what strange nations shalt not thou resort, driven to solicit aid at every court? The cause the same which Ilium once oppressed, a foreign mistress and a foreign guest. But thou, secure of soul, unbent with woes, the more thy fortune frowns, the more oppose. The dawnings of thy safety shall be shown, from whence thou least shalt hope a Grecian town. Thus from the dark recess the sibyl spoke, and the resisting air the thunder broke. The cave rebellowed and the temple shook. The ambiguous god who ruled her laboring breast in these mysterious words his mind expressed. Some truths revealed, in terms involved the rest. At length her fury fell, her foaming ceased, and ebbing in her soul the god decreased. Then thus the chief, No terror to my view, no frightful face of danger can be new. Inured to suffer and resolved to dare, the fates without my power shall be without my care. This let me crave, since near your grove the road to hell lies open, and the dark abode, which Acheron surrounds, the innavigable flood, conduct me through the regions void of light, and lead me longing to my father's sight. For him a thousand dangers I have sought, and rushing where the thickest Grecians fought, safe on my back the sacred burthen brought. He for my sake the raging ocean tried, and wrath of heaven my still auspicious guide, and bore beyond the strength decrepit age supplied. Oft since he breathed his last, in dead of night his reverend image stood before my sight, enjoined to seek below his holy shade, conducted there by your unerring aid. But you, if pious minds by prayers are won, Oblige the father and protect the son. Yours is the power, nor Proserpine in vain Has made you priestess of her nightly reign. If Orpheus, armed with his enchanting lyre, The ruthless king with pity could inspire, And from the shades below redeem his wife, If Pollux, offering his alternate life, Could free his brother and can daily go By turns aloft, by turns descend below. Why name I Theseus or his greater friend, Who trod the downward path and upward could ascend? Not less than theirs from Jove my lineage came, My mother greater, my descent the same. So prayed the Trojan prince, And while he prayed, his hand upon the holy altar laid. Then thus replied the prophetess divine, O goddess born of great Anchises' line, the gates of hell are open night and day. Smooth the descent, and easy is the way. But to return, and view the cheerful skies, In this the task and mighty labor lies. To few great Jupiter imparts this grace, And those of shining worth and heavenly race. Betwixt those regions and our upper light, Deep forests and impenetrable night, Possess the middle space. The infernal bounds Cocytus with his sable waves surrounds. But if so dire a love your soul invades, As twice below to view the trembling shades, If you so hard a toil will undertake, As twice to pass the innavigable lake, Receive my counsel. In the neighboring grove there stands a tree. The queen of Stygian Jove claims it her own, Thick woods and gloomy night conceal the happy plant from human sight. One bough it bears, but, wondrous to behold, 
the ductile rind and leaves of radiant gold this from the vulgar branches must be torn and to fair proserpine the present born ere leave be given to tempt the nether skies the first thus rent a second will arise and the same metal the same room supplies look round the wood with lifted eyes to see the lurking gold upon the fatal tree then rend it off as holy rites command the willing metal will obey thy hand following with ease if favoured by thy fate thou art foredoomed to view the stygian state if not no labour can the tree constrain and strength of stubborn arms and steel are vain besides you know not while you here attend the unworthy fate of your unhappy friend breathless he lies and his unburied ghost deprived of funeral rites pollutes your host pay first his pious dues and for the dead two sable sheep around his hearse be led then living turfs upon his body lay this done securely take the destined way to find the regions destitute of day she said and held her peace aeneas went sad from the cave and full of discontent unknowing whom the sacred sibyl meant achates the companion of his breast goes grieving by his side with equal cares oppressed walking they talked and fruitlessly divined what friend the priestess by those words designed but soon they found an object to deplore Mycenus lay extended on the shore son of the god of winds none so renowned the warrior trumpet in the field to sound with breathing brass to kindle fierce alarms and rouse to dare their fate in honourable arms he served great hector and was ever near not with his trumpet only but his spear but by pelides arms when hector fell he chose aeneas and he chose as well swollen with applause and aiming still at more he now provokes the sea-gods from the shore with envy triton heard the martial sound and the bold champion for his challenge drowned then cast his mangled carcass on the strand the gazing crowd around the body stand all weep but most aeneas mourns his fate and hastens to perform the funeral state in altar wise a stately pile they rear the basis broad below and top advanced in air an ancient wood fit for the work designed the shady covert of the savage kind the trojans found the sounding axe is plied firs pines and pitch trees and the towering pride of forest ashes feel the fatal stroke and piercing wedges cleave the stubborn oak huge trunks of trees felled from the steepy crown of the bare mountains roll with ruin down armed like the rest the trojan prince appears and by his pious labour urges theirs thus while he wrought revolving in his mind the ways to compass what his wish designed he cast his eyes upon the gloomy grove and then with vows implored the queen of love o oh, may thy power propitious still to me conduct my steps to find the fatal tree in this deep forest since the sibyl's breath foretold alas too true Mycenaeus death scarce had he said when full before his sight two doves descending from their airy flight secure upon the grassy plain alight he knew his mother's birds and thus he prayed be you my guides with your auspicious aid and lead my footsteps till the branch be found whose glittering shadow gilds the sacred ground and thou great parent with celestial care in this distress be present to my prayer thus having said he stopped with watchful sight observing still the motions of their flight what course they took what happy signs they shew they fed and fluttering by degrees withdrew still farther from the place but still in view hopping and flying thus they led him on to the slow lake whose baleful stench to shun they winged their flight aloft then stooping low 
perched on the double tree that bears the golden bough through the green leaves the glittering shadows glow as on the sacred oak the wintry mistletoe where the proud mother views her precious brood and happier branches which she never sowed such was the glittering such the ruddy rind and dancing leaves that wantoned in the wind he seized the shining bough with griping hold and rent away with ease the lingering gold then to the sibyl's palace bore the prize meantime the trojan troops with weeping eyes to dead Mecenas pay his obsequies first from the ground a lofty pile they rear of pitch trees oaks and pines and unctuous fir the fabric's front with cypress twigs they strew and stick the sides with boughs of baleful yew the topmost part his glittering arms adorn warm waters then in brazen cauldrons borne are poured to wash his body joint by joint and fragrant oils the stiffened limbs anoint with groans and cries Mecenas they deplore then on a bier with purple covered o'er the breathless body thus bewailed they lay and fire the pile their faces turned away such reverend rites their fathers used to pay pure oil and incense on the fire they throw and fat of victims which his friends bestow these gifts the greedy flames to dust devour then on the living coals red wine they pour and last the relics by themselves dispose which in a brazen urn the priests enclose old corineus compassed thrice the crew and dipped an olive branch in holy dew which thrice he sprinkled round and thrice aloud invoked the dead and then dismissed the crowd but good aeneas ordered on the shore a stately tomb whose top a trumpet bore a soldier's falchion at a seaman's oar thus was his friend interred and deathless fame still to the lofty cape consigns his name these rites performed the prince without delay hastes to the nether world his destined way deep was the cave and downward as it went from the wide mouth a rocky rough descent and here the access a gloomy grove defends and there the innavigable lake extends o'er whose unhappy waters void of light no bird presumes to steer his airy flight such deadly stenches from the depths arise and steaming sulphur that infects the skies from hence the grecian bards their legends make and give the name avernus to the lake four sable bullocks in the yoke untaught for sacrifice the pious hero brought the priestess pours the wine betwixt their horns then cuts the curling hair that first oblation burns invoking hecate hither to repair a powerful name in hell and upper air the sacred priests with ready knives bereave the beasts of life and in full bowls receive the streaming blood a lamb to hell and night the sable wool without a streak of white aeneas offers and by fate's decree a barren heifer pine to thee with holocausts he pluto's altar fills seven brawny bulls with his own hand he kills then on the broiling entrails oil he pours which anointed thus the raging flame devours late the nocturnal sacrifice begun nor ended till the next returning sun then earth began to bellow trees to dance and howling dogs in glimmering light advance ere hecate came far hence be souls profane the sibyl cried and from the grove abstain now trojan take the way thy fates afford assume thy courage and unsheathe thy sword she said and passed along the gloomy space the prince pursued her steps with equal pace ye realms yet unrevealed to human sight ye gods who rule the regions of the night ye gliding ghosts permit me to relate the mystic wonders of your silent state 
Obscure they went through dreary shades that led along the waste dominions of the dead. Thus wander travelers in woods by night, by the moon's doubtful and malignant light, when Jove in dusky clouds involves the skies, and the faint crescent shoots by fits before their eyes. Just in the gate and in the jaws of hell revengeful cares and sullen sorrows dwell, and pale diseases and repining age, want, fear, and famine's unresisted rage. Here toils and death and death's half-brother sleep, forms terrible to view their sentry keep with anxious pleasures of a guilty mind deep frauds before and open force behind the fury's iron beds and strife that shakes her hissing tresses and unfolds her snakes full in the midst of this infernal road an elm displays her dusky arms abroad the god of sleep there hides his heavy head and empty dreams on every leaf are spread. Of various forms, unnumbered spectres more, centaurs and double shapes besiege the door. Before the passage, horrid Hydra stands, and Briareus with his hundred hands, Gorgons, Geryon with his triple frame, and vain Chimera vomits empty flame. The chief unsheathed his shining steel, prepared though seized with sudden fear to force the guard, offering his brandished weapon at their face, had not the sibyl stopped his eager pace, and told him what those empty phantoms were, forms without bodies and impassive air. Hence to deep Acheron they take their way, whose troubled eddies, thick with ooze and clay, are whirled aloft and in Cocytus lost, there Charon stands, who rules the dreary coast, a sordid god. Down from his hoary chin a length of beard descends, uncombed, unclean, his eyes like hollow furnaces on fire. A girdle, foul with grease, binds his obscene attire. He spreads his canvas, with his pole he steers, the freights of flitting ghosts in his thin bottom bears. He looked in years, yet in his years were seen a youthful vigor and autumnal green. An airy crowd came rushing where he stood, which filled the margin of the fatal flood. Husbands and wives, boys and unmarried maids, and mighty heroes more majestic shades and youths entombed before their father's eyes with hollow groans and shrieks and feeble cries thick as the leaves in autumn strow the woods or fowls by winter forced forsake the floods and wing their hasty flight to happier lands such and so thick the shivering army stands and press for passage with extended hands now these, now those, the surly boatman bore. The rest he drove to distance from the shore. The hero, who beheld with wandering eyes the tumult mixed with shrieks, laments, and cries, asked of his guide what the rude concourse meant, why to the shore the thronging people bent, what forms of law among the ghosts were used, why some were ferried o'er and some refused. Son of Anchises, offspring of the gods, the sibyl said, you see the Stygian floods. The sacred stream which heaven's imperial state attests in oaths and fears to violate. The ghosts rejected are the unhappy crew deprived of sepulchres and funeral due. The boatman Charon, those the buried host, he ferries over to the farther coast nor dares his transport vessel cross the waves with such whose bones are not composed in graves. A hundred years they wander on the shore, at length their penance done are wafted o'er. The Trojan chief his forward pace repressed, revolving anxious thoughts within his breast. He saw his friends who, whelmed beneath the waves, their funeral honors claimed and asked their quiet graves. The lost Lucaspis in the crowd he knew, 
and the brave leader of the Lycian crew, whom on the Tyrene seas the tempests met, the sailors mastered and the ship o'erset. Amidst the spirits Polynorus pressed, yet fresh from life a new admitted guest, who while he steering viewed the stars and bore his course from Afric to the Latian shore, fell headlong down. The Trojan fixed his view, and scarcely through the gloom the sullen shadow knew. Then thus the prince, What envious power, O friend, brought your loved life to this disastrous end? For Phoebus, ever true in all he said, has in your fate alone my faith betrayed. The god foretold you should not die before you reached, secure from seas the Italian shore. Is this the unerring power? The ghost replied, Nor Phoebus flattered, nor his answers lied, nor envious gods have sent me to the deep, but while the stars and course of heaven I keep, my wearied eyes were seized with fatal sleep. I fell, and with my weight the helm constrained was drawn along, which yet my grip retained. Now by the winds and raging waves I swear your safety more than mine was then my care. Lest of the guide bereft the rudder lost, your ship should run against the rocky coast. Three blustering nights, borne by the southern blast, I floated and discovered land at last. High on a mounting wave my head I bore, forcing my strength and gathering to the shore. Panting, but past the danger, now I seized the craggy cliffs, and my tired members eased. While cumbered with my dropping clothes I lay, the cruel nation covetous of prey, stained with my blood the unhospitable coast. And now by winds and waves my lifeless limbs are tossed, which, O oh, avert by yon ethereal light, which I have lost for this eternal night. Or, if by dearer ties you may be won, by your dead sire and by your living son, redeem from this reproach my wandering ghost, or with your navy seek the velin coast, and in a peaceful grave my corpse compose. Or, if a nearer way your mother shows, without whose aid you durst not undertake this frightful passage o'er the Stygian lake, lend to this wretch your hand, and waft him o'er to the sweet banks of yon forbidden shore. Scarce had he said, the prophetess began. What hopes delude thee, miserable man? Think'st thou, thus unentombed, to cross the floods, to view the furies and infernal gods, and visit without leave the dark abodes? Attend the term of long revolving years, fate and the dooming gods are deaf to tears. This comfort of thy dire misfortune take, the wrath of heaven inflicted for thy sake, with vengeance shall pursue the inhuman coast, till they propitiate thy offended ghost, and raise a tomb with vows and solemn prayer, and Palinurus' name the place shall bear. This calmed his cares, soothed with his future fame, and pleased to hear his propagated name. Now nearer to the Stygian lake they draw, whom from the shore the surly boatman saw, observed their passage through the shady wood, and marked their near approaches to the flood. Then thus he called aloud, inflamed with wrath, Mortal, whate'er who this forbidden path in arms presumes to tread, I charge thee stand and tell thy name and business in the land. Know this, the realm of night, the Stygian shore, my boat conveys no living bodies o'er, nor was I pleased great Theseus once to bear, who forced a passage with his pointed spear, nor strong Alcides, men of mighty fame, and from the immortal gods their lineage came. In fetters won the barking porter tied, And took him trembling from his sovereign's side, Too sought by force to seize his beauteous bride. 
to whom the sibyl thus compose thy mind nor frauds are here contrived nor force designed still may the dog the wandering troops constrain of airy ghosts and vex the guilty train and with her grisly lord his lovely queen remain the trojan chief whose lineage is from jove much famed for arms and more for filial love is sent to seek his sire in your elysian grove if neither piety nor heaven's command can gain his passage to the stygian strand this fatal present shall prevail at least then showed the shining bow concealed within her vest no more was needful for the gloomy god stood mute with awe to see the golden rod admired the destined offering to his queen a venerable gift so rarely seen his fury thus appeased he puts to land the ghosts forsake their seats at his command he clears the deck receives the mighty freight the leaky vessel groans beneath the weight slowly she sails and scarcely stems the tides the pressing water pours within her sides his passengers at length are wafted o'er exposed in muddy weeds upon the miry shore no sooner landed in his den they found the triple porter of the stygian sound grim cerberus who soon began to rear his crested snakes and armed his bristling hair the prudent sibyl had before prepared a sop in honey steeped to charm the guard which mixed with powerful drugs she cast before his greedy grinning jaws just oped to roar with three enormous mouths he gapes and straight with hunger pressed devours the pleasing bait long draughts of sleep his monstrous limbs enslave he reels and falling fills the spacious cave the keeper charmed the chief without delay passed on and took the irremeable way before the gates the cries of babes new-born whom fate had from their tender mothers torn assault his ears then those whom form of laws condemned to die when traitors judged their cause nor want they lots nor judges to review the wrongful sentence and award anew minos the strict inquisitor appears and lives and crimes with his assessors hears round in his urn the blended balls he rolls absolves the just and dooms the guilty souls the next in place and punishment are they who prodigally throw their souls away fools who repining at their wretched state and loathing anxious life suborned their fate with late repentance now they would retrieve the bodies they forsook and wish to live their pains and poverty desire to bear to view the light of heaven and breathe the vital air but fate forbids the stygian floods oppose and with circling streams the captive souls enclose end of section 11section 12 of the aeneid of virgil this librivox recording is in the public domain book 6 part 2 not far from thence the mournful fields appear so called from lovers that inhabit there the souls whom that unhappy flame invades in secret solitude and myrtle shades make endless moans and pining with desire lament too late their unextinguished fire here procris eriphile here he found bearing her breast yet bleeding with the wound made by her son he saw pasiphae there with phaedra's ghost a foul incestuous pair there laodamia with avadne moves unhappy both but loyal in their loves Cyneus, a woman once and once a man but ending in the sex she first began not far from these phoenician dido stood fresh from her wound her bosom bathed in blood whom when the trojan hero hardly knew obscure in shades and with a doubtful view doubtful is he who sees through dusky night or thinks he sees the moon's uncertain light 
With tears he first approached the sullen shade, and as his love inspired him thus he said, Unhappy queen, then is the common breath of rumor true in your reported death, and I, alas, the cause. By heaven I vow, and all the powers that rule the realms below, unwilling I forsook your friendly state, commanded by the gods and forced by fate. Those gods, that fate whose unresisted might have sent me to these regions void of light, through the vast empire of eternal night. Nor dared I to presume that, pressed with grief, my flight should urge you to this dire relief. Stay, stay your steps, and listen to my vows. Tis the last interview that fate allows. In vain he thus attempts her mind to move, with tears and prayers and late repenting love. Disdainfully she looked, then turning round, but fixed her eyes unmoved upon the ground. And what he says and swears regards no more than the deaf rocks when the loud billows roar. But whirled away to shun his hateful sight, hid in the forest and the shades of night. Then sought Sichaeus through the shady grove, who answered all her cares and equalled all her love. Some pious tears the pitying hero paid, and followed with his eyes the flitting shade, then took the forward way by fate ordained, and with his guide the farther fields attained, where severed from the rest the warrior souls remained. Tydeus he met with Meleager's race, the pride of armies and the soldier's grace, and pale Adrastus with his ghastly face. Of Trojan chiefs he viewed a numerous train, all much lamented, all in battle slain. Glaucus and Medon, high above the rest, Antenor's sons and Ceres' sacred priest, and proud Idaeus, Priam's charioteer, who shakes his empty reins and aims his airy spear. The gladsome ghosts in circling troops attend and with unwearied eyes behold their friend. Delight to hover near, and long to know what business brought him to the realms below. But Argive chiefs and Agamemnon's train, when his refulgent arms flashed through the shady plain, fled from his well-known face with wonted fear, as when his thundering sword and pointed spear drove headlong to their ships and gleaned the routed rear. They raised a feeble cry with trembling notes, but the weak voice deceived their gasping throats. Here Priam's son Deiphobus he found, whose face and limbs were one continued wound. Dishonest, with lopped arms the youth appears, spoiled of his nose and shortened of his ears. He scarcely knew him, striving to disown his blotted form and blushing to be known. And therefore first began, O Teucer's race, who durst thy faultless figure thus deface? What heart could wish, what hand inflict this dire disgrace? Twas famed that in our last and fatal night your single prowess long sustained the fight, till tired, not forced, a glorious fate you chose, and fell upon a heap of slaughtered foes. But in remembrance of so brave a deed, a tomb and funeral honours I decreed. Thrice called your manes on the Trojan plains, the place your armour and your name retains. Your body too I sought, and had I found designed for burial in your native ground. The ghost replied, Your piety has paid all needful rites to rest my wandering shade. But cruel fate and my more cruel wife to grecian swords betrayed my sleeping life these are the monuments of helen's love the shame i bear below the marks i bore above you know in what deluding joys we passed the night that was by heaven decreed our last for when the fatal horse descending down pregnant with arms o'erwhelmed the unhappy town she feigned nocturnal orgies, left my bed, and mixed with Trojan dames the dances led. Then waving high her torch the signal made, 
which roused the Grecians from their ambuscade. With watching, overworn, with cares oppressed, unhappy I had laid me down to rest, and heavy sleep my weary limbs possessed. Meantime my worthy wife our arms mislaid, and from beneath my head my sword conveyed. The door unlatched, and with repeated calls invites her former lord within my walls. Thus in her crime her confidence she placed, and with new treasons would redeem the past. What need I more? Into the room they ran, and meanly murdered a defenceless man. Ulysses, basely born, first led the way, avenging powers with justice if I pray that fortune be their own another day. But answer you, and in your turn relate, what brought you living to the Stygian state, driven by the winds and errors of the sea, or did you heaven's superior doom obey, or tell what other chance conducts your way, to view with mortal eyes our dark retreats, tumults and torments of the infernal seats? While thus in talk the flying hours they pass, the sun had finished more than half his race, and they, perhaps, in words and tears had spent the little time of stay which heaven had lent. But thus the sibyl chides their long delay. Night rushes down and headlong drives the day. Tis here in different paths the way divides. The right to Pluto's golden palace guides. The left to that unhappy region tends, which to the depth of Tartarus descends, the seat of night profound and punished fiends. Then thus stay Phobos, O sacred maid, forbear to chide, and be your will obeyed. Lo, to the secret shadows I retire, to pay my penance till my years expire. Proceed, auspicious prince, with glory crowned, and born to better fates than I have found. He said, and while he said, his steps he turned to secret shadows, and in silence mourned. The hero, looking on the left, espied a lofty tower, and strong on every side with treble walls, which Phlegathon surrounds, whose fiery flood the burning empire bounds, and pressed betwixt the rocks the bellowing noise resounds, Wide is the fronting gate, and raised on high with adamantine columns threats the sky. Vain is the force of man, and heavens as vain, to crush the pillars which the piles sustain. Sublime on these a tower of steel is reared, and dire Tisiphone there keeps the ward, girt in her sanguine gown by night and day, observant of the souls that pass the downward way. From hence are heard the groans of ghosts, the pains of sounding lashes and of dragging chains. The Trojan stood astonished at their cries, and asked his guide from whence those yells arise, and what the crimes and what the tortures were, and loud laments that rent the liquid air. She thus replied, The chaste and holy race are all forbidden this polluted place. But Hecate, when she gave to rule the woods, then led me trembling through these dire abodes, and taught the tortures of the avenging gods. These are the realms of unrelenting fate, and awful Radamanthus rules the state. He hears and judges each committed crime, inquires into the manner, place, and time. The conscious wretch must all his acts reveal, loath to confess, unable to conceal, from the first moment of his vital breath to his last hour of unrepenting death. Straight o'er the guilty ghost the fury shakes the sounding whip and brandishes her snakes, and the pale sinner with her sisters takes. Then of itself unfolds the eternal door, with dreadful sounds the brazen hinges roar. You see before the gate what stalking ghost commands the guard? What sentries keep the post? More formidable Hydra stands within, Whose jaws with iron teeth severely grin. The gaping gulf low to the centre lies, And twice as deep as earth is distant from the skies. 
the rivals of the gods the titan race here singed with lightning roll within the unfathomed space here lie the alayan twins i saw them both enormous bodies of gigantic growth who dared in fight the thunderer to defy affect his heaven and force him from the sky salmoneus suffering cruel pains i found for emulating jove the rattling sound of mimic thunder and the glittering blaze of pointed lightnings and their forky rays through elis and the grecian towns he flew the audacious wretch four fiery coursers drew he waved a torch aloft and madly vain sought godlike worship from a servile train ambitious fool with horny hoofs to pass o'er hollow arches of resounding brass to rival thunder in its rapid course and imitate inimitable force but he the king of heaven obscure on high bared his red arm and launching from the sky his writhen bolt not shaking empty smoke down to the deep abyss the flaming felon struck there titius was to see who took his birth from heaven his nursing from the foodful earth here his gigantic limbs with large embrace enfold nine acres of infernal space a ravenous vulture in his open side her crooked beak and cruel talons tried still for the growing liver digged his breast the growing liver still supplied the feast still are his entrails fruitful to their pains the immortal hunger lasts the immortal food remains Ixion and Perithus I could name, and more Thessalian chiefs of mighty fame. High o'er their heads a mouldering rock is placed, that promises a fall and shakes at every blast. They lie below on golden beds displayed, and genial feasts with regal pomp are made. The queen of furies by their sides is set, and snatches from their mouths the untasted meat which if they touch her hissing snakes she rears tossing her torch and thundering in their ears then they who brothers better claim disown expel their parents and usurp the throne defraud their clients and to lucre sold sit brooding on unprofitable gold who dare not give and even refuse to lend to their poor kindred or a wanting friend vast is the throng of these nor less the train of lustful youths for foul adultery slain hosts of deserters who their honour sold and basely broke their faith for bribes of gold all these within the dungeon's depth remain despairing pardon and expecting pain ask not what pains nor farther seek to know their process or the forms of law below some roll a weighty stone some laid along and bound with burning wires on spokes of wheels are hung unhappy theseus doomed for ever there is fixed by fate on his eternal chair and wretched phlegias warns the world with cries could warning make the world more just or wise learn righteousness and dread the avenging deities to tyrants others have their country sold imposing foreign lords for foreign gold some have old laws repealed new statutes made not as the people pleased but as they paid with incest some their daughter's bed profaned all dared the worst of ills and what they dared attained had i a hundred mouths a hundred tongues and throats of brass inspired with iron lungs i could not half those horrid crimes repeat nor half the punishments those crimes have met but let us haste our voyage to pursue the walls of pluto's palace are in view the gate and iron arch above it stands on anvils laboured by the cyclops hands before our farther way the fates allow here must we fix on high the golden bough she said and through the gloomy shades they passed and chose the middle path arrived at last the prince with living water sprinkled o'er his limbs and body then approached the door possessed the porch and on the front above he fixed the fatal bow required by pluto's love these holy rites performed they took their way 
where long extended plains of pleasure lay the verdant fields with those of heaven may vie with either vested and a purple sky the blissful seats of happy souls below stars of their own and their own sons they know their airy limbs in sports they exercise and on the green contend the wrestler's prize some in heroic verse divinely sing others in artful measures led the ring the thracian bard surrounded by the rest there stands conspicuous in his flowing vest his flying fingers and harmonious quill strike seven distinguished notes and seven at once they fill here found they two cares hold heroic race born better times and happier years to grace Asaracus and Ilus here enjoy perpetual fame with him who founded troy the chief beheld their chariots from afar their shining arms and coursers trained to war their lances fixed in earth their steeds around free from their harness graze the flowery ground the love of horses which they had alive and care of chariots after death survive some cheerful souls were feasting on the plain some did the song and some the choir maintain beneath a laurel shade where mighty po mounts up to woods above and hides his head below here patriots live who for their country's good in fighting fields were prodigal of blood priests of unblemished lives here make abode and poets worthy their inspiring god and searching wits of more mechanic parts who graced their age with new invented arts those who to worth their bounty did extend and those who knew that bounty to commend the heads of these with holy fillets bound and all their temples were with garlands crowned to these the sibyl thus her speech addressed and first to him surrounded by the rest towering his height and ample was his breast say happy souls divine musaeus say where lives anchises and where lies our way to find the hero for whose only sake we sought the dark abodes and crossed the bitter lake to this the sacred poet thus replied in no fixed place the happy souls reside in groves we live and lie on mossy beds by crystal streams that murmur through the meads but pass yon easy hill and thence descend the path conducts you to your journey's end this said he led them up the mountain's brow and shows them all the shining fields below they wind the hill and through the blissful meadows go but old anchises in a flowery vale reviewed his mustered race and took the tale those happy spirits which ordained by fate for future beings and new bodies wait with studious thought observed the illustrious throng in nature's order as they passed along their names their fates their conduct and their care in peaceful senates and successful war he when aeneas on the plain appears meets him with open arms and falling tears welcome he said the gods undoubted race o oh, long expected to my dear embrace once more tis given me to behold your face the love and pious duty which you pay have passed the perils of so hard a way tis true computing times i now believed the happy day approached nor are my hopes deceived what length of lands what oceans have you passed what storms sustained and on what shores been cast how have i feared your fate but feared it most when love assailed you on the libyan coast to this the filial duty thus replies your sacred ghost before my sleeping eyes appeared and often urged this painful enterprise after long tossing on the tyrene sea my navy rides at anchor in the bay but reach your hand o parent shade nor shun the dear embraces of your longing son he said and falling tears his face bedew then thrice around his neck his arms he threw and thrice the flitting shadow slipped away like winds or empty dreams that fly the day now in a secret vale the trojan sees a separate grove through which a gentle breeze plays with a passing breath 
and whispers through the trees and just before the confines of the wood the gliding leith leads her silent flood about the boughs an airy nation flew thick as the humming bees that hunt the golden dew in summer's heat on tops of lilies feed and creep within their bells to suck the balmy seed the winged army roams the fields around the rivers and the rocks remurmur to the sound aeneas wondering stood then asked the cause which to the stream the crowding people draws then thus the sire the souls that throng the flood are those to whom by fate are other bodies owed in leith's lake they long oblivion taste of future life secure forgetful of the past long has my soul desired this time and place to set before your sight your glorious race that this presaging joy may fire your mind to seek the shores by destiny designed o father can it be that souls sublime return to visit our terrestrial clime and that the generous mind released by death can covet lazy limbs and mortal breath anchises then in order thus began to clear those wonders to his godlike son know first that heaven and earth's compacted frame and flowing waters and the starry flame and both the radiant lights one common soul inspires and feeds and animates the whole this active mind infused through all the space unites and mingles with the mighty mass hence men and beasts the breath of life obtain and birds of air and monsters of the main the ethereal vigor is in all the same and every soul is filled with equal flame as much as earthy limbs and gross allay of mortal members subject to decay blunt not the beams of heaven and edge of day from this coarse mixture of terrestrial parts desire and fear by turns possess their hearts and grief and joy nor can the grovelling mind in the dark dungeon of the limbs confined assert the native skies or own its heavenly kind nor death itself can wholly wash their stains but long contracted filth even in the soul remains the relics of inveterate vice they wear and spots of sin obscene in every face appear for this are various penances enjoined and some are hung to bleach upon the wind some plunged in waters others purged in fires till all the dregs are drained and all the rust expires all have their manes and those manes bear the few so cleansed to these abodes repair and breathe in ample fields the soft elysian air then are they happy when by length of time the scurf is worn away of each committed crime no speck is left of their habitual stains but the pure ether of the soul remains but when a thousand rolling years are past so long their punishments and penance last whole droves of minds are by the driving god compelled to drink the deep lithian flood in large forgetful draughts to steep the cares of their past labours and their irksome years that unremembering of its former pain the soul may suffer mortal flesh again thus having said the father spirit leads the priestess and his son through swarms of shades and takes a rising ground from thence to see the long procession of his progeny survey pursued the sire this airy throng as offered to thy view they pass along these are the italian names which fate will join with ours and graff upon the trojan line observe the youth who first appears in sight and holds the nearest station to the light already seems to snuff the vital air and leans just forward on a shining spear silvius is he thy last begotten race but first in order sent to fill thy place an alban name but mixed with dardan blood born in the covert of a shady wood him fair lavinia thy surviving wife shall breed in groves to lead a solitary life in alba he shall fix his royal seat and born a king a race of kings beget then procus honour of the trojan name capis and numitor of endless fame 
a second Silvius after these appears. Silvius Aeneas for thy name he bears, for arms and justice equally renowned, who late restored in Alba shall be crowned. How great they look, how vigorously they wield their weighty lances and sustain the shield. But they who crowned with oaken wreaths appear shall Gabian walls and strong Fidena rear. Nomentum Bola with Pometia found, and raise collation towers on rocky ground. All these shall then be towns of mighty fame, though now they lie obscure and lands without a name. See Romulus the Great, born to restore the crown that once his injured grandsire wore. This prince a priestess of your blood shall bear, and like his sire in arms he shall appear. Two rising crests his royal head adorn, born from a god himself to godhead born. His sire already signs him for the skies, and marks the seat amidst the deities. Auspicious chief, thy race in times to come shall spread the conquests of imperial Rome. Rome, whose ascending towers shall heaven invade, involving earth and ocean in her shade, high as the mother of the gods in place, and proud like her of an immortal race. Then, when in pomp she makes the Phrygian round, with golden turrets on her temples crowned, a hundred gods her sweeping train supply, her offspring all, and all command the sky. Now fix your sight, and stand intent to see your Roman race and Julian progeny. The mighty Caesar waits his vital hour, impatient for the world, and grasps his promised power. But next, behold the youth of form divine, Caesar himself, exalted in his line. Augustus, promised oft and long foretold, sent to the realm that Saturn ruled of old, born to restore a better age of gold. Africa and India shall his power obey. He shall extend his propagated sway beyond the solar year without the starry way, where Atlas turns the rolling heavens around, and his broad shoulders with their lights are crowned. At his foreseen approach already quake the Caspian kingdoms and Maeotian lake. Their seers behold the tempest from afar, and threatening oracles denounce the war. Nile hears him knocking at his sevenfold gates, and seeks his hidden spring, and fears his nephew's fates. Nor Hercules, more lands or labors knew, not though the brazen-footed hind he slew, freed Aramanthus from the foaming boar, and dipped his arrows in their Nain gore. Nor Bacchus, turning from his Indian war, by tigers drawn triumphant in his car, from Nisus' top descending on the plains, with curling vines around his purple reins. And doubt we yet, through dangers to pursue the paths of honour, and a crown in view? But what's the man, who from afar appears, his head with olive crowned, his hand a censer bears, his hoary beard and holy vestments bring his lost idea back? I know the Roman king. He shall to peaceful Rome new laws ordain, called from his mean abode a sceptre to sustain. Him Tullus next in dignity succeeds, an active prince and prone to martial deeds. He shall his troops for fighting fields prepare, disused to toils and triumphs of the war. By dint of sword his crown he shall increase, and scour his armor from the rust of peace whom Ancus follows with a fawning air, but vain within and proudly popular. Next view the Tarquin kings, the avenging sword of Brutus justly drawn, and Rome restored. He first renews the rods and axe severe, and gives the consuls royal robes to wear. His sons, who seek the tyrant to sustain, and long for arbitrary lords again, with ignominy scourged, in open sight he dooms to death deserved, asserting public right unhappy man to break the pious laws of nature pleading in his children's cause however the doubtful fact is understood tis love of honour and his country's good the consul not the father sheds the blood behold torquatus the same track pursue and next the two devoted dc view 
the drusian line camillus loaded home with standards well redeemed and foreign foes o'ercome the pair you see in equal armor shine now friends below in close embraces join but when they leave the shady realms of night and clothed in bodies breathe your upper light with mortal hate each other shall pursue what wars what wounds what slaughter shall ensue from alpine heights the father first descends his daughter's husband in the plain attends his daughter's husband arms his eastern friends embrace again my sons be foes no more nor stain your country with her children's gore and thou the first lay down thy lawless claim thou of my blood who bearest the julian name another comes who shall in triumph ride and to the capital his chariot guide from conquered corinth rich with grecian spoils and yet another famed for warlike toils on argos shall impose the roman laws and on the greeks revenge the trojan cause shall drag in chains their achillean race shall vindicate his ancestors disgrace and pallas for her violated place great cato there for gravity renowned and conquering cossus goes with laurels crowned who can omit the gracchi who declare the scipio's worth those thunderbolts of war the double bane of carthage who can see without esteem for virtuous poverty severe fabricius or can cease to admire the ploughman consul in his coarse attire tired as i am i praise the fabii claim and thou great hero greatest of thy name ordained in war to save the sinking state and by delays to put a stop to fate let others better mould the running mass of metals and inform the breathing brass and soften into flesh a marble face plead better at the bar describe the skies and when the stars descend and when they rise but rome tis thine alone with awful sway to rule mankind and make the world obey disposing peace and war by thy own majestic way to tame the proud the fettered slave to free these are imperial arts and worthy thee he paused and while with wondering eyes they viewed the passing spirits thus his speech renewed see great marcellus how untired in toils he moves with manly grace how rich with regal spoils he when his country threatened with alarms requires his courage and his conquering arms shall more than once the punic bands affright shall kill the gaulish king in single fight then to the capital in triumph move and the third spoils shall grace Ferretrian jove aeneas here beheld of form divine a godlike youth in glittering armor shine with great marcellus keeping equal pace but gloomy were his eyes dejected was his face he saw and wondering asked his airy guide what and of whence was he who pressed the hero's side his son or one of his illustrious name how like the former and almost the same observe the crowds that compass him around all gaze and all admire and raise a shouting sound but hovering mists around his brows are spread and night with sable shades involves his head seek not to know the ghost replied with tears the sorrows of thy sons in future years this youth the blissful vision of a day shall just be shown on earth and snatched away the gods too high had raised the roman state were but their gifts as permanent as great what groans of men shall fill the martian field how fierce a blaze his flaming pile shall yield what funeral pomp shall floating tiber see when rising from his bed he views the sad solemnity no youth shall equal hopes of glory give no youth affords so great a cause to grieve the trojan honor and the roman boast admired when living and adored when lost mirror of ancient faith in early youth undaunted worth inviolable truth 
no foe unpunished in the fighting field shall dare thee foot to foot with sword and shield much less in arms oppose thy matchless force when thy sharp spurs shall urge thy foaming horse ah couldst thou break through fate's severe decree a new marcellus shall arise in thee full canisters of fragrant lilies bring mixed with the purple roses of the spring let me with funeral flowers his body strow this gift which parents to their children owe this unavailing gift at least i may bestow thus having said he led the hero round the confines of the blessed elysian ground which when anchises to his son had shown and fired his mind to mount the promised throne he tells the future wars ordained by fate the strength and customs of the latian state the prince and people and forearms his care with rules to push his fortune or to bear two gates the silent house of sleep adorn of polished ivory this that of transparent horn true visions through transparent horn arise through polished ivory past deluding lies of various things discoursing as he passed and Chyses hither bends his steps at last then through the gate of ivory he dismissed his valiant offspring and divining guest straight to the ships aeneas his way embarked his men and skimmed along the sea still coasting till he gained cajeta's bay at length on oozy ground his galleys moor their heads are turned to sea their sterns to shore. End of section twelve.